Audio Just for this event is being provided using your computer speakers. Telephone audio is not being provided. Audio for this event is being provided. Please ensure your speakers are not muted. Telephone and you audio adjusted is adjusted your not volume accordingly. Please ensure your speakers are not muted. Please and use the Q&A pod or the chat pod to ask questions of the presenters. Type your questions at the bottom of the pod. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. If you would like to make the presentation slides full screen, click the outward four arrow button in the upper right corner of the pod containing the slides. To return to normal view, click the inward four arrow button in the upper right corner. Welcome to our event. We will get started in just a few minutes. Audio for this event is being provided using your computer speakers. Telephone audio is not being provided for this event. Please ensure your speakers are not muted and you have adjusted your volume accordingly. Please use the Q&A pod or the chat pod to ask questions of the presenters. Type your questions at the bottom of the pod. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. If you would like to make the presentation slides full screen, click the outward four arrow button in the upper right corner of the pod containing the slides. To return to normal view, click the inward four arrow button in the upper right corner. Greetings and hello everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the 2023 Regulatory Education for Industry or Ready Annual Conference, also known as Ready 2023. It's been a wonderful first few days of the conference. We've heard from the FDA Commissioner for the keynote, as well as the three center directors from FDA for the plenary and their thoughts on the impact of user fees on the various FDA programs and we've just completed the drugs track for ready this is now day three of five of the conference and today we start the devices track i'm elias malice director of the division of industry and consumer education or dice at fda's center for devices and radiological health on behalf of all of us at cdrh 
we welcome you as we transition the conference's focus onto the regulation of medical devices and radiological products. Now, we've got a great lineup of topics in store for you over the next day and a half, 12 sessions divided into two parts. I'll get into more detail shortly, but first, let's start off the day with a few administrative notes, especially for those of you seeking to earn continuing education credits. The full five-day conference offers a total of 32.25 contact hours of continuing education for physicians, pharmacists, and nurses. You'll earn CEs for each day that you attend. And unfortunately, CEs aren't provided if you're watching on the YouTube link or if you view the program after the conference ends. All faculty are expected to use generic names. If trade names are used, those of several companies should be used rather than only that of a single company. Speakers are required to disclose to the attendees when products or procedures being discussed are off-label or unlabeled, that is not FDA approved and any limitations on the presented information. Note, we may reference off-label use of FDA-approved products. We have no disclosures for today's program participants. To obtain CE credit, participants must attest to their attendance and complete the final activity evaluation through the CE portal. Now that's ceportal.fda.gov within 14 days of the conference, with no exceptions. Ready 2023, the annual conference, ends on June 9th, so our deadline is June 23rd. For multi-day activities, participants must attest to their attendance and complete the session evaluation for each day. Now, for any pharmacists and pharmacy techs in attendance, please share to provide your correct NABP and date of birth information in the required format. Pharmacists should log into their CPE monitor eight weeks after the last session to ensure that your credit has captured correctly. So I know I covered a lot of information. Additionally, upon complete completion of the event evaluation survey, you can download a certificate of completion, which can be used in support of CEs for RAPS, SOCRA, SQA, and ACRP. To simplify things, claim codes and survey links will be emailed at the end of each day to everyone who has officially registered for the conference and who has attended on that particular day. So if you attend each day of this conference, of each of the five days, you'll receive an email on each evening from Monday through Friday. All right, so with that, let us get started. Once again, thank you for taking the time to join us this week for FDA's Regulatory Education for Industry Annual Conference. Ready 2023. Today, we begin the second of the three tracks of the conference, the device track, and the medical device and radiological health sessions from CDRH. Now, I get the privilege of serving as your moderator and host for part one of our device track. The theme for part one is getting a product to market. This is all about taking the seedlings of an idea for a new invention, perhaps a new medical device, and working its way through the FDA regulatory process to that magical finish line, getting that new product to market and available to the countless patients and users who need it. So with that, let's get started for today. So, a few months ago, we were in the midst of getting ready for ready, if you don't mind my pun. I have to be stuck in traffic, which, if you know anything about the Washington, D.C. area, can be really bad. I happened to look up and see a couple of cars ahead of me. I glanced up, got a big smile on my face, and quickly took photos of the two license plates that you see on the screen here. Now, don't worry, I made sure that my car wasn't moving when all of this was happening. So we've talked about how Ready is a very interactive conference. So let's get started today with a question for you. Can you tell me what's the significance of the license plate on the left? Feel free to chat it or say it out loud. Um, I can hear you from all over the world, so please indulge me here. I know that our Ready attendees have quite a range of experience, which is wonderful for us. So I'm thinking that some of you might know the answer, while others might just see a random set of numbers and letters. 
Well, in fact, the license plate on the left does have some special meaning for us here today. 21 CFR is short for Code of Federal Regulations Title 21. 21 CFR is the set of regulations under the responsibility of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Now, I don't know whose car this was. Maybe it was our FDA Commissioner, Dr. Caleb, who spoke to our conference on Monday. Now, whether you knew the answer or not, I hope that as you spend your valuable time with us, you'll get a better perspective of how FDA regulates the vast array of medical devices and radiological products. The way I like to frame things, number one, at the highest level, we have our federal laws. Congress enacts laws, and these laws grant the high-level authorities to the FDA on how we regulate medical devices and radiological products. And number two, from there, you have the federal re regulations. The FDA will develop the regulations that you'll find in the various parts of 21 CFR, and these will take the laws and provide more specifics and details on how we implement them. And three, and finally, we have additional resources that go into even more detail. Now, these may take the form of FDA guidance documents or policies or programs and initiatives. Collectively, all of these intersect and come together to provide a roadmap that guide the regulatory responsibilities at any stage of the medical device journey. Over the next few days, you'll see numerous references to the FDA laws many citations within the various parts of 21 CFR, as well as a large number of guidances and other efforts. So if you're one of our newcomers to the regulatory affairs space, I welcome you to our conference. I welcome you in this journey. The next time you see that license plate, you'll give a nod of an acknowledgement to the driver of that car, perhaps. OK, so as we look at the license plate on the right side of the screen, now let's put our 21 CFR to work. And as we review the sessions that compose the Ready Device Track Part 1, Getting a Product to Market. The first session offering for you today will be presented by Kendra Holter on the topic, Medical Device Regulatory Framework, Where to Start. Now. Whether you're new to the medical device space or whether you knew the answer to that question on the prior slide, the one constant in the FDA regulations is change. Our policies are continually changing and evolving, so it's important to learn what are the requirements today, but how to keep up and continually learn in the future so you're prepared. Kendall will provide some key basics for you, as well as how to stay current over time. This session will also set a nice foundation for us for the rest of the program today. Once we've established this foundation, we'll dig into some specific topic areas. Our second session is simply titled Biocompatibility Basics and presented by one of CDRH's longstanding experts in this field, Jennifer Good. The field of biocompatibility affects so many medical devices and is one of the most popular topics that gets a lot of questions. Jen will provide an update on how to approach the reg regulatory responsibilities to help document the safety of materials used in your medical devices. As we move to our third session, Scott Colburn will present on the appropriate use of voluntary consensus standards and the conformity assessment program. The regulatory space featuring standards and conformity assessment has grown in leaps and bounds over the past number of years. So we're really excited to bring Scott back to Ready this year to deliver these key updates to you. You won't want to miss it. The FDA has a number of re regulatory submission pathways. And for session four, we're going to focus on the most common one for CDRH, 510Ks. Andrew Sproul will deliver the topic titled Detangling the 510K Process, in which he'll provide his perspective as a seasoned FDA regulator on the 510K process, including his tips and suggestions just for you. Session five is titled CDRH Portal, Overview and Feature Walkthrough, delivered by Nels Anderson. If you're not familiar with the CDRH Portal, 
This is a new IT platform for interacting with the FDA with your regulatory submission. This is a relatively new program, so we're excited that Nels will provide you with all of the key highlights of the CDRH portal and how you can put it to use. And finally, we're excited to bring you another topic that brings in a lot of questions to DICE. Jason Brookbank will deliver session six and our final session of part one on the topic, reduced medical device user fees, small business determination, SBD program. The small business determination program has truly grown over the years. So if you are a small business, this session is especially important for you to attend. Here is on this slide, the full agenda of the Ready Device Track Part 1. Now, as we work our way from the top to the bottom, you'll see that we have two sessions. Then we'll take a break. We'll continue with two more sessions of we'll another break. And then we'll come back for the last two sessions of Part 1. As you look at these six topics, we hope there's a little bit of something for each of you, whether you are new or not to the regulatory affairs industry. Now, once we're done with part one today, we're not yet done with our day. Please stay with us as we kick off part two of the device track. The theme for part two is medical device post-market activities with quality. So you will want to stay for this. As you already know, I will be serving as your moderator for today. So you'll be hearing a lot from me today. I wanted to also acknowledge Donna Headley. She is the director of program track part one, this particular track, and as well as the online moderator with you for your questions and answers um, as you submit them to us today. Donna was the key to design um, these six sessions and recruiting our speakers and really trying to curate the right topics for this year's Ready program. So my thanks to Donna for designing such a wonderful track and roster of expert faculty. In addition, I wanted to acknowledge the vast number of individuals who have been working behind the scenes to make Ready such a success. You won't hear their voices, but I wanted to celebrate a few of our key contributors from throughout CDRH who helped us all behind the scenes, from our executive leadership support to development of content to the communication product rollout and video production. Thank you all so much. Without you, we cannot make this possible. And my very, very special thanks to a few very special folks. First and foremost, I wanted to thank Brenda Stoddard. Um, it has been a pleasure to collaborate with you, Brenda, for these now 12 years of Ready. It is an understatement that without you, this would not happen. Um, you are the key to our success, and I have, it's been such a treat to work with you and, your, and follow your leadership. I wanted to also thank Larissa Lepteva. It has been an incredible delight to have you join the Ready faculty so that we now have three tracks, including CBER. And my thanks to you, Larissa, for all of your tireless work and, and just making Ready even that much more of a success over the past three years. And finally, I'd like to celebrate Jeff Kelly and his team. His crew works diligently behind the scenes to make us all look and sound so polished. Most, most, most of all, I thank you, our global audience, for you for taking the time to spend this time, your, your precious time with us. You make Ready such a success through your particip participation each and every year with your questions, your interactions with us. We appreciate you have a choice in how you spend your time and your work day. And I, from the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank you for choosing to spend this week with us. I'd like to briefly go over the program format. For those of you who've attended our programs in the past, this should look pretty familiar. We will first kick off with a presentation that will run around 25 minutes. Then for the remainder of that time, we will take your questions and have a question and answer segment. Please um, engage with us. Please ask your questions. Uh, this is your workshop. We do this for you. To submit your question, please go through the Adobe Q&A chat and type in your question and identify that speaker. So for example, if the session was being delivered by Brenda, um, you would start with at Brenda and then type in your question. 
on the right side of this slide, you see a screenshot of how that dialog box looks. You also will see that in our presentations, we will feature learning objectives. So it'll be cl very clear up front what you expect to learn during that program. We also will have knowledge checks. This will be an opportunity for you to double check some of the material that you have just learned. And finally, we will leave you with your call to action. This will be the way for us to conclude conclude our program with what you should do next after you've learned this great material from our expert faculty. As part of registration, we've included some prerequisites that were suggested. These were our recommendations for some basics to help you get a, a jump start for the sessions today. So if you haven't had a chance to peruse some of these prerequisites that I'm clicking through right now, I encourage you to do so if possible before that particular session takes place. Some of our materials build on the prior foundational materials. So you might see that while we have some sessions that cover some basic content, some of the material gets more progressively advanced. And finally, um, we are the FDA, we are the government. We um, feature a lot of acronyms throughout uh, our work. Um, as you become more familiar with us, these will become more familiar to you as well. The acronyms here are the acronyms for the offices from which our presenters come today. So as you um, learn from them, we have representation from almost all of the offices of CDRH. Um, and on this particular link on the bottom, you see a link to where we talk about how CDRH is structured. So if you want to get a, a high level view and perspective of how the organization is aligned, this is a great resource to check out. So finally, let me conclude um, this intro with your first call to action. Number one, enjoy the program, interact with us and learn, have a great time with us. This will be a lot of fun to go over a lot of great material. Number two, please ask us your questions. This is your program. We want to answer the questions that you have. Number three, Please take advantage of the many FDA resources that you will, you will see and hear about today and tomorrow, in fact. Um, as Brenda said in her remarks yesterday, um, there is a lot of material that we will cover. We don't expect you to remember it all now, um, but what you can do for yourself is know where to find it down the road. Um, these are resources that you can tap into again and again over time. And finally, at the end of the conference, please give us your feedback on what you need. Fill out your surveys. Please, please let us know what topics you'd like to learn about more. Um, and this helps us design our programs um, in the future. So once again, thank you for joining us as we kick off Ready 2023, day three, the start of the CDRH sessions and the device track. All ready now, everyone. Now let's get to work. So once again, it is my pleasure to kick things off with our first topic for today. Your presenter is Kendra Holter. Kendra is a consumer safety officer in the Division of Industry and Consumer Education, the pre-market programs branch. Kendra actually joined the FDA in the fall of last year, and this time last year, Kendra was an attendee at Ready, so that's kind of a fun fact. So here we are a year later, Kendra is now part of the FDA, and she's now one of our um, expert faculty. It's, it's great to have Kendra as part of our team. In her capacity and in her role, Kendra educates stakeholders with understandable and accessible science-based regulatory information. Now, prior to joining FDA, Kendra served uh, many years at the Veterans Health Administration, VHA. She was a national educator in the care and management of reusable medical devices, and also had various other roles at the fac facility level, including manager, business liaison for purchase and repair of medical devices, and operating room nurse. So Kendra brings a lot of worldly experience to you today. Kendra has a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the Medical University of South Carolina and a Master of Science in Nursing Informatics from Walden University. So with that intro, it's my pleasure to kick off our session with Kendra on the topic of medical device regulatory framework, where to start.
Thank you, Elias, and good morning, everyone. Also, good day or good evening to our worldwide attendees, depending on from where you're joining us. We are so glad you could join us for the annual Ready Conference this week. Welcome again. We're going to kick off today with a journey through the FDA's medical device regulatory framework. Where does one start to navigate this framework? The journey through this complex regulatory framework does have a well-defined start, but quickly that road can become windy with many turns and sometimes even forks in the road when you're faced with decisions on which path to proceed with. My hope is that this presentation helps you to navigate the framework through use of the resources provided. And to finish that journey with the reward, with the trophy, with the manufacturing of a safe, effective, legally marketed medical device. In this presentation, we have four learning objectives. First, we will define a medical device. To, then we will describe regulatory controls for medical devices. We will then demonstrate ways in which FDA databases can be used to identify product codes and classification for a device, and really, truly a surplus of additional information that can be found in those databases. And then finally, we'll identify the pre-market pathways for bringing a medical device to market. I started this presentation by saying that the medical device regulatory framework has a well-defined start. And you might be thinking to yourself, it does? What is that? Well, the start is to answer the question, is my product a medical device? Let's look at these three images. Are they medical devices? The first picture is that of a trumpet, the second, a blood pressure cuff, and the third, a bed. I, keep the, I ask that you keep these in mind as we review the regulatory definition of a medical device. There are three components to the definition of a medical device as it's regulatory, regulatorily defined in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. First, a medical device is an item, an article, a thing. It's an instrument, a machine, an apparatus, could even be an in vitro reagent. The second component of the definition is that a medical device is intended for use in either the diagnosis of disease or condition, or it's intended to be used to cure, mitigate, treat, or prevent a disease, or it's, an in it's intended to affect the structure or any function of the human body. And the final component, the third component, component, is that a medical device does not achieve its primary intended purposes through a chemical action or through dependency on being metabolized by the body. I would like to note that software can be a medical device. There are certain software functions that are excluded, and you can find those in Section 520.0 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The regulatory definition of a medical device speaks to its intended use. And I want to take a moment here to distinguish between intended use and indications for use. While these terms are related, they are not interchangeable. The intended use of a device is what you claim on your label that that device does. It's the purpose of the device. Intended use is about the device itself. What does it do and how does it work? And remember, this isn't about what, it's what it is designed to do or what it could do. It's about what you say it does on its label. On the other hand, indications for use are about the patient. It answers questions like what illness, injury, disease, or condition is the device intended to prevent, diagnose, or treat? Or what are the circumstances in which someone would use this device? Or what is the target population? Are there particular anatomical sites that the device is used on? What is the duration the device would be used for? Those are all components of indications for use. So to summarize, 
intended use is what the device is used for, for per the label, and indications for use is where, when, and how will the device be used. So I hope that helps you distinguish between intended use of a device and indications for use of a device. As we conclude our first objective, I want to provide you some resources at your fingertips. I would like to draw your attention to the one that says on this slide, CDA, CDRH Learn Module. This is one of over 200 video presentations or modules available through CDRH Learn. If you're not familiar with CDRH Learn, I highly encourage you to take some time to check it out. These presentations provide coverage of a variety of pre-market and post-market topics that are related to the regulatory requirements for medical devices, and you will hear me speak of several of them throughout this presentation. There's also a really nice link to a page uh, with resources to help you determine if your product is a medical device. That's the second link you'll see there um, in that arrow. Based on the definition we just reviewed, let's do a little knowledge check. Let's look at our three pictures again. Which of the item or items is a medical device? And note, consider all of them as there may be more than one. So select all that apply. Okay, let's talk about each one of these together. I think we can all agree that while music is indeed good for the soul, a trumpet is not a medical device. A blood pressure cuff, however, is a medical device as it is used to determine one's blood pressure. But what about the bed? Well, it depends. Remember, device determination is dependent upon the intended use of the item. So is this a bed that's intended to be used for sleeping at home every night or for being jumped on by our kids for pure joy and entertainment as we've all experienced at some point in our own lives? Or is this a bed that is used to prevent pressure sores in a hospitalized patient when bedridden due to an illness or medical condition? Now that we know the definition of a medical device, let's describe the regulatory controls that apply to medical devices. Regulatory controls are used to ensure the safety and effectiveness of medical devices, and each device has specified regulatory controls. The controls provide consistent requirements. They will vary depending on the level of risk, ensuring the appropriate regulatory oversight is achieved. Class 1 devices are lowest risk and have the least regulatory controls, while your Class 3 devices have the highest risk and will have the most regulatory controls. Regulatory controls are described as either general, special, or PMA. This slide demonstrates a variety of examples of general controls that apply to all devices, unless, of course, the regulation specifically states the device is exempt from them. The chart provides the control, its associated regulation number, and a brief description of what the control does for safety and effectiveness. So, for example, we have level labeling controls in place to ensure that users are provided the appropriate information very easily on a label. We have quality system controls in place to ensure that the manufacturing of all devices are done through a systematic standardized quality approach to ensure safe and effective finished devices. You can check out some of these other examples of general controls on your own. Special controls. Remember we've said that general controls apply to all devices. So if a device has special controls, they are in addition to, not instead of, general controls. We've also said that regulatory controls provide the appropriate level of oversight based on risk. Well, devices with special controls have a higher 
uh, excuse me, have greater risk associated with them. So devices that have special controls have them because the level of oversight with general controls is not sufficient to provide the reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness for the device. Some examples of special controls that may be put on, in place would be special labeling requirements beyond the general control labeling requirements. There may be mandatory performance standards that the device must comply with as part of the special controls identified. There may be post-market surveillance requirements, additional pre-market data requirements, or even potentially patient registries, requirements for patient registries with some devices. Again, special controls being outlined in regulation. Again, regulatory control increased with the risk of device. So now we're at our highest risk of device. And so PMA controls are needed along with general controls because these are our highest risk devices. These are our class three, those that are used typically for life supporting or life sustaining. These PMA controls are needed to provide reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness that the general and special controls for these devices are insufficient. Again, though, as a reminder, PMA controls, just like special controls, are in addition to general controls. Conclusion of our second objective brings us to our second resources at, at your fingertips. These are links to information, resources, and guidance documents on regulatory controls for devices and Class II special controls. Also, there is another CDRH Learn module here. Um, if you can't tell, I love the CDRH Learn modules. They're fantastic uh, to listen and get great information from. And we have one on FDA's regulation of devices that talks about controls, regulatory controls. So how about another knowledge check? Think about this true-false question. My device is classified as class two, but is 510K exempt? Exempt means no regulatory controls apply to my device. Is this true or false? Well, I hope you said false because there are regulatory controls that apply to all devices unless regulation states otherwise. We will discuss later in the presentation what 510K exempt means. We know the definition of a medical device and we know that there are regulatory controls that apply to medical devices based on their classification. Now let's talk about how you can use databases to determine the classification of your device, therefore learning the regulatory controls that apply to it. Medical devices are identified by three letter codes. The FDA uses these codes to identify and track similar medical devices. Once identified, these codes will provide the applicable regulation for the device, as well as its required pre-marketing pathway, or again, perhaps providing exemption to pre-market notification. So how does one go about determining the product code for their device? Well, let me show you. Let's use the bed from our earlier knowledge check and let's find its product classification code. For this demonstration, I'm going to pretend to be a manufacturer while removing my consumer safety officer hat. So I have a, an air-filled hospital bed that I know is a medical device due to its intended use, prevention of pressure sores. The link on this slide is the link to the FDA product classification database. You can use this database to search for the product classification code. From the main page, I recommend you select Advanced Search. This allows you to receive more information when your results pop up, and you can also be provided additional search fields if you know more than just the device name. So I do, again, when you open that, when you go to that link, it will default the first page to be a quick search. I recommend you open up advanced search uh, for more information and more opportunities to search. 
So for our demonstration, I've put the word bed in the device field for demonstration. But some ways to use the other fields, if you know the regulation number, which in this example, I'm sorry, in the picture on the screen is highlighted in yellow, you could search for all the product codes that correlate to that regulation. Or perhaps you already know the product code, which that field is highlighted in blue, and you can um, put the product code into the database and it will provide you the pre-market pathway and regulation that applies to that product code. There are a few things I'd like to point out on the results page. Notice the yellow circle number of results on the left. In our example, there's a total of 25 results, but the database defaults to, do, to show 10 results per page. So if you note the blue circle on the right, it currently defaults to 10 per page. You can select that drop down arrow and you'll be given other choices and you need to select the one that's large enough that you can review all of your results on one page. Keep in mind, this is the case for most FDA databases where the default is 10 per page and you have to make that adjustment accordingly for your results. For demonstrations purposes, we're just going to look at the first 10 results, even though we know there were a total of 25 for your own process. And when you're going through this with your own device, highly recommend that you look at all of the results. With these 10 results, you'll notice there's 10 different product codes, seven different regulation numbers, and only one device classification designation, and that is a class two. So how do I know which one of these is my bed? I said earlier it was a fluid-filled bed that prevents pressure sore, sores. So now let's look at the regu regulation for the purple selection INX. Device name is bed, comma, air fl fluidized by selecting the link to the corresponding regulation for this line item, which is 890.5160. Again, as the manufacturer, I know the intended use of the device and the regulation gives us the intended use. And in this case, they are a match. You can see that in the highlighted section under identification. <clears throat> this regulation also tells me that while my device is class 2, it is exempt from pre-market notification procedures. Notice also that there are special controls along with this device because it is class 2. And while the regulation doesn't specifically send, say general and special controls, we know from this presentation that general controls also apply to my device. As far as being exempt from pre-market notification, this means that a pre-market submission is not required for my device, but it does not mean that there are zero regulatory controls that apply, which we just talked about. <clears throat> if your device has special controls, it will be provided here in regulation or provided through the Class 2 Special Controls document that was already shared in our last resources at your fingertips page. Going one page back after reviewing the regulation in detail, so I'm going back to my original search results page. Now I'm going to select the link for the device itself, again, again noting that on this screen it is purple in color, and I've put a red uh, circle or whatever we're going to call that, elongated rectangle around it. <laughs> So when I made the selection of the de actual device name, this is the pop-up that I will get. And as you review these results, you really can deem a lot of information. You can see which medical specialty is responsible for the pre-market review if, uh, if a pre-market review is required. You can see the three-letter product code, again, in our example, INX. You can see the submission type. 510K exempt in our example, which aligns with the regulation we've already reviewed. You can see your regulation number here again, but notice here it's not a link. So to review the regulation, you need to either use the link in the database I've already demonstrated, or you can take this number and plug it into our CFR database, which the link to that I share on the next slide. 
One final piece of information to point out here is I want to draw your attention to the yellow circled item, and it reads GMP exempt question mark. GMP means good manufacturing practices, and our device, my device, is not exempt from those. GMP is part of the quality system regulations and is part of one of the general controls that apply to all devices. I remember I said that if the device has general controls that they're exempt from, that will be outlined in, in regulation and information. And here is the example of where the GMP is identified as being exempt or non-exempt. And then also notice that there is information about that class two special controls document, which I provided the link in the last resources at your fingertips. But look, we also provide you the link right here in the um, database because this device does have special controls that apply to it. We already read that in the regulation. So conclusion of our third objective, more resources. These are additional databases you may find useful in determining the classification of your device. The last link is to a page of many databases. Ones that you might find more useful or more common to use would be the FDA recognized standards database. We have a recalls database and a medical device reporting database. So go check out those databases and become more familiar with the information that truly is available at your fingertips. Let's proceed to our final objective and look at the various pre-market pathways for medical devices. Reviewing the databases can provide you the classification code, the applicable regulations, and which pre-market pathway, but what do each of these mean? We have 510K, we have de novo, PMA, which means pre-market approval, and HDE, which means humanitarian device exemption. If the class one or class two device is 510K exempt, this means that the device is exempt from pre-market notification requirements. General controls do still apply to the device in addition to any controls the spe that, um, excuse me, any controls the specific regulation for that device puts in place. If the device, class one or class two device is 510K, meaning it's not exempt from 510K pre-market notification, then the manufacturer must demonstrate in a pre-market notification substantial equivalence to a predicate device that is either on the market or was at one time legally on the market. General controls or general and special controls apply to these devices. Stay tuned in today's agenda as my colleague Andrew will be speaking more about 510K pre-market notifications. The de novo pathway is for novel devices that do not have a legally marketed predicate device. So statutorily, they are class three devices. The de novo pathway itself is a risk-based classification process that results in these devices being reclassified from a class three device to either a class one or a class two, again, based on risk. What does this mean for the controls to the device? Well, either general controls alone or general and special controls will apply to provide the reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness of the device for its intended use. Keep in mind that once these devices are reviewed and classified, or excuse me, reclassified through the de novo process, they can be used as predicate devices for future 510K pre-market submissions. Pre-market approvals. This pathway is for our highest risk devices, class three devices, those that support or sustain human life. General controls for these devices are not sufficient enough to assure safety and effectiveness, so PMA controls apply to these devices as well. It is the most stringent pre-market submission requirement because the process relies on valid scientific evidence to assure that the device is safe and effective. 
The fourth and final pre-market pathway we're going to discuss today is the humanitarian device exemption. This is the pre-market pathway for a device where there is no comparable device currently on the market in the United States to treat or diagnose the disease or condition that it's intended to uh, treat or diagnose. One submits an HDE application, but the applicant must first have an HUD designation of the device, HUD standing for humanitarian use device. You might be asking what is an HUD? An HUD is a device intended to benefit patients in the treatment or diagnosis of disease or condition that affects or manifests itself in no more than, and this is key, 8,000 people in the United States per year. So it is a disease or condition that affects or manifests in no more than 8,000 people in the U.S. per year. By definition, rare diseases and conditions occur in small number of patients. So as a result of this, it's been difficult to gather enough clinical evidence to meet the FDA standard of reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness. Because of this, an HD, HDE is exempt from the effectiveness requirements of the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act, but instead we have to demonstrate the probable benefit, and we have to ensure that there's no additional exposure to patients for significant risk. In other words, we prove that the benefit outweighs the risk of injury or illness from its use. We do, the FDA does take into account the probable risks and benefits of, of, of other available devices on the market or even um, other alternative forms of treatment for the rare disease and condition. Again, it is demonstrating that benefit outweighs the risk of the use of device. This was a lot of information I provided in the last 25 minutes, and I feel like this chart is a really great depiction showing all the information in a well-organized manner. The device class, potential harm, controls, the submission type, and the percent of devices currently on the market that fall to each class are illustrated in this chart. Noting on the on the area on the left of the chart where we have the downward facing um, arrow, risk is increased as you go from class one to class three um, devices. Completion of our final learning objective also brings us to our final knowledge at your fingertips. You've determined that your device is a medical device, and this first link will demonstrate how you study and market your device, giving four steps to the process of how to bring your device to market. Step one is to classify your device, so we've got additional resources here on how to do that, including, yay, another CDRH Learn module. And then also note that step two of how to market, study and market your device is where you can find more detailed information and resources about all four of the pre-market pathways we've discussed in today's presentation. These next three slides are simply resources slides that give you the actual URL to the linked cited resources I have provided throughout the presentation, including their corresponding slide numbers. In summary, we want to start the journey through this complex regulatory framework by answering the question, is my product a medical device? So ensure your product meets the definition of medical device to understand that the FDA has regulatory requirements for it. Remember that those regulatory controls or requirements increase as the risk of the device increases. We can use public databases to assist us with product code and classification determination, as well as a lot more information as we discovered today. And knowing that product classification code and its associated regulation for the device will facilitate appropriate selection of the pre-market pathway for your medical device. This concludes my presentation, and I want to thank you for joining me, and I believe there is now time for us to take some of your questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Kendra. And yes, we have some time for some questions. Um, thank you for a great foundation and overview for our audience today. Um, let's just jump in and we've been getting a lot of questions from our audience. So thank you so much for that. Um, so let's roll through as many questions as, as we can through this segment. So I'll start with our first question for you, Kendra. I'm not sure what is the classification and product code for my device. Now, I know of a competitor with a similar device that's on the market. Can I search for information about my competitor's device to help me determine the classification and product code for my device? Thank you. What a great question and actually one that we get uh, common, commonly asked. So I demonstrated one way of using a public database in the presentation today to determine classification and product code for one's device. But you can search for information on legally marketed devices in a number of different public databases. The Establishment Registration and Listing Database, the Product Classification Database, and the databases for the various applicable marketing applications, such as 510K, PMA, or DeNovo. I did share a link uh, where you can go to find all of these databases uh, available for use, kind of a one-stop shop. But if you have the name of a competitor or their device or the company name, the Establishment Registration and Listing Database is a great resource. You can search by using either the quick or advanced search feature, similar to the product code classification database demonstrated in today's presentation. Thank you, Kendra. Um, for the next couple of questions, I'm going to group them together. They're on the theme of general controls. So let's start with this first question, which asks, what is the, the definition of general controls? Another good question. Our um, attendees are on it this morning. Um, so the federal law, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, is specifically in Section 513, establishes the risk-based device classification system for medical devices. And they would be, devices are then assigned to one of three regulatory classes, one, two, or three, based on the level of control necessary to provide reasonable assurance of its safety and effectiveness. Remember, we said class one have the least amount of controls, and class three have the most based on risk. So general controls are the basic provisions. They're the basic authorities of the act that provide the FDA with the means of regulating devices to ensure their safety and effectiveness. I did list on one of the slides that these provisions include such things as device registration and listing, pre-market notification if required, repair and replacement, uh, restricted devices, and good manufacturing practices, just as a few examples. And keep in mind, general controls in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act apply to all medical devices. Thank you, Kendra. Um, and the second question, you, you hit on it just a little bit now. Um, the second question, where can I where can I find the complete list of general controls that are applicable to my device? Yes, the one of the one of the most important parts of my presentation today is knowing where the resources are. So great, great question. I did provide a link to regulatory controls. It's a page called regulatory controls. And when you go to this page, you will see on the left side, a navigation tab, uh, which provides an, another page with great detail and a list of general controls, again, that apply to uh, all medical devices. I did also provide in the presentation today, when you go back and review slides, there's a really nice table of the general controls and the corresponding sections of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that defines the general controls as well. Um, and just real quick, whenever you're on any FDA webpage, Take a look at that left side of the page. Left navigation tabs are on most FDA pages to provide more information and resources on the appropriate topic identified. 
Thank you, Kendra. I know we're at time. I'm going to try to see if we can get a couple more questions in before we switch to our next uh, next session. Um, so for this next question for you, is there a pathway to obtain formal feedback from the FDA on the classification of my device? Um, and if so, is there a Medufa user fee associated with this? Another really good question, and the short answer to this question is yes, there is a pathway to obtain formal feedback from the FDA on classification of a device, and it's called a 513G. It's called that because it is in the Act in Section 513G that provides the means to obtain the formal feedback from the FDA. There is a fee, a Medufa fee, associated with a 513G, but stay tuned for today when my colleague Jason Brook Brookbank is going to discuss the Medufa Small Business Certification Program, and this is a program that can help small businesses for reduced fees, and the 513G is one of those fees that can be reduced if you um, are a small business, appropriately classified as a small business by the FDA. All right, thank you, Kendra. Okay, we have time for one last question, one last quick answer. Do I have to register my establishment before I can submit a pre-market submission? A good, good question for our last one. So yes, an establishment needs to submit registration and, and listing information within 30 days of beginning the activity of putting a device into commercial distribution. Uh, foreign establishments must register before exporting products to the United States, and domestic importers must register before importing products into the United States. And reminder that if your device requires a pre-market notification uh, clearance or approval, you will have to wait until your pre-market submission is cleared or approved to register your establishment and list your device. And remember those pre-market submissions I'm referring to are 510Ks, PMAs, et cetera. All right, Kendra, that is the final question and, and word for our session for today. Let me turn it back to you for our final thoughts for our audience and your call to action to them. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for attending my presentation today. The first thing that I would like to um, call your action to is Review the knowledge in, at your fingertips that were provided through my presentation. There are some really great resources to assist you to understand and navigate the regulatory process. Next, start early in the process. It can be overwhelming and frustrating, costly and time consuming to develop a, and market a medical device, contact CDRH early. Consider a pre uh, excuse me, consider a pre-submission through our Q submission program to discuss data and testing that may be needed for your device. Third, if you have not already, subscribe to CDRH News. This is a place where you can get all the latest information, announcements, et cetera, from CDRH. And finally, do not hesitate to contact DICE, Division of Industry and Consumer Education. We are here to help. Call us or email us early in the process and we can help answer questions. We do this via phone and email and we support both the industry and consumers related to medical devices and radiation emitting electronic products. So please, please, please reach out. Uh, my colleagues and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Kendra, thank you so much. That is a wrap for session one as we kick off our morning. So with that, let's very nimbly move on to our second session for today on the topic of biocompatibility basics. Your presenter is Jennifer Good. Jen is the biocompatibility program advisor for the Office of Product Evaluation and Quality, or OPEC, in the immediate office. Uh, she's been in this role since 2015. Um, in her capacity, Jen provides leadership for CDRH in the, sp the space of biocompatibility in numerous capacities. She represents FDA on the development of consensus standards for biocompatibility. Uh, 
She provides input to the Ask About Compatibility Testing Laboratory Accreditation Process. We're going to learn a little bit more about standards in ASCA um, in, uh, later on today, um, as well as representing OPEC to the Biocompatibility Task Group, or STG, at CDRH. Jen began her accomplished career at FDA in 1994 as a pre-market reviewer responsible for the review of medical devices and combination products in the fields of obstetrics and gynecology and then expanded her focus to include surgical and interventional treatment of the peripheral vasculature, as well as cardiac monitoring, pacing, and neurology devices. Jen has a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Engineering from Boston University. So with this intro, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the topic of biocompatibility basics and Jen Good. Jen, take it away. Thank you so much, Elias, and thank you everyone for your attendance. This image is from a 2011 paper by Dr. Ido Weinberg, and it shows a nitinol stent which has broken in a patient's blood vessel. If small pieces of a device break off, they can move from the implant site, and in this case could cause thromboembolism. In addition, chemicals from the inside of the stent material can be released into the body and if the amount released is higher than a toxic threshold, can result in other adverse biological events as well. To help you with the biocompatibility section of a submission to FDA, we will be reviewing FDA's biocompatibility guidance, defining key terminology, thinking about when and how biocompatibility should be considered for your medical device, and we will also discuss the risk-based approach included in our guidance and the standard ISO 10993-1, as well as identify the difference between endpoint assessments and testing. Finally, we will review the chemistry information included in the FDA biocompatibility guidance. So let's start with an overview of the guidance. FDA's biocompatibility guidance, shown here on the left, was first issued in 2016 and then administratively updated in 2020. This guidance explains how FDA uses the ISO standard 10993-1 biological evaluation of medical devices, evaluation and testing within a risk management process. In addition, we included information on some common biocompatibility testing issues we had seen in submissions to us. Prior to 2009, this standard was essentially a guide to which biocompatibility tests to conduct. With the 2009 and 2018 revisions to ISO 10993-1, the standard changed its focus to a discussion of how to address biocompatibility by first leveraging available information and only conducting new testing if needed. These next few slides provide an outline of the guidance. Those items with a red star will be discussed in more detail in the remainder of my presentation. For example, we'll, we will be talking about Section 3, Risk Management, as well as Sample Preparation, which is addressed in the Test-Specific Considerations in Section 6. In addition, we will discuss some of the chemistry information in Section 7 and some considerations for labeling in Section 8. We also will spend some time on Attachment A and how we think about biocompatibility endpoints and assessment. We also will discuss the component and device documentation examples in Attachment F and go over some key terminology that is included in the glossary. So let's start with some key terminology that will be helpful for the remainder of the presentation. Biocompatibility is the ability of a device material to perform with a, an appropriate host response in a specific situation. Direct contact is a term used for a device or device component that comes into physical contact with body tissue. An indirect contact is a term for a device or device component through which a fluid or gas passes 
prior to the fluid or gas coming into physical contact with body tissue. In this case, the device or device component itself does not physically contact body tissue. Final finished form, or FFF, is a term used for a device or device component that includes all manufacturing processes for the to-be-marketed device, including packaging and sterilization if applicable. A novel material is a material that has not previously been used in any legally U.S. marketed medical device. A sponsor is a manufacturer, submitter, or applicant. Next, we will discuss when biocompatibility should be addressed in your submission. Biocompatibility is critical to the determination of safety for new devices when medical device materials come into direct or indirect contact with the human body, as well as for modified devices if there are intentional changes to tissue contacting components of the device or if changes to manufacturing or use conditions could result in changes to the device. The biocompatibility guidance includes many examples of how various considerations apply. In this example on page 5 of the guidance, a new internal component is added to the device and this component does not have direct or indirect contact with tissue. However, heat is applied to join the new component to another existing component of the device that does have tissue contact. Because heat could change the chemistry of the existing tissue contacting component, biocompatibility should be evaluated for this device change. Biocompatibility is considered for all types of submissions, including marketing and clinical study submissions, such as PMA, HDE, IDE, 510K, and de novo requests. The biocompatibility screening assessment is used to confirm that an unacceptable adverse biological response to the device materials or shape is unlikely to occur. There are many standards that can be used as part of the biocompatibility assessment, and I have provided a link at the end of the presentation, which includes information on how to use recognized standards as part of a submission. Now we will talk about the risk-based approach for biocompatibility. When thinking about biocompatibility, ISO 10993-1 and our FDA biocompatibility guidance both outline the factors that could impact the biocompatibility response, including device design, material components, and manufacturing processes, clinical use of the device, including the intended anatomical location, frequency and duration of exposure, potential risks from a biocompatibility perspective, information available to address the identified risks, and information needed to address any remaining knowledge gaps, such as new biocompatibility testing or other evaluations that appropriately address those risks. It is important to understand that new biocompatibility information may not be needed if all of the following apply. The device is made of materials that have been well characterized chemically and physically in the published literature, and have a long history of safe use, and materials and manufacturing information is provided to demonstrate that no new biocompatibility concerns exist. It may be possible to leverage the use of previous biocompatibility information if previous device use is in a similar part of the body for a similar time frame, Differences in materials or manufacturing between the new and leveraged devices are described, and information is provided to explain why differences aren't expected to impact biocompatibility. With the 2009 and 2018 revisions to ISO 10993 1 and in the 2016 publication of the FDA guidance document, the international experts in FDA are encouraging users of these documents to think about endpoint assessment instead of immediately going to testing. I don't want you to worry about all the details on this busy slide. For this slide and the next, I just want to show you how ISO 10993-1 Table A1 
on your left compares to Table A1 and FDA's biocompatibility guidance on your right. What we will focus on here is the information in the red boxes. For the 2009 revision of ISO 10993-1, the title to this table still says tests, but FDA's table on the right instead talks about evaluation endpoints for consideration. This is because you may be able to use other, endpoint, other information instead of new biocompatibility testing. Also notice within the ISO table on the left that X's indicate the types of biological effects that are recommended based on the type and duration of the device tissue contact. In FDA's table on the right, the rows and columns are almost identical and the X's are consistent with what is recommended in the 2009 revision of ISO 10993-1. However, the O's are additional biological effects that FDA also recommends be evaluated. With the 2018 revision to ISO 10993-1, the title to Table A1, as you see here on your left, was updated to remove the word test and now states endpoints to be addressed. This is consistent with the title in Table A1 of FDA's guidance on your right, which you may recall talks about evaluation endpoints for consideration. Similarly, if you look at the small boxes inside the table, the 2018 revision of ISO 10993-1 includes E's to emphasize that there are evaluations which may or may not result in testing that should be considered and addressed. These same endpoints were included in the 2009 revision of ISO 10993-1 as X's. Our FDA guidance on the right has not yet been updated since the 2018 revision to ISO 10993-1. So the information here on the right is identical to what you saw on the previous slide. Because there are differences between ISO 10993-1, Table A1, and FDA's biocompatibility guidance, please use Table A1 in FDA's guidance, not ISO 10993-1, when deciding which endpoints to address. Please also remember that all X's and O's in FDA's Table A1 should be addressed in some way in your submission to us. It may be possible to use existing data, some new endpoint specific biocompatibility testing, or you may be able to provide a rationale for why some endpoints do not need any additional assessments. Our guidance also points out that some of the endpoints identified by an X or an O may not be relevant for all devices in a particular category. However, the FDA biocompatibility guidance also indicates that for novel materials or manufacturing processes, additional evaluations beyond those recommended in Table A1 may be needed. And this concept has been included in the 2018 revision of ISO 10993-1. Finally, it's important to understand that if a device contacts different types of tissues, biocompatibility information is needed for all of the exposure categories. For example, some components of a device might contact only the inside of the blood vessels, but other components might contact muscle, tissue, or bone, so different assessments may be needed for the different components. Here is a portion of Table A1 from FDA's biocompatibility guidance. And this red boxed row shows us how an implant device in contact with blood for less than or equal to 24 hours will have different endpoint assessments than a device in the row below, which also is related to blood contacting implants, but is for a longer duration, greater than 24 hours to 30 days, and has one additional endpoint that is recommended by FDA. Now let's do a quick knowledge check or two. Let's take a moment to think about what can be used to determine which endpoints to include in a biocompatibility evaluation for submission to FDA. Should you be using ISO 10993-1, Table A1, Table A1 in FDA's biocompatibility guidance, or can either be used because they are the same? 
There are some differences, so please always use FDA's biocompatibility guidance to determine which endpoint assessments to include in your biocompatibility evaluation. And don't forget that for novel materials, assessments beyond those indicated by an X or an O in Table A1 may be needed. Let's also think about whether the following statement is true or false. I always need to conduct some kind of test to address the endpoints in Table A1 of FDA's biocompatibility guidance. Is this statement always true? Is it always false? Or does it depend? This statement is false. While you need to address every endpoint in Table A1 of FDA's biocompatibility guidance, a test isn't always needed. Remember that X's and O's in Table A1 of FDA's biocompatibility guidance can be addressed with existing data, additional endpoint-specific testing, or a rationale for why the endpoint does not require additional assessment. Now we'll briefly discuss a few other issues that are addressed in FDA's biocompatibility guidance. The FDA biocompatibility guidance also includes information on sample preparation for biocompatibility testing, testing considerations for various types of endpoints such as cytotoxicity, how literature can be used for some endpoints such as carcinogenicity or reproductive and developmental toxicity, in addition, the guidance addresses some common testing issues where FDA asks questions if not addressed in a submission, and we'll discuss a few of these. When a decision is made that new testing is needed, we recommend that testing be conducted on the device in its final finished form. For example, if the device needs to be sterilized prior to use, the sterile device should be used for testing. If biocompatibility testing is not conducted on the device in its final finished form, attachment F of the biocompatibility guidance includes some example documentation language that can be used to describe any differences and to discuss why the differences are not expected to impact the biocompatibility of the device. This first example from attachment F provides language that can be used to explain how a test article compares to a proposed device. The second example can be used when providing a rationale for why new testing isn't needed by describing how a new or modified device compares to a previously marketed device. If these types of statements can be made, this will facilitate an efficient review. The guidance also refers users to ISO 10993-12 for more details on sample preparation, describes the types of extraction solvents that might be needed for extract-based biocompatibility studies, explains that often both polar and nonpolar solvents are needed to simulate the types of extractables that would clinically be present, and reminds users to separately extract components with different durations of use and components made from novel materials. In addition, there is information on test-specific considerations for the endpoints listed on this slide. I also encourage you to review Section 8 of the guidance, which describes how to think about labeling if you want to claim that your device does not include a particular material. We know based on our experience with certain materials such as latex, that current methods may not be able to detect an allergen or toxic compound at levels that could still produce an adverse response in highly sensitive individuals. The guidance includes some example labeling statements that could be used without testing, and those are shown here. Now we'll talk a bit about the chemistry information included in the guidance. This slide highlights various situations described in the guidance when we often request chemistry information, including when long history of safe use rationales are provided in a submission, if there are unexpected adverse biocompatibility test findings, when a device is made from materials intended to change, such as an in-situ polymerizing or absorbable material, when a device is made from chemicals with known toxicities, where new biocompatibility testing is rarely conducted, such as carcinogenicity, or when new materials 
and chemicals are used to modify a material formulation or a device manufacturing process. In addition, we often ask for chemistry information when devices are made from novel materials. The guidance also describes when descriptive chemistry information may be sufficient. And descriptive chemistry information can include chemical identity, composition, formula or formula weight, structural information, and manufacturing impurity information, amount by weight percent and total amount, for example, in micrograms, identification of other devices marketed in the US where the chemical entity has been used previously. The guidance also identifies other possible sources of chemistry information, including from a material or component supplier. And attachment B of the guidance also includes some content recommendations for device master files, or MAFs. In addition, data from analytical chemistry testing may be helpful. The guidance talks about how chemistry information can be used for exposure assessments which should consider impurities that may be available over time, how repeat device use might influence exposure, and how to use modeling or test data to optimize up to estimation of exposure during clinical use. This chemistry information can then be used in conjunction with toxicology data from the literature or a material supplier to conduct a toxicological risk assessment based on a calculated chemical specific tolerable intake value or a threshold of toxicological concern, which can be used for chemicals where a TI value cannot be derived. We've heard a lot about the biocompatibility guidance, and there are just a few points I'd like to summarize. I do encourage you to carefully review our bio, FDA biocompatibility guidance and use the risk-based approach when preparing your submission. It is important to understand the difference between endpoint assessments and biocompatibility testing. And chemistry information can be important to support rationales for use of existing information without the need for new testing. This slide describes some resources that can be helpful to you in determining how to prepare the biocompatibility information in your future submissions. I'd like to thank you for joining me for this presentation. Let's now take some of your questions. All right, Jen, thank you so much for that great content on biocompatibility basics. Let's just roll into our questions. Um, thank you again for the great remarks. And also thanks for all the questions that have been coming in. So let's start with our first question for you, Jen, as I welcome you to our stage. You mentioned the terms polar and nonpolar extracts. What does this mean, and why would I need to do both? Thanks. Uh, that's a great question. Um, tissues in the body can extract both polar and nonpolar chemical constituents. For example, blood is primarily an aqueous or polar medium, but blood also includes lipids, which are nonpolar. And similarly, other body tissues have both polar and nonpolar components in them. So solvents with different po polarities are used to extract different chemicals from a medical device. And these solvents um, with the different polarities then can uh, better represent what different chemicals um, that can be released from a medical device during clinical use in the body. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. Um, let's get to our next question for you. Is biocompatibility evaluation required for class one exempt medical devices? That's another really good question. For class one exempt devices, we do recommend that you document your biocompatibility information in the device master records, which a manufacturer keeps on site. While these devices are exempt from submission of a 510K or other type of regulatory submission, the manufacturer still needs to confirm the biocompatibility of the product and make sure their records are complete. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. 
So for next question, it's getting to a um, specific device type, and I'm sure for our audience, they will have a lot of questions about what applies to them. So this one involves uh, radiation. The question is this, if my device uses directed radiation to treat tumors and touches the skin, but not tissue via Doppler, for example, how, is how are biocompatibility requirements determined? Um, would this be considered direct as it touches the skin? Really good question. So these kinds of devices use a probe that touches the skin and then um, the radiation crosses the skin. So what you're looking at is the direct contact of the probe to the intact skin. And that's um, how the biocompatibility evaluation would be assessed. So it would be the direct skin contact that you would be thinking about. Thank you. All right, Jen, thank you for that. Our next question, very simply, do I need to be certified for ISO 10993-1? Another wonderful question. So in the US, um, the use of uh, consensus standards is voluntary. So we do not have any requirements that a company be certified to use a particular standard. What we would like to um, have you do is understand the standard and how FDA uses the standard. So we do encourage you to read and understand the standard and read and understand our biocompatibility guidance, which explains how we use that standard, but no certification to the standard is required in the US. All right, thank you. Um, our next question, it's a device specific question. Once again, this one's about ventilators. Um, for some types of devices, such as ventilators, the biocompatibility is evaluated in accordance with ISO 18562 series. In these cases, it is also required to carry out the evaluation according to ISO 10993. Um, or, I'm sorry, let me reframe it as a question. Um, is it also required to carry out the evaluation in accordance to ISO 10993 or compliance with the ISO 18562 series? So this is a good question. The ISO 18562 series of standards discuss the biocompatibility of devices in contact with the gas pathway. The um, series of standards outlines certain aspects of the biocompatibility evaluation, but um, if your device is used um, in conjunction with drug products, there will be a piece of the evaluation that's not addressed by this series of standards. So you can start with ISO 18562. In some cases, the standards tell you when you need to go to the ISO 10993 standards. And then you also need to look at the scope of these standards to make sure that there aren't um, aspects of your device where additional biocompatibility evaluations would be needed. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Um, our next question, uh, when using accessories such as um, an SpO2 sensor that have already been approved by the FDA that are already FDA granted to market, is submission of the biocompatibility analysis according to ISO 10993-1 required? Or is it sufficient to declare that the sensor has already been authorized on another device? This is another really good question. So when you're incorporating devices that already have US market clearance or approval, um, you need to think about whether anything you're doing in terms of putting that device or component in with your other devices or components, if there's any manufacturing processes that could impact um, the um, biocompatibility. So what we would expect to see is for you to explain where the device already has market clearance or approval in the US and to explain that you don't do anything from a manufacturing or packaging perspective that you think would impact the biocompatibility. And then um, if the review team agrees, then you can move forward without any new biocompatibility testing, but we would like you to address in your submission why you don't think that's needed. Thanks. All right, Jen, thank you. Um, our next question for you. Is biocompatibility information required in a pre-market submission for a device that 
only contacts intact skin for a short time. Now, here they've qualified it as less than 24 hours. Thank you. So we do want you to have in your submission a um, section on biocompatibility and whether or not it's relevant. If you have a device in contact with intact skin for less than 24 hours, we do recommend, as does ISO 10993-1, that cytotoxicity, sensitization, and irritation be evaluated. There are some um, qualifications in terms of the length of time that a device is used. If it's very, very short for a few minutes, um, you may be able to um, easily make a rationale if you're using known materials, um, but you need to, less than 24 hours still needs to be considered under a biocompatibility review. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. I think we have time for a few more questions. We'll so see what we can do here. Um, for our next question for you. My device provides an external barrier to prevent contact from internal materials. Do I need to test the internal materials or can I just test the external barrier? Another good question. So sometimes um, we look at devices where um, there are external barriers and what we're wondering about is whether or not it's uh, permeable to fluids. And so sometimes a manufacturer may have testing to support that they, for example, have a hermetic seal. And in those cases, it would be reasonable to use a test sample for biocompatibility testing that does not include the internal components. We see this a lot with devices like pacemakers that have a lot of electronics inside. Um, however, manufacturing processes that are used to create the barrier components may result in chemicals that could impact the biocompatibility of the final device. So we do recommend that it be a final device-like sample and not just the, the barrier material. Thanks. All right, thank you, Jen. Um, here's a great question that I think I'm sure we get a lot. Is there a list of FDA-approved materials that don't need to be tested? And specifically, um, what about stainless steel? Also a really good question. Um, so we do not actually have a material list. This is because the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health does not clear or approve individual materials that are used in the fabrication of medical devices. We want uh, your risk evaluation to consider not only the materials used in the device, but also the processing of the materials, the manufacturing methods, including the sterilization process and any residuals from manufacturing aids used during the process. So for a material like stainless steel, it's been used quite a bit, but how you manufacture that material could actually impact the biocompatibility. So both the manufacturing and the materials of construction need to be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. For next question, is biocompatibility testing required for IDE applications? So we do expect a biocompatibility evaluation in an IDE application and the same endpoints should be considered. Um, based on your device tissue contact and duration of use. And sometimes you'll need to do testing and sometimes a rationale will be sufficient. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. All right, we have time for one final question. Um, here it is. If we have a component of a device that is changed to a new known material, what should be considered for documenting the rationale for no additional testing? So I think this is uh, very similar to the last question. I think that even if you're changing to a known material, how you manufacture that material, if you're changing the material and you're using the same manufacturing processes, you could end up with different chemicals. So you're starting, your previous device was material A, you manufactured it one way, your manufacturing processes could interact with that material A in one way, now you have a 
different material it's known, but those same manufacturing processes could interact differently with that new material and uh, impact the biocompatibility in a different way. So even though you're using a known material, how you manufacture that material could impact its biocompatibility. Thank you. All right, Jen, thank you. Thank you for all the great questions. That's all we have time for for today. Let me quickly turn it back to Jen and please share your final thoughts for our audience on the topic of biocompatibility basics. Thank you, Elias, and thank you everyone who attended today and for all the wonderful questions. I do encourage you all to work with the biocompatibility experts on your staff or at a contracting test lab to make sure that any biocompatibility rationales or testing provided to support a regulatory submission is consistent with the principles in our FDA biocompatibility guidance. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. That is a wrap for our first two sessions for this morning. Um, let's now take a break. Um, we'll take a break of about 20 minutes, and then we'll continue with session three after the break on the topic of consensus standards and the conformity assessment program. We'll see you in a few minutes after the break. Thanks for joining us.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your quick break as we wrapped up our first two sessions for this morning. Uh, before going any further, I just wanted to um, say a few admin uh, administrative remarks. Uh, we're showing this slide here, and we'll have it up a couple of times during our track. Uh, definitely want you to take a photo of this slide or just memorize or keep it handy. Uh, this highlights the three resources that we at CDRH provide to you for industry education. First one is CDRH Learn. Uh, this has all of our multimedia videos, recordings, webinars. Over 250 modules are here. The second is Device Advice. Um, this is the written or text-based education with well over 200 pages of content. And then finally, third but not least, is um, our Division of Industry and Consumer Education, DICE. You have our email address listed here, as well as our phone number. And then we have our homepage. Please check it out. Um, this is a great uh, resource for you as you have questions in the future. All right. Now, during each presentation, we'll have a link to the speaker evaluation under the speaker's picture or information on the right side of the screen. We really encourage you to take the time to complete the evaluation as your feedback is really appreciated. Please take time out to fill out the surveys for us. Um, in addition to the speaker evaluations for each individual, we have our final evaluation and we really request that you complete that as well. As a reminder, all of the sessions are being recorded and are available after the conference. And you'll be able to find them all at www.fda.gov forward slash ready 2023. Very simple as that. Now, during the break, I was just checking, talking with Brenda. She's informed me that we have over 14,000 registrants. 14,000. That is incredible. And you all come from over well over 100 countries. Um, my thanks to you for registering for our conference, taking the time to enjoy it. It's great to see these numbers, and we do hope that it's well worth your time. All right. So with that, let's proceed with session three. So we started our morning with a great foundation from Kendra. Um, and then Jen talked about file compatibility basics and made some indirect references to some standards. Well, now on session three, we're going to talk all about standards. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to our next speaker. Scott Colburn is the director of the Standards and Conformity Assessment Program at CDRH's Office of Strategic Partnerships and Technology and Innovation, or OST. In this, in this role, Scott is responsible for the CDRH standards recognition and related developmental activities in well over 600 national and international consensus standards committees. Scott oversees the program's new accreditation scheme for conformity assessment pilot program. Now that's ASCA, and we're gonna hear all about that um, today. Scott leads CDRH's efforts to optimize standards for regulatory use within the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, or IMDRF. Scott has a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Marquette University and a Master's of Science in Biomedical Technology Development and Management from Georgetown University and Virginia Tech. Scott's been with the FDA for a number of years, and he recently retired from active duty after 23 years of service with the U.S. Army and U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. Scott, thank you for your years of service to our country. So with that, let's hear Scott and his presentation, Streamlining Conformity Assessment, Putting Standards to Work. Take it away, Scott. Hello, and thank you for joining. My name is Scott Colburn, and today I'm going to talk with you about how you can streamline conformity assessment and device review by putting consensus standards to work. Today we're going to discuss how voluntary consensus standards are an essential and important tool in regulatory science, and that citing FDA-recognized standards and device submissions will save you and FDA reviewers time during the review process and across the total product life cycle of your medical our goals today are to accomplish the following learning objectives during our time together. At the end of today, we hope you will gain a better appreciation of why standards are such a valuable tool and describe how SCAP promotes and advances their use in device testing and enhancing their success in submissions. 
Finally, you'll understand how ASCA works and why you should consider participating in it. We will begin with a description of how SCAP is organized and how we manage and promote the use of standards. This will provide a good foundation for our discussion of standards and their usefulness later in the program. Before I do that, I want to remind everyone why we place such a strong emphasis on standards and why we consider them such an important regulatory tool. First of all, consensus standards are crowdsourced, which means they reflect the collective knowledge of experts from around the globe. And of course, standards contribute to quality, high quality standards, meaning quality medical devices with excellent safety profiles. When manufacturers comply with national and international consensus standards, it reduces their regulatory burden, and it does this by streamlining the conformity assessment aspects of device review. Finally, given that many manufacturers compete in global markets, when they test consensus standards accepted around the world, they could take advantage of a harmonized one test, one market model. The standards and conformity assessment program has four main priorities and they are depicted here as a life cycle of standardization. All of these efforts are directed toward our overarching goal, to drive and enhance the development and use of high quality standards that are fit for regulatory use. Let's first look at, at standards development. SCAP manages over 400 experts across the center who participate in more than 600 working groups across nearly three dozen standards development organizations. Many of these FDA experts also serve on what we call specialty task groups, or STGs, which align with specific areas like sterilization, biocompatibility, quality systems, and risk management to device-specific areas like orthopedics and in vitro diagnostics. These STGs are advisory in that they share their expertise and representation across the center to assist SCAP in making standards recognition and related policy decisions. In addition to participating in standards development, STG's members evaluate standards for regulatory use and assess the recommendations for, recommend, for recognition from our experts and external requests by the private sector who participate in the committees that write and revise standards. The next element is our conformity assessment. Once standards are formally recognized, our job is to put them to work on behalf of conformity assessment. A well-written standard with clear test methods and acceptance criteria makes conformity assessment more straightforward for both manufacturers and regulators. Later on, we will discuss a bit about how you can use a recognized standard to support a declaration of conformity, as well as how the ASCA program provides further confidence in the competence of testing to certain standards. I'll get into a lot more detail about the ASCA program shortly, but its goal is to streamline conformity assessment aspects of device review. Finally, we look to take the experience we gain about standards use in supporting their scope, how they are used to evaluate their performance, and determine whether revisions are needed to keep up with post-market data and emerging technologies. This final part of a standards life cycle is an important priority to the FDA, as it is critical that all stakeholders, including users of medical devices, contribute. The term recognition refers to the process by which FDA identifies a published consensus standard that is appropriate for manufacturers to declare conformance to when meeting a submission requirement. Recognition is a formal, rigorous, and transparent process, much like the standards development itself. From a manufacturer's perspective, when a company conforms to a recognized standard, they include a declaration of conformity in their submission which reduces the amount of documentation that will be required. We will talk more about supplemental documentation in a bit, but before we do, let's talk about the recognition program itself. First of all, anyone inside or outside of FDA is encouraged to submit a recognition request. Second, FDA can recognize all or only part of a standard. While we much prefer complete recognition, Sometimes elements of a standard as published might conflict with FDA requirements or published guidance, so we issue a partial recognition. And since we want to be transparent, we publish the rationale for each recognition decision, and these decisions can be found in our publicly available recognized standards database. There is also a database for standards which we specifically choose not to recognize. We'll share links to these in our closing slides. 
Finally, we keep an eye on standards and revisions through the extensive development work conducted by our standards liaisons. This way, we know when to up update our recognition database or even when to withdraw standards that are no longer appropriate for recognition. You can find all of this information on the SCAP webpage and in our guidance document entitled Recognition and Withdrawal of Voluntary Consensus Standards. So how do we put standards to work on behalf of device regulation? Well, first of all, and I want to emphasize this strongly, even though citing standards is voluntary, FDA really encourages manufacturers to use them in their device submissions. And as I just shared with you, so much of what we do in SCAP is directed towards reducing regulatory burden through the appropriate use of voluntary consensus standards. When an FDA recognized standard is cited in a declaration of conformity, less information and less documentation may be needed. This reduces the burden on both device manufacturers who are compiling the submission and the FDA staff who review it. Second, a recognition decision, which can be found in our recognized standards database, communicates important information about how that standard can help a manufacturer meet a particular requirement. This may include relevant regulations, product codes for product-specific standards, and guidance that further explains FDA recommendations on how to appropriately use standards. And as you'll hear us say over and over, when you cite a recognized standard and send us a declaration of conformity, it reduces the amount of detailed supporting documentation that needs to be submitted and will streamline how we review the submission. A declaration of conformity is very simple and straightforward. It is an attestation that the device conforms to all the requirements of a standard, and as such, it conforms to FDA that all the normative requirements of the standard have been met. If the, if the submitter is declaring conformity to an FDA-recognized standard, a declaration of conformity should be included in the submission, along with the appropriate amount of supplemental documentation needed. And I want to draw your attention to the italicized phrase in that last bullet. A declaration of conformity to a recognized stand standard typically will not require a complete test report unless otherwise directed by an FDA guidance. As you know, some complete test reports can be hundreds of pages long and often raise questions that require time and resources to respond to. Please don't send them if we don't need them unless called out in relevant guidance or by the review team. Even though we strongly recommend the use of recognized standards, their use and the submission of a declaration of conformity is voluntary. That means manufacturers may also use other non-recognized consensus standards under the general use provision, and they can also use a recognized standard without a declaration of conformity in general use category. However, since declarations of conformity are not included in these cases, complete test reports should be submitted which will be reviewed by FDA, possibly adding time to the review process. Recognized standards can be used towards general use without a declaration of conformity if the standard was modified or deviated from outside what the standard calls for. Just be aware, again, that complete test reports may be required. So we've talked about standards development and the next step of FDA recognition. And now we will discuss SCAP's third element, the Accreditation Scheme for Conformity Assessment, or ASCA. ASCA drives what we know from decades of standards review and submissions and focused on enhancing their use by directly working with conformity assessment bodies to ensure testing is optimized. It is designed for FDA to have confidence when conducting their submission review. It is a voluntary program that builds upon the appropriate use of recognized standards and was developed with input from experts across the medical device manufacturing and conformity assessment communities. ASCA's foundation is the well-established international infrastructure that includes key overarching conformity assessment standards for accreditation bodies and testing laboratories. As we like to say, we are putting standards to work with ASCA. ASCA's goal is simple, to streamline the rigorous conformity assessment aspects of pre-market review. It was built in response to an analysis we conducted of submission data that demonstrated a wide variety of approaches testing houses and manufacturers were taking to testing and reporting on the use of standards and device submissions. 
It is designed to enhance your confidence in the testing being done and reduce the time FDA needs to assess your declaration of conformity to standards in ASCA. If ASCA accredited testing labs are used, FDA has confidence in their test methods and results, meaning that manufacturers should see fewer requests for additional information, while we'll see fewer internal FDA consults during review and less complete test report reviews as well. ASCA also removes much of what manufacturers sometimes call guesswork about what supplemental documentation to include in their submissions. And it does this by providing templates for your declarations of conformity and summary test reports to the standards included in the program. The summary test report templates stipulate precisely the information that should accompany a declaration of conformity. This, in turn, leads to a review process that is more consistent more predictable, and more efficient, all of which support CDRH's commitment to a least burdensome approach. Finally, ASCA improves the overall quality of testing. We, we chose standards for ASCA that presented testing challenges for this very reason. The standards chosen are held to very high standards by FDA. The participating testing labs and accreditation bodies within ASCA have demonstrated their competence for their ASCA scopes of accreditation or recognition. We are already seeing where ASCA testing is proving to enhance the quality of testing and results while reducing the burden of regulatory review. There are two series of standards and test methods in the ASCA program. The first is biocompatibility, and you can see its scope in this table. Standards are listed on the left column and the test methods included in ASCA on the right. The majority of medical devices that need biocompatibility assessment utilize these methods, and ASCA includes nine of the most common biocompatibility test methods, each with its own ASCA declaration of conformity and summary test report. The basic safety and essential performance standards in ASCA program are from two families, IEC 60601 and the safety standard IEC 61010-1. To see a list of all the product-specific standards included in the 60601 family, the ASCA Basic Safety and Essential Performance Standard-Specific Guidance and the ASCA webpage contain the complete list. I also recommend you go to our FDA Recognized Standards database and sort by hitting the ASCA box to see the updates to standards included in the program under the series. Currently, there are, oh, there are more than 100 Basic Safety and Essential Performance and biocompatibility standards included in ASCA. These are broadly used across several medical devices. For this family of standards specifically, there is one ASCA summary test report template. As we know, infusion pumps deliver medications and nutrition to patients and are an important and common device in the patient care arena. They are designed for IV, subcutaneous, and intra-arterial use amongst other routes and have direct contact with blood and other bodily fluids and tissue, so they need biocompatibility assessment. Since the pumps are also electric de electrical devices, they require testing the basic safety and essential performance standards, so both ASCA standard series are needed for infusion pump testing. I'll start with the biocompatibility aspects. The tubing lumen has indirect contact with the patient's blood, and the following testing be con can be conducted. Memolution cytotoxicity, GPMT sensitization, intercutaneous reactivity irritation, acute systemic toxicity, material mediated pyrogenicity, and hemolysis. These are actually all included in ASCA. This table models the contrast between biocompatibility testing for non ASCA versus ASCA for an infusion pump. We all know that biocompatibility is a tough and challenging testing area. As we worked with subject matter experts to set up the ASCA scheme, we realized that efficiencies with ASCA could be dramatic. Recall that when ASCA testing is conducted, we generally will not want to see a complete test report unless indicated in the summary test report itself based upon the findings entered. This table compares the non-ASCA testing under the common header complete test report with ASCA testing under the common header ASCA summary test report. Let's break down where ASCA conformity assessment is faster. 
First, when reviewing or complete test reports, even some experienced FDA reviewers may need to order an internal consult with a subject matter expert. That could add days or even weeks to the review. Since the only documentation with ASCA testing is the ASCA summary test report itself, the lead reviewer is trained and therefore can easily conduct the review without a consult if all reported results are within acceptable ranges. Second, the number of pages to review is much higher with non-ASCA testing. A minimum of 10 to 20 pages per test method versus only two to three with the ASCA summary test reports. Third, the review time of ASCA summary test reports is far less. 10 to 15 minutes per method as opposed to a minimum of 90 minutes per method with a complete test report. And finally, if we add up all the time needed for biocompatibility aspects of an infusion pump, you can see that at least 10, if not even 20 or more hours are needed for traditional review versus a total of 70 to 90 minutes for ASCA testing. Here's a sample ASCA summary test report for one of the biocompatibility tests, the MEM Aleutian cytotoxicity. As you can see, the summary test report is only two pages and the red text is exactly what test labs will fill in. Critical testing conditions like extraction condi conditions and sample preparation and data are captured in the same format, which is designed to organize the information review staff need in an easy to analyze manner. Since we are confident in the ASCA accredited test labs and their methods and results, this two page summary, along with the ASCA declaration of conformity, is all we need if there are no adverse findings. So as we mentioned before, infusion pumps also require testing for basic safety and essential performance, specifically in the 60601 series. Like the biocompatibility comparison, this table models the difference in reviews between non-ASCA and ASCA testing. Let's start with the review staff's considerations. Reviewers may need to consult a subject matter expert for the review of a complete test report, adding significant time again to the review. Conversely, with ASCA testing, even a more junior reviewer will generally not need to request a consult for an ASCA summary test report. Testing review for 60601-1, 1-2, and 1-12 in this example could easily yield 150 or more pages to read through and scrutinize. The ASCA summary test report, on the other hand, is about 10 pages long. When we add up the time, you can see that dramatic distinction between the two. Non-ASCA testing with complete test reports, again, can take 10 hours or more for FDA versus one and a half hours for ASCA testing. The ASCA summary test report provides everything a reviewer needs in a comprehensive but straightforward and easy review format. This table shows a real world example we had. We received this submission earlier this year in a 510K for a class two medical device. They used non-ASCA testing for 60601-1-2 for EMC and ASCA testing for the basic safety essential performance general standard. As you can see, during the review, we identified four deficiencies with the non-ASCA testing and zero with the ASCA testing. As we all know and appreciate, addressing deficiencies can be extremely burdensome and sometimes consuming and can sometimes even necessitate retesting, which is very costly. The difference between the report length also is quite dramatic. 46 pages for a non-ASCA testing and typically is much longer versus only nine for the ASCA testing. More than five times that length and much more work for everyone. The test lab and the manufacturer and the review staff all benefit when the ASCA testing is applied and done correctly. Manufacturers might agree that our EMC testing reviews are particularly thorough. On this slide is an example deficiency that captures a review item. I'm not gonna read it all, but let me draw your attention to the yellow highlighted words. We request that you clarify, and more importantly, if the processing system was not adequately exposed, we request that you perform new testing. This manufacturer now needs to go back to the test lab to get at best an answer to the clarification request, and at worst, conduct new testing again, adding 
valuable time to the review process. This deficiency would not exist in the review of an ask a summary test report because one, we trust the accredited labs to have set up the test properly, and two, the summary test report does not require the demonstration of the test setup for every test performed from the confidence we already have in that lab. Of course, it's early days still with ASCA, but what we have seen in submissions so far is very encouraging, and they include everything from IDEs, 510Ks, and even a de novo with ASCA testing. In those submissions, we received everything we needed, the ASCA summary test report template was used, and all the data and testing conditions were captured. All in all, reviewers report it was easier and faster than non-ASCA testing. And as a quick update on the program, the ASCA received strong support in the MADUFA 5 amendment, and FDA is working to convert ASCA from a pilot to a permanent program. We really encourage you to give ASCA a try. On this slide, we share four FDA resources. The SCAP webpage, a link to our recognized consensus standards database, the non-recognized standards database, and our standards email box, CDRH standards staff at fda.hhs.gov. We encourage any and all questions. As you likely know, FDA publishes much of its policy and guidance form. Please be sure to become familiar with the three on this slide. The first guidance, Recognition and Withdrawal of Voluntary Consensus Standards, lays out how we run our standards recognition program. The second, the Appropriate Use Guidance, details how standards should be cited in submissions. And finally, though we didn't speak to the third one on this list, it is very helpful. Recommended content and format for non-clinical bench performance testing. If you'd like to learn more about ASCA, and we hope that you will, here are several ASCA resources, including the guidances that implement the ASCA program and the ASCA email address. And now for our quick knowledge check. How would you answer this question? Using standards confers which of the following? Stifles international trade, promotes device quality, enhances global harmonization, or adds time to the conformity assessment element of device review? The correct answer is B and C. Standards both promote quality and enhance global harmonization. One more question. What does ASCA stand for? The Aggregation of Standards and Confirmation Association? The Accreditation Scheme for Conformity Assessment? The Agency for Safety and Confirmation Analysis? Or the Additional Standards for Capital Assessment? If you answered B, you are correct. The Accreditation Scheme for Conformity Assessment. Again, we hope you give it a chance. Before we take your questions, I'd like to briefly review what we talked about today. First of all, I hope I've given you an understanding of how the Standards and Conformity Assessment Program works to advance the development and use of high quality, regulatory ready standards. Even more importantly, it is my hope that you appreciate how invaluable standards can be in improving device quality and advancing global harmonization. Finally, I ask that you commit to participating in the ASCA program in order to streamline conformity assessment and to enhance the overall quality of testing. Thank you. All right, Scott, and thank you for your presentation. Great content, and we have a lot of questions that have come in on this very hot topic. So, Scott, let's start off with our first question um, for you. Does FDA have plans to add additional standards to ASCA? Thanks, Elias, and thank you, everyone, for joining and asking these great questions. Um, so, as ASCA is finishing up its year in, in the pilot mode, we are looking at how we can consider enhancements and as appropriate expansions, which would consider what types of standards lend themselves to this type of conformity assessment. So the short answer is yes, but we wanna work with our stakeholders to determine which standards would make sense to put into this versus making other enhancements such as maybe improving the standard 
or updating a certain guidance or how we communicate the appropriate use. But if it's in an area where we need to have a better communication and a relationship with the conformity assessment body, those are the types of areas that we want to focus on for ASCA. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. We Thank you. We had a number of questions on some logistics and actual submissions. So let's get to one of them here. What is the least, what is your pers perspective of the least burdensome approach in dealing with attachments for standard details, the supplemental documentation that's to be included in an E-STAR traditional 510K? Yeah, thanks for that question, Elias. Uh, E-STAR and the way that it helps with standards is um, actually very much help enhances the appropriate use. In the E-STAR submission right up front, you get to choose which standards you are using um, is, and all the way down to or if it's a recognized uh, standard or not. And then you get to indicate how you're using that standard, whether it's general use, submitting declaration of conformity, or submitting a declaration of conformity under ASCA. In addition, and right below that, you get to add the attachment for the supplemental documentation of your declaration of conformity as appropriate. Now, I'll also note that within the submission under areas that are specific to, say, EMC or biocompatibility and other areas, there's also an opportunity to have your attachment added there instead, which may help with the review. And I just ask that, you know, as you look at the prompts that might indicate where it would make most sense for you to put that information. But the standard section does allow you to add that attachment. And where are you utilizing the declaration of conformity, it will build that declaration conformity for you later on. However, if you're using ASCA, that declaration conformity under the ASCA program still needs to be submitted separately. And that is all outlined in the steps, uh, the little question marks that you click in that area for the E-STAR. Thanks. All right, thank you, Scott. Our next question, I'm sure this happens um, periodically for the hundreds and hundreds of standards we have. So the, the, the question is here, how do you deal with a standards situation where one standard is written to replace another standard, but with the text mostly the same, yet the original standard ends up, ends up being kept alive on a parallel track and never goes away? Um, there's a specific uh, example stated here for transport ventilators, EN794-3 um, and ISO 10651-3. All right, thanks, Elias, and great job calling out those standards. You're a professional now. Um, so this is about what, you know, what do you do when standards change and what happens when FDA is recognizing a standard, or in some cases, and the two examples here, are actually uh, standards that we do not recognize. But the situation is the, the same in that you would want to you know, make sure you're communicating clearly which version of the standard you are using. Now with a recognized standard, we typically will put in a transitional statement in our recognition for both the newer version as well as the outgoing version of a standard while it's timing out from recognition. Um, it's important for manufacturers to evaluate that to ensure that they can make the appropriate changes all the way down to how that impacts the risk management file and quality system as they decide to look at newer versions of standards. Um, again, now this is looking at how you would utilize a standard for a pre-market submission and how that would work. If you're looking at how does this impact your currently marketed product, you need to consider, do, does the change of the newer standard need to, or would it require you to put in that newer version into your system? And then you, do, you would determine how you would employ that into your device file. Um, so I hope that helps answer it uh, for you in there. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And thanks for the shout out for how pronounced those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so easy. Um, okay, I'm gonna bundle a bunch of questions, maybe in rapid fire, all about ASCA. So let's kind right. of start this off, see what we can do here. First question about ASCA, is the program free? Yes, in terms of how you would engage with FDA utilizing ASCA, there is no charge to FDA. F FDA does not make a charge for any of the stakeholders that are engaged, which would include accreditation bodies, the testing labs that we have accredited, you know, have listed as accredited in the program, or how a manufacturer would, you know, have their submission come into FDA. Now, how you engage with a testing laboratory, testing laboratories deal with their charges independently, but that is not um, associated with the ASCA program directly. 
Okay. And then a quick follow-up to something you just said. What's the typical timeline to obtain accreditation? So you would need, if you're an already accredited testing laboratory and you're only going to add the ASCA program specifications, you would need to contact um, your accreditation body first to determine are they a participating uh, ASCA accreditation body. And if they are, they will work with you on how to fold that into your timeline. Um, if you would be getting a brand new accreditation, that timeline might take longer. After you receive accreditation from an ASCA recognized accreditation body, you would submit that application to FDA to obtain ASCA uh, accreditation. And our guidance indicates that we try to do that within 60 days or less, provided there are no glaring um, additional information needs or something to that effect. So that, that is kind of a two-step process. You have to work with your accreditation body to obtain your scope of accreditation, then you submit to FDA, in which we'll try to turn around in under 60 days. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a global audience, of course, attending Ready. So this question perhaps came from one of our international members. Uh, will FDA certify additional labs outside of the United States? So currently we have a number of labs from several different countries participating in ASCA. Now, currently our, we do require that they go through one of the five US-based accreditation bodies that are participating in the program. As we look at in, um, enhancing ASCA and expanding, those are some of the areas that we're looking to see as well. Um, the, the goal here is maintaining our confidence in the competence of the conformity assessment aspects that go on. We do keep an updated list, I saw that question come in, for the types of testing labs that are in uh, the ASCA program. We currently have 100 labs, but there are several that are outside the United States across the 60601 as well as biocompatibility areas. So there is a little bit in a number of different continents around the world, but we are always uh, interested in trying to expand it. And most of our accreditation bodies that we have can accredit you from a variety of different countries around the world. Thank you, Scott. And you actually killed two birds with one stone. You actually answered the, another question about, is there a list uh, or database to find uh, participating ASCA labs? You've answered that with yes. Can you explain where we can find that? Yeah, if you go to our main website, the Standards Conforming Assessment Program, um, we have an ASCA website as well. And within that, we have the lists of uh, testing laboratories, which accreditation bodies are participating. And under each testing laboratory, it lists um, their scope of accreditation, which would include the standards that are, that are underneath their scope. And that should be actually um, provided in one of the slides later on today, too, for resources. Thank you, Scott. Our next question, um, what are the requirements for a company to, requ to request accreditation for its own in-house labs? And can accreditation for multiple tests be requested uh, to be done in a single request? Yes, and so the process would be identical to a third-party lab or a lab that's not part of your company. Um, you would go through that same process of requesting for evaluation to the ISO IEC 17025 testing laboratory standard by a participating accreditation body. And then you would submit that application as it's outlined in our guidances to, uh, to FDA and you would get a response from us. You can get that in, uh, you know, as many of the standards that are included in the ASCA program based upon uh, what your interests may be. So. Uh, if you do have further questions, you could also email our program and we'll have that email address later and we'd be happy to connect with anyone who has questions on that. Thank you, Scott. I think we have time for one more question for you for this session. Again, a lot of great questions have been rolling in. Um, so for this last question for you, Scott, um, if I submit a declaration of conformity to a recognized standard, um, will this mean that I'm subject to further scrutiny um, since the test report and data were not were not submitted, were not included. 
Short answer is no. Um, the thing that you want to remember is a declaration of conformity typically does also mean you're accompanying some level of testing data to support that declaration of conformity. And a lot of times we have that outlined either, say, for example, in the ASCA program for those standards, we have a specific summary test report. We also have device and process specific FDA guidances that we cite that help outline what information should support the use of that standard. So in, in most cases, you're providing some information to us. So that, that gets you through the review. For, you know, if you were to be inspected, you would already have that complete test report as part of your file if that was ever to be needed to be looked at by uh, during an audit or inspection. So there should be no change if you're using a summary or smaller amount of information during your pre-market review than maybe what would be looked at during an audit. Thank you. All righty. Thank you, Scott. And that is our last question for your segment. Um, Scott, let me turn it back to you for your final thoughts for our audience um, for your topic. Thank you, Elias, and thank you everyone for the questions. Um, and we do encourage you to take a look at our programs, uh, make sure you have a, a you know, clarity on how you can approach standards to support a least burdensome and you know an improved regulatory journey, uh, regardless of the process that you're trying to go through. Um, we encourage you also to get engaged in the standards and conformity assessment aspects. It will really help your understanding of how you can apply that to your programs. Um, and and we, it also helps strengthen the relationships that we have amongst regulators um, and manufacturers and testing organizations. So we really appreciate the time. And uh, thank you, Elias, and to the whole crew who helped put this together. Have a great day. Thank you, Scott. Um, great content. And I really want to encourage our audience, please listen to Scott and his program efforts, um, standards. Um, it's growing in its use. Um, so this is um, great information for you to be able to apply. So let's um, switch gears now. Um, you know, we've been building on our morning, um, at least on the um, East, U.S. East Coast time, it's morning. Um, now we're going to finally get into kind of where things come together. Um, and this is going to be with a um, submission. And as I talked about earlier, um, there are a handful of regulatory submission pathways that the FDA NCDRH offers. We're going to focus on one, and it's going to be on the 510K process. This is the most prolific submission type that you'll likely encounter. And it's a very popular topic. Get ready. We love having it each year. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter for this topic and Andrew Sproul. Andrew is a consumer safety officer in our own Division of Industry and Consumer Education, DIC. Um, he's a new member of the pre-market programs branch. In his role, just like Kendra you heard from earlier, he educates you with understandable and accessible science-based regulatory information through answering questions individually through phone and email and helping to, to develop educational content just like this conference. Now, prior to joining our division just recently, um, FDA, um, Andrew had joined the FDA in, um, in, two, in 2020, where he served as a medical device reviewer in the Office of Product Evaluation and Quality, OPECT. He was in the obesity and hepatobiliary devices team. So Andrew brings with him a lot of experience in the review of 510Ks, IDEs, Q submissions, 513Gs, and recalls. Prior to his time at the FDA, Andrew served time at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, for four years in the Office of Information Technology. Uh, prior to that, Andrew was a clinical research coordinator at Washington University in St. Louis with the bone marrow transplant team. Andrew has a Bachelor of Science in Physiology from Michigan State and a Master of Science in Cellular Metabolism and Molecular Nutrition from the University of Chicago. With that intro, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Andrew and his topic, Detangling the 510K Process. Thank you for the kind introduction, Elias, and welcome everyone, both from within the United States and also around the world. Why don't we go ahead and get started? We understand that getting started with the 510K process can sometimes be confusing. You may find yourself like this gentleman here, staring into a, you know, kind of a tangled web of confusion. You may have questions about, you know, new terms like substantial equivalence, predicate device, additional information hold, so proceeding interactively, substantive review. 
um, all of these questions can be confusing, and it may lead to, you know, like this gentleman here, uh, having no less than 10 question marks shooting out the top of your head. Now, our goal today is to provide clarity on the 510K process, to detangle it so that you understand uh, what you're in for when you submit a 510K. For our time together today, I have four learning objectives listed here. Uh, the first is to define a 510K. So what is a 510K and you know, why should we care about it? Uh, the second is to describe sub substantial equivalence to a predicate device. The third is to discuss the review process. So I'll provide an overview of the steps that occur once you submit a 510K to the, um, to the FDA. And finally, I'll provide tips from a lead reviewer. Um, as Elias mentioned, I was a lead reviewer in the hepatobiliary and obesity devices team uh, for nearly three years. So I've reviewed several 510Ks as well as other uh, types of submissions. And I have some tips that may help your next uh, submission go more smoothly. So to begin, what is a 510K? Well, a 510K is a type of pre-market submission. It's a comparison of a new device or subject device to one or more legally marketed devices or predicate devices. And in a 510K, you must provide evidence that supports substantial equivalence between your subject device or your new device and a legally marketed device or a predicate device. And the key word here is comparison. You know, you must demonstrate that your device, your new device, is substantially equivalent to a predicate or legally marketed device. So I'd just like to give you um, a bit of a more big picture uh, view of the 510K. There are three different types of 510Ks. Uh, the traditional is the most common. It's uh, the review calendar is five, or I'm sorry, 90 calendar days, and all data are provided. So um, we want to see test reports. We want to see you know, any other kind of supporting data that you have um, in a traditional 510K. <clears throat> in an abbreviated 510K, these are similar to a traditional 510K in that the review clock is 90 calendar days. However, uh, for an abbreviated 510K, you may not need to provide full test reports, and it would rely on FDA-recognized standards, guidance documents, or special controls to help uh, establish substantial equivalence. And finally, there is a type of 510K called a special 510K. And these are for minor changes. So uh, the review clock would be uh, is 30 calendar days. And full data should not need to be reviewed for this type of 510K. Only sub summary level information focusing on the modifications should be provided. Now, keep in mind that many people wish to submit a special 510K because the review clock is so much shorter. However, a special 510K is only available to the owner of the device. So if your company makes a device, you want to make some minor changes to it, you may qualify for a special 510K. However, if your company is wishing to make modifications to somebody else's device, you may not qualify for a, a special 510K. Again, these are only available to the owner of the device. As traditional 510Ks are by far the most common type of 510K that we see, um, I'm not going to uh, speak more to the abbreviated or special 510K pathways, but I just wanted to make you aware that they do exist and it may be appropriate uh, for your situation. Okay, so moving back to um, 510Ks and predicate devices. What is a predicate device, you may be asking yourself? Well, first and foremost, a predicate device is a legally marketed device. There are a few different ways to become legally marketed. Um, the first is that your product was legally marketed prior to May 28, 1976, which is also what we would call a pre-amendments device. Um, additionally, a device that has been reclassified from class three to class two or class one would be considered legally marketed. Or a device that has been found substantially equivalent through the 510K process or safe and effective through the de novo process. And again, predicate devices are used as a comparison for substantial equivalence. So the predicate device essentially kind of sets the um, sets the bar for where your subject device needs to uh, needs to perform and be established as substantially equivalent. So what is substantial equivalence? I've mentioned this a few times, but really, what is the definition of this? And that's a finding that um, the FDA would show that or would determine that your device is as safe and effective as the predicate. 
And typically what goes into this determination is, does your device have the same intended use? And does it have the same or different technological characteristics? So if different technological characteristics exist for your device versus your predicate device, you need to make sure that the changes or the differences do not raise different questions of safety and effectiveness. You also must, um, you know, must make sure that the information sub submitted to the FDA demonstrates that your device is as safe and effective as a legally marketed device. Again, it's a comparison between your device and a legally marketed predicate device. You may be asking yourself, what is the purpose of a predicate device? Why do we go through the trouble of identifying one and, you know, why do we use it? Well, um, you know, to put it, to, you know, to put it directly, the predicate device serves as the basis for comparison. So I've mentioned a few times that, you know, the, a key component to the 510K process is the comparison between a subject and predicate device. Well, the predicate serves as the basis. And it serves for the basis of comparison in, in areas like intended use, design, materials, performance, safety, effectiveness, biocompatibility, labeling, standards, energy used or delivered, or any other area of the, um, of the file that uh, may be important to your particular device type. So the predicate device serves as the basis, and you must show that your subject device is substantially equivalent or the same as the predicate device. At this point, I'd like to introduce you to the 510K decision-making flowchart. It's located in Appendix A of the FDA uh, guidance, the 510K program evaluating substantial equivalence in pre-market notifications. And as you can see here, there are six different diamonds, uh, each shaded gray. And within these diamonds are different decision points, labeled from decision point number one to decision point 5B. And how this works is you're to take your predicate device and your um, new and subject device and walk them together through each decision point. So for example, a decision point number one is, is the predicate device legally marketed? And so as I mentioned in a previous slide, there are a few different ways to determine if the predicate device would be legally marketed. And if the answer to that is yes, the, the predicate device is legally marketed, you can move on to decision point number two. However, if the answer to that is no, the predicate device is not legally marketed, that would likely result in a not substantially equivalent decision. For the sake of time, uh, I'm not going to run through every single um, decision point here. However, I would like to uh, draw your attention to decision point number four. Uh, it seems to be a source of um, confusion and a fair amount of questions come from decision point number four. So decision point four, there's the question um, that I raised previously in the substantial equivalent slide. Do the different technological characteristics of the devices raise different questions of safety and effectiveness? So if the answer is yes to that, that means that they would be determined not substantially equivalent. And if the answer is no to that, that means you would move past decision point four to decision point number five. Now, when you're evaluating your, you know, your, your product, I'd like to kind of give you two examples of what may um, lead to different questions and what may not lead to different questions. Uh, so the first example is if you think of two different syringes and they are you know the same dimensions but they're made out of different types of plastic and so you know the questions that you might have would come up about the new device as well as the old device would be you know are these plastics without compatible you know are they going to cause some kind of adverse reaction when um, in contact with the body. The other one would be performance testing so can the syringe you know, hold the liquid it's intended to hold? Can it be delivered to the patient without a large amount of press or a large amount of pressure pushing on the plunger? Things like that. Um, so questions of biocompatibility, questions of performance testing. And so those questions would be the same for either syringe if they're um, regardless of the material of the plastic. So that would be an example that would not raise new questions of safety and effectiveness because the questions are the same. Now, if you were to take a different type of device, perhaps a diagnostic device, and one that uses, um, let's say, ultrasound to form a, an image, and another that uses magnetic resonance, or MRI. And you may think, well, they're, you know, they both would provide an image of, you know, within the body in a non-invasive way. However, the magnetic resonance-based device, um, 
you would have extra, you know, questions of safety and you and its use with patients with metal in their bodies. And so that would present a new question of safety and effectiveness that would not be present for a device that only uses ultrasound. Now, you may think to yourself, well, we could do testing to see if it would be safe and if, you know, as safe as an ultrasound device, we could, you know, put some metal in the de in the device and test it. Um, however, the mere fact that the questions exist would make it not uh, able to pass decision point number four. So just keep that in mind that even if you can, you know, maybe address some of the new questions with testing, um, that the, the mere fact that the questions exist would kick you out of the flow chart at decision point number four. Okay, so that um, kind of ends our, you know, our summary of what is a 510K. Now I'd like to move into the kind of the process of the 510K. So this is a high-level process overview. Uh, there are multiple steps involved in the review of a 510K. Uh, the first being submission receipt. So when we, rec we receive your submission, uh, the second is an acceptance review. And this typically happens by day 15. Um, and I'm going to go into each one of these steps in more detail in, in subsequent slides. So I'm just going to, this is just a very quick um, high-level overview. Uh, the third step is a substantive review of your the information provided in your 510K. The fourth step is a substantive interaction decision. So it's either proceed interactively or an AI hold or additional information hold. And the fifth and final step uh, by day 90 is a final review and, uh, and decision is issued. Okay. So step number one, submission receipt. Okay, so essentially, the uh, FDA receives your submission. Uh, the information provided is entered into the FDA tracking system and is sub assigned a submission number. These are um, typically uh, for a 510K, it would be the, the letter K followed by six digits, and you would uh, most likely receive that on uh, some of your um, correspondence with the lead review team. And an acknowledgement email is issued to the official correspondent. So we'll let you know when we receive it. Um, your review clock uh, begins upon submission receipt. So that would be uh, day zero. This brings us to step number two, the acceptance review. The acceptance review is an administrative review checking that major topics have been addressed. So at this point, we're not necessarily looking that deep into the content of your file. However, if, for example, your file requires some biocompatibility testing, we're checking to make sure that you've at least provided some information um, addressing the, the biocompatibility endpoints. Now, if your file is accepted, the file, it moves on to the next step. And if it's not accepted, uh, you'd receive a notification and we'll have 180 days to address and to provide any um, missing information. Now, there's a 15-day review clock for the acceptance review. So after 15 days from when we have received your file, we'll get back to you and let you know if it's been accepted or not accepted. Now, to let you know about the review clock, it would start over at day zero if you need to resubmit with more information. I would also like to note that there are some changes coming to the acceptance review uh, process. Now, this acceptance review, as demonstrated in this slide, uh, pertains to our eCopy program. However, as I'll get into in a subsequent slide, we are uh, transitioning to the eStar program. Uh, eStar is essentially a dynamic PDF template for use with 510K submissions. And given that an, a properly uh, prepared electronic submission with this template should represent a complete submission, uh, eStar submissions are not anticipated to undergo a refuse to accept process. However, the FDA intends to employ a virus scanning and technical screening process for an eStar submission. So step number three is the substantive review. And so this is the entire content of your 510K is reviewed for substantial equivalence to a predicate device. So we'll review your test reports, your comparison to your predicate device, um, and all of the other you know, types of information that, um, that are required for uh, your particular device. This is approximately a 60-day review clock, and um, at the end of the 60-day review clock, we'll, we'll uh, respond to you with either um, we want to proceed interactively or we'd like to um, put your file on hold so that you can provide more information. And this is step number four. Um, as I just mentioned, you know, a substantive interaction typically results in either PI or AI 
Um, proceeding interactively occurs immediately after substantial equivalence, excuse me, after substantive interaction, and lasts for the remainder of the review clock. So um, would typically be about 30 days for a proceeding interactively um, notification. Now, additional information, I'll uh, review that on the, uh, on the next slide. So an AI hold is um, basically is that the review team has determined that your file needs additional information. Um, it, the information is requested through uh, deficiencies listed in an AI hold letter, and you have 180 days to def address the deficiencies. Now, if you receive an AI hold letter, don't panic, first and foremost. These are very common in the 510K process. And essentially, we recommend that you, you know, read the deficiencies, you know, read what the information that the FDA is asking for, and also, you know, maybe think about how you might want to respond. Now, if you've received a deficiency and you're just not sure of what is being asked or you'd like clarification on anything within your letter, um, you do have the option to, to request a clarification call with the FDA. Now, these clarification calls must be requested within 10 days of receipt of the letter. And um, there's more information in the AI hold letter um, regarding this call, but it is something that you may want to take advantage of if the deficiencies or information in the letter is not, uh, not completely clear to you. And step number five. Step number five is the final review and decision. The review team reviews information provided during the proceeding interactively or AI hold stages. This typically takes around 30 days and a final decision would be issued um, at the end here. Either your device is substantial equivalent or it is not substantially equivalent. And that is you know, the five steps involved in the review of the 510K. Um, so I'd like to just give a little bit of um, information about the Q submission pro uh, program. So Q submissions can be useful for 510K submissions. It's an opportunity to interact with the FDA either prior to a 510K submission or while your file is on additional information hold. You can get feedback on your experimental plans or protocols. And what, one thing that makes uh, many people um, you know, fairly happy is that it's free. There are no user fees associated with a Q submission. And so, as I mentioned here, a Q submission is a great way to get feedback on your experimental plans or protocols. So if you're, you know, say you're planning on doing some biocompatibility testing, but you're not sure if, you know, your lab is going to do it in the correct way, you can submit the protocol to the FDA through a Q submission to um, get our feedback on what we think of your experimental plans. Now, if you've already done the testing and you have all of the data, and you submit you know, that in a Q submission, that's really outside of the scope of the Q submission program. So it's not a pre-review of data. You know, we're, we're not, um, you know, it, it's not for, we've already done these experiments, what do you think? It's, these are the experiments we're planning, can you give us feedback on the experiments? So that's something to keep in mind. Um, you can, you know, so if you were to submit a Q submission prior to submitting a 510K at all, you would submit what's called a pre-submission. A pre meaning before, submission meaning submission. Or if your um, file is on AI hold and you want to get feedback on your experimental plans, you could submit what's called a submission issue request. And so that is just a special type of Q submission for, for uh, 510K files that are on AI hold. I'd also like to make a note of eStar. ESTAR stands for the Electronic Submission Template and Resource. It's a dynamic PDF submission template. It contains resources for submission preparation. And starting on October 1st of, of this year, all 510K submissions must use ESTAR unless they're exempted. Now, when I say dynamic PDF submission template, what that means is the file will adapt to um, the selections that you make uh, to request um, different uh, types of information. So if you wanted to submit a 510K, it would ask you for information regarding a 510K. If you wish to submit a de novo, it would adapt and ask for information regarding a de novo. Now, currently, eStar is voluntary. Um, however, as I mentioned here, um, starting on October 1st, it would be mandatory. Now, if you're looking for more information about eStar, um, you can search for the voluntary eStar program on the uh, fta.gov website. Okay, so um, now that we have you know, described what a 510K is, talked about substantial equivalence and um, 
and predicate devices, as well as gone through the review process of a 510K. I'd like to provide you some tips uh, from a lead reviewer. So just so you know, I'll give you a little bit of a background. You know, we understand that sometimes it can feel like you're, you know, you're gathering all of your information for a submission, you submit it, it goes into something like a black box, and then you get a decision at the end. Well, I'd like to kind of, you know, peel back the curtain just a little bit to let you know that re your review team may be made up of engineers, scientists, and clinicians, you know, perhaps like your company. Um, we're often excited to see new devices. You know, we understand the, um, the privilege it is to perhaps be some of the first people to see your device outside of your company. You know, we're often able to, um, you know, to understand and recognize the benefit that your device could provide for, you know, many sick people. Um, however, you know, all of that uh, taken together, uh, we're also tasked with ensuring that your device is safe and effective for patients. And so, you know, with our excitement also comes our, you know, our tasks of making sure that your device is, um, is safe and also as effective as, as intended. Okay. So tip number one, you know, kind of sticking with the, um, you know, we're humans, is that uh, the more humans theme that was presented in the last slide is that we'd like you to keep in mind that your file will be reviewed by a human. So first, you know, we'd recommend that you keep your file organized. If you were to put, you know, reference in your, you know, in your diet, in your submission that, oh, the, you know, sterility information is located in Appendix A. You know, we'd, re we'd ask that you make sure that Appendix A exists and it also that it contains sterility information. And this is just to make the review process go a little bit more smoothly because, you know, it would also help you in that it may reduce the amount of um, interactive requests that you would receive and might have to, to scramble to get the information. Uh, we also recommend that or your file must be submitted in English. I once had a, a file that was, you know, for dozens of pages, it was, you know, the first, it was single spaced and the first line was English, second line German, third line English, fourth line German. And while it were English translations, it was very difficult to read. And so um, we just asked that, you know, keep it organized, submit it in English and, you know, keep in mind that a human is going to be reading this. Um, in that particular example, um, I reached out to the sponsor and uh, they were willing to provide a, um, you know, a version that was, you know, just in English to make it um, easier to read. Uh, my second tip is um, to check your email often. You know, we work to get you a decision as soon as possible, often within Madufa deadlines. Uh, sometimes this makes it necessary to issue communications during non-business hours. So. Um, I once had a, a person call me um, in my position here with Dice, who was very upset that we sent her a letter at 10 o'clock on a Friday night. And unfortunately, or fortunately, you know, depending on your view, um, the the review clock, the days start and end at midnight Eastern time, and they don't take into account, you know, weekends, holidays, or um, you know, vacation time, sick leave, anything like that. You know, 60 days is 60 days. And so sometimes it makes it necessary to issue, you know, letters at 10 o'clock on Friday night. So please check your, your email often, especially while you have a file under review. Uh, the next is don't forget about your spam folder. For whatever reason, FDA files tend to go to the spam folder. Okay, so this brings us to the knowledge check phase of our, uh, our time together today. Um, so knowledge check number one is a true or false question. A new or subject device needs to be identical to the predicate device. I'll give you a few seconds here to ponder. And the answer is false. Um, as I mentioned, you know, they can have different technological characteristics, but um, they do not need to be identical. And the different technological can our characteristics must not lead to new questions of safety and effectiveness. Now let's check number two. A Q submission is a way to get FTA feedback regarding your 510K. Is that true or is it false? I'll give you a few seconds to, um, you know, to, to think it over. And the answer is true. Um, you would have, you know, the opportunity to submit a pre-submission before you submit your 510K or a submission issue request if your 510K is on AI hold for feedback regarding your experimental plans or protocols. 
I do have two resources slides here, um, and these are, you know, relating to, you know, the 510K process, device advice, all of those kind of things. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read through um, every single one, but they are here. Here are some additional resources, uh, both regarding 510K as well as eStar and uh, pre-market notification procedures. That concludes my uh, prepared uh, statements for today. Uh, thank you for joining me with this uh, presentation, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. All right, Andrew, uh, we actually got quite a few questions for you. So thank you for your remarks on the 510K program. I enjoyed hearing um, from your perspective as a recent reviewer what it's been like. So let's get to all the questions. Again, this is a very hot topic, so we'll see how many questions we can get uh, before our next break. So let me start with our first question for you. Um, question is this, I'm looking for a summary for a specific 510K and I can't find it. Where can I get a copy? Thank you, Elias, and um, thanks for that question. Uh, this question is actually one of the most common questions that we receive uh, in the Division of Industry and Consumer Education. Um, and so to kind of catch everyone up, I realize there's probably people in the audience who are brand new to the 510K process and others who are very experienced, but just to get everyone on the same page, uh, the FDA curates a, uh, or maintains a database of uh, publicly available information regarding 510Ks. And in that, um, in that database, um, there are you know things like the product code that the clearance was cleared under regulation, et cetera. And for some, but not all clearances, there is a link to the 510K summary. Now, um, you know we get the question, you know where is, where is the summary? How can I find it? And the answer typically lies, or most of the time lies, with the time, like the date that the clearance was was issued. So clearances prior to uh, 1990. Um, typically don't even have a, a 510k summary. They just weren't uh, accepted or expected by the FDA at that time. Now, from 1990 until 2007, uh, they were accepted as part of a 510k, uh, but they were not um, you know, posted regularly to our database. And then now, from 2007 until today, uh, the 510k summary is uh, typically posted to the, to the database. Now, you know, sometimes, you know, if you find a clearance that is, you know, older than 2007, uh, the best way to get a copy of it would be to submit a Freedom of Information Act or FOIA request. Um, and you can find, you know, information about uh, CDRH's FOIA team if you just do a quick internet search for uh, CDRH FOIA. Now, for clearances that are cleared after 2007, um, you can try to give us a call. Uh, you know, contact us at DICE, either via phone or via email, and we can look into it for you. Um, but we may need to refer you to our experts um, on the on the FOIA team uh, to get you that, that information. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we definitely have a number of questions here. I'm seeing a, a similar theme about timing of interacting with the FDA. So let's uh, kind of cluster some of these together. So here's the first one of those. When is the earliest that a business can contact the FDA to receive input about the development of the device? Um, the co question continues, can a request for input from FDA be made during the, develop the development of the device when the development is not completely done yet? And if yes, does it go through the pre-sub program? So Andrew, perhaps can you kind of talk, talk broadly about the timing of coming to the FDA? Sure, sure, absolutely, and yeah, thank you for that uh, multi-part question. Um, so, you know, to answer the, the question is that you know the pre-submission program is you know is in part designed to help you with the development of your device. So, if you have questions about you know will this one particular aspect of my device affect you know um, its ability to obtain a 510k clearance or you know anything like that that you need to get um, the feedback from the FDA experts on, uh, you're welcome to, to submit them. I'm not aware of a you know of a deadline for being too early um, because it's you know a lot of times it's uh, can be beneficial to get the FDA's uh, benefit or I'm sorry the FDA's uh, remarks um, early on in your uh, product's development. Now I did mention in my presentation that. Um, Q submissions are not for the review of data. So in terms of 
um, being too early, there you know probably isn't a limit. Um, but in terms of being too late, um, if you come to us with with data that has already been generated from a clinical trial or from a performance test or you know things like that, um, it might fall outside of the the Q submission or pre submission uh, program. So a, a pre submission is not a kind of a, a pre review of your five ten k. It's more of a um, you know a, a vehicle for you to get help uh, during the development of your of your product. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, our next question on the theme of timing. Um, in this case, the um, the question uh, is this: Could an early prototype of a device be used to submit a five ten k, or instead, does the device need to be in its uh, final finished form? Yeah. So. Um, Typically, you know, with a with a five ten k, the the device that is submitted in the five ten k, and you know, if you if you receive a clearance, that is a device that would be cleared for for marketing. Um, so, you know, if you're planning on you know making some some major changes or things like that, you may want to want to hold off until you're later on in your uh, you know device development. Um, but just to be clear, it's the device that is submitted in the five ten k is the one that would be cleared. Now, you can make changes uh, to the device after a clearance. However, it may need or may uh, trigger, you know, the, the need for a new 510K at that time. It just kind of depends on the, the nature of the changes and the nature of the device. Um, we do have a, a guidance available um, regarding, you know, do the changes to my device, it's, you know, something I'm paraphrasing here, but something about do the changes of my device require a new 510K? And you can find that in our um, FDA guidance uh, database. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Andrew. Um, here's another question. A variation of, of this question I think came up earlier, but I'd like to ask it here again, just in case it's um, slightly different, uh, an elaboration on, on the theme. Does a company have to be registered with the FDA prior to submitting a five uh, I kind of lost the end of that question, but I believe it was, um, you know, does a company need to be registered to submit a 510K? And typically, um, how the process works is um, the registration and listing process doesn't come until near the end of the um, near the end of the process. So um, typically you don't need to register and list until you know within 30 days of your plans to uh, commercialize uh, your device. So to answer the question, um, no, you don't need to be um, registered and listed with the FDA to submit a 510K. Okay, Andrew, and yes, thanks uh, for catching my, uh, my fall there with uh, um, not hearing the last part of the question. Um, let's go with our next question now. Can we use a special 510K when introducing an improved device that my company produces? So I think the, um, you know, the kind of the major, uh, you know, determination of special 510K versus the other types of 510K really come down to your specific device and your specific, you know, and the specific um, changes that you're looking to make. Uh, we do have resources available for both, um, you know, it, I mentioned the special 510K as well as the abbreviated 510K programs. Um, if you were to do an internet search for either of those titles, just, you know, abbreviated 510K or special 510K, uh, you would come up with, uh, with some websites that contain information. And we also have uh, guidance documents for each of those uh, processes. And so, you know, I'd, I'd recommend that, you know, without knowing more information about your, your product or the changes, that you start there, you know, just to see if um, what you're trying to do would, would qualify for either of those pathways. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think we have time for a few more questions before we wrap up. Um, let's go to this one. Um, if we determine that the predicate device is exempted from a 510K submission, then do we still need to submit a 510K? Sure. So I think, um, you know, the answer to, you know, kind of 510K exemptions or not uh, comes down to how your device is classified. 
So if your device is classified in a, in a regulation and a product code that is 510k exempt, then you, you would be exempt from submitting a, a 510k. So no, you wouldn't need to submit a 510k in that case if it falls into that uh, classification. Now keep in mind though, even um, you know 510k exempt devices would still need to you know abide by you know general controls, any special controls, um, and also the registration and listing process. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, I'm going to ask you one final question. This is a definitely popular one that we get uh, periodically in our division. We purchased a 510K from another business. Now, how can we get the 510K letter updated with our business name? Yes, that is a, a very, very popular question. Um, so the um, both the uh, the business letter and the five ten k database uh, reflect, you know, the uh, the company and the information at the time of clearance. So um, and it reflects that information in in perpetuity. You know, it's meant as a, I guess I've I've heard the phrase a snapshot in time for when the device was cleared. Um, so if that's important to you, um, it's just something to keep in mind that. Um, you know, CDRH, FDA, uh, we would not be issuing uh, new clearance letters or updating the 510K with your uh, company's name if you were to happen to, you know, to purchase a, uh, a 510K from a different business. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Um, let's turn it back to you with your final thoughts on the topic of 510Ks for our audience. Great, thanks, Elias, and thank you, everyone, for uh, for your attention today and for uh, for attending. Ready, um, and I think in closing, you know, I just like to um, you know state that we're all on the same team uh, with regards to getting safe and effective medical devices uh, to patients. You know, to improve their lives. I mean, that's really a major reason why why we're all here. And I hope that um, you use the information in my uh, presentation today, as well as on our uh, device uh, websites, um, and to help in the development of your next 510K. I think there's a few things that you can do. Um, I think uh, the first thing would be to reach out to DICE or the Division of Industry and Consumer Education with any uh, questions that you have. Um, we're available via phone and via email, and we tend to get back to people you know, very, very quickly. Uh, for any you know, technical questions or questions about your specific device type, uh, you might submit, consider submitting a, a, a Q submission to, to interact with um, the reviewers uh, that are experts in your device type. And uh, finally, I'd hope to, uh, I hope that you use the information in today's presentation, as well as the information um, that I've talked about in submitting a uh, kind of a clear and a well-organized application that contains valid scientific evidence to support substantial equivalence. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentation and, and your question and answer segment just now. Um, thank you to all of our presenters so far. We've covered four topics of our segment, um, part one. Um, let's now take a break. We'll take a break for one hour and we will um, return together at 12.45 p.m. Eastern time. So we thank you for your attention today, your participation, all the great questions. Um, and look forward to continuing, continuing this discussion with you um, in about an hour. See you then.
Hi everyone, welcome back. This is again day three of the Ready Annual Conference, Ready 2023. We have just started the second uh, track of our three track program, the device track. And we're in the middle of part one of the device track. We've covered four topics for you so far, and we've, we have two more topics to wrap up this segment. Now, before getting to that, I want to spend a couple of seconds on this particular slide that was showed, shown during, during the break. Um, encourage you to save this uh, link to this YouTube video. Um, this is a short two minute video that describes the services provided by us, by the Division of Industry and Consumer Education. Um, I encourage you to kind of check it out and sort of my philosophy um, in teaching and as an educator is, you know, my, my, my preference is not to teach you something right now so that you learn to fish for today, but my, my preference is that we teach you the strategies so that you can be resourceful on your own so you can fish for yourself tomorrow and in the future. So I think the, the large theme for what we do for you is certainly providing you with a lot of information right now for you to know. But I think, you know, more importantly is, you know, after we wrap up this conference, go back to your day jobs. Um, how do you go back and pull out all those resources that, that you're learning from us from today and, and tomorrow? If you're new to the industry, if you're new to regulatory affairs, I do know this can be overwhelming. Um, learning is a journey and learning is continual. I've been in this business for many years, um, several, several decades, and I can tell you for myself, I, I've learned a lot from our presenters today. Um, I will continue to learn. Um, that's why I think this is such a continuum. Um, we love this conference. We love coming to you with material that we believe you need and, and want to know. And it's kind of exciting for us, um, as Andrew talked about the evolution of devices in his, in his last presentation, you know, how the knowledge evolves, how the regs evolve. Medical devices are, are, all, are continually evolving. And so I think as I take that step back on the regulations, um, we try to do our part to help update the regulations to be front and center and properly regulate medical devices and radiological health products as we need to. All right. So uh, again, take a look at, the, at this link, this video after the conference, check it out. And it's going to have all you need to get started um, with the resources that we provide. So as we sort of transition to our next topic, oops, sorry about that. I'll go back. Um, as we switch trends into our next topic, um, let's talk about the theme of technology. So when I started as a, an FD scientific reviewer many years ago, I was involved with the review of pre-market submissions, 510Ks, IDEs, PMAs, HDs, de novo, you know it. Um, when I started, the submissions came to us in the form of paper. Um, I received physical files. Sometimes a submission was several pages long. Sometimes it was dozen, dozens of pages long. And sometimes it was many, many volumes. Um, and then when I needed to do research on predicates of files that were submitted back in the 1980s, um, those resources were on microfiche. Now, for some of us who don't know what microfiche is, that'll be another session later on. You can also Google it. But if you're an old timer like myself, back in the day, we actually dealt with paper. Um, but now as technology has evolved and we're able to do magical things such as this conference, um, we too at the FDA continue to evolve, evolve technology. And so this upcoming session is very important. Um, this is the next stage that the FDA and CDRH is taking in terms of advancing how you interact with us with um, the actual submissions and how they come in. So long are, uh, ago are the days of submitting things through paper uh, by, by using technology. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our next session for today and our presenter, Nels Anderson. Nels Anderson is a biomedical engineer and information technology product owner in CDRH's Office of Production, uh, Product Evaluation and Quality, that's OPEC. 
Nels is in the Office of Regulatory Programs, ORP, and in the Division of Regulatory Systems, Tools, and Data Management. Nels serves as the platform owner for the CDRH portal, what we're going to hear about right now, among various IT duties. Now, prior to this current role, Nels was a lead reviewer for cardiovascular devices for 13 years. So Nels brings a lot of experience to us um, and to today. And he's been with the FDA for a total of 20 years. Nels has a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Engineering from Tulane University. And so with that, I turn our program over to Nels on his topic, CDRH Portal Overview and Feature Walkthrough. Nels, take it away. Thanks, Elias. Howdy, everyone. I'm Nelson Anderson, and I'm the CDRH Portal platform owner. Today, I'm going to give an overview of the CDRH Portal and a walkthrough of some of its features. The medical device industry has been asking for a way to electronically submit to their applications to us, and we have heard of that and created the CDRH portal, which allows both electronic upload of submissions and tracking of some of those same submissions. So our objectives today are to describe the purpose of the CDRH portal, uh, to discuss what submissions can be uploaded through the portal, and to discuss which submissions can be tracked in the portal. So first of all, what is the CDRH portal? The CDRH portal, otherwise known as the Customer Collaboration Portal, is a secure website that allows the medical device industry to upload CDRH-led pre-market submissions directly to CDRH and allows them to track the progress of supported pre-market submissions. So first, we're going to talk about uploading files through the portal. We frequently get to the question, well, what can we upload through the CDRH portal? And the answer is pretty straightforward. Anything that is typically mailed to the CDRH Document Control Center, otherwise known as the DCC, can be uploaded through the portal. That makes it simple and straightforward. Also, our uploads are limited to a size of four gigabytes. Now, if you're concerned about whether that four gigabytes might be a constraint, please consider the current average size of an upload through the portal is right around 55 megabytes. And to date, the last roughly quarter of a million submissions that have come to CDRH, which is about 10 years worth, 99.9% .9 of those submissions have all been lower than four gigabytes. So this size restriction should not be a problem for most of our submitters. Nothing physical needs to be sent in for a file uploaded through the portal, which hopefully is, is fairly logical. Our e-copy guidance does currently specify that if you send a e-copy through the mail, you do have to print off a cover letter and sign that cover letter. But that only applies to the ones that are sent through the mail. Uh, if you upload an e-copy through the portal, you do not need to include the printed cover letter. However, speaking of cover letters, they are still very important for uploads through the portal. So unless it's an e-star format, which includes information in it, everything else should have a cover letter attached in PDF format somewhere in that that's, uh, upload. The cover letter is used by our DCC to determine the purpose of the submission and how it should be uh, processed. If they do not have a cover letter and the DCC is not clear on what that upload is, it could cause delays in the processing of that submission and it may not get to the reviewers or to whomever it's supposed to get to in an expedient manner. Uh, so providing a PDF formatted cover letter in your e-copy is very important for making sure your things occur uh, efficiently. And while there are no file name requirements for file uploads through the portal, logical file names are another thing that help our DCC identify the file and process it quickly. For example, if you name your submission K23 number, 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 AI response dot zip, as soon as the DCC sees this, they are going to know this is related to this specific 510K. It's an AI response, so I know it's going to be a supplement. So they, before they even open it and get to the cover letter, they know what to do with it, and that's just going to help them be more efficient. Now, this last point is really important. So some users presume that as soon as they upload something to the portal, it has been received by FDA. And we have certain uh, workflows, say, uh, 
additional information response to a 510k that have a response due date. And so potentially a user might say, hey, today is the response due date, but it's before midnight. As long as I upload my file before midnight, I have met the response due date. Well, that is not correct. So we have a cutoff time every business day for when any file that is received in the portal will be processed, and that is 1600 Eastern. For example, if you upload something at noon Eastern time on Friday, it will be processed on Friday. Uh, DCC will get it, they'll process it, it will be uh, officially received by CDRH on Friday. However, if you upload that same submission at 1800 Eastern, it has missed the 1600 Eastern cutoff point and will not be processed on Friday. It will be processed the next normal business day. Well, of course, the DCC does not work on weekends, so it will not be processed on Saturday. It will not be processed on Sunday. It will be processed on Monday, unless, of course, Monday is a federal holiday, and then it will be processed Tuesday morning. So potentially, by missing this cutoff date on a Friday, your submission may not be officially received by CDRH until Tuesday morning, Eastern time. So please keep this in mind when you are uploading. Don't wait to the last minute to upload something to us. Uh, do it ahead of time, do it the day before, then you don't have to worry about missing the cutoff time. It, for the most part, all submissions through the portal should be a single file. So you should be either uploading one single zip file for an e-copy or one single PDF for an e-star. Now there are some circumstances, uh, third-party e-star where you have the e-star and the third-party documentation, or potentially an e-star that also has statistical data or has a bunch of uh, proprietary images that have to be sent separately that can't be attached. So there are some times when you actually need to split it up. We have instructions in the portal on how to do that, and I'll show you that later. But for the most part, your submission should be one single file that you're uploading. You shouldn't be breaking it up into multiple pieces, just one zip file or one PDF. And this is a reminder that starting on October 1st of 2023, all 510Ks must be submitted in eStar format, and they should come through the portal as long, of course, as they are under four gigabytes. Now we're going to switch over to talking about tracking submissions. So currently in the CDRH portal, it supports the progress tracking of traditional, special, and abbreviated 510Ks, as well as all pre-submissions. There's only two types of pre-submissions, which is written feedback and meeting request. The tracking of a submission is initially only available to the official correspondent on record. And if you're wondering who the official correspondent is, there is a help article inside the portal that describes exactly how we determine who the official correspondent of record is. Uh, but initially, again, that submission can only be tracked by the official correspondent, but the official correspondent can share the progress tracking with other portal users. For example, if there is a consultant who is the official correspondent on a 510K, they can then share that tracking information of the 510K with the sponsor of the 510K, presuming, of course, that the sponsor has self-registered for a portal account. Next, we're going to talk about where you can get help or more information about the portal. So the primary place to find out more information about the portal is in the portal help system, which of course is inside the portal itself. Uh, it has answers to many of the common questions that we get, and it has a what's new section that includes instructions on how to use all of the newly added features, such as the progress tracking share with others that I mentioned. You don't need any sort of invitation to, you, to get a portal account. You can self-register for it. And to find the links to the portal or to the self-registration that I just mentioned, simply do a web search for FDA Send and Track. Generally, the very first search result will be our web page, and you can use the links right off of that web page. Now we're going to go ahead and take a look at the portal itself. So what you see here is the home screen of the portal. This is what you see when you log in. And the first thing I'm going to mention is the portal help, of course. Uh, portal help is the question mark down in the lower left hand part of the screen there. And that will give you a new tab, and as I mentioned previously, there are two sections, the common questions sections, which has answers to 
the most common questions, of course, and the what's new section that will tell you new features as they come out. It'll all give, also give you instructions on how to use those new features. Going back to the home screen, this top portion here is the progress tracking section of the CDRH portal, and it is going to list all of the 510Ks and or pre-subs for which you are the official correspondent or have been shared with you. And there's a little bit of information that is shown here just to give you a summary so you know what that submission is, its general progress, and the goal date, how many days are left um, just here from your dashboard. So you can see this 510K, which is listed, is on hold. It is a traditional 510K, and the goal date, which is June 20th of 2023, is the date by which I need to respond to CDRH because they ask me questions. Um, so it's saying, hey, your response due date is in 84 days. Um, so that's what I can get just off of looking at the simple bit of information. If I want the details, I can click on the 510K number here and that will move me to a details screen. So here we are in the detail screen, and up here in the left corner, we see that, again, this notes its traditional 510K and gives the 510K number. Below that, we have some general administrative information. We have the company name, the device name, and then we have where in the FDA that this is being reviewed, including the office, the division, the team, and the lead reviewer name. The lead reviewer name will also generally include their email address listed under it. In the top uh, status section, we have a quick status statement reviewing. We are reviewing this medical device, so that's just to let you know it's not on hold, it's under review. The progress bar gives you a general sense of how far through the review this submission is. And in this case, it's, this is just a day count. So a traditional 510K generally takes 90 days is the Medufa commitment. This is on day 28, so this bar is roughly one third full. Uh, it notes the FDA start date and it notes the FDA presumed Medufa decision date. So this is a predicted date uh, for the Medufa decision, which again should be by 90 days. So it's just predicting this should happen by 90 days. It's not a guarantee it will, it's just when it should happen. Next, we have a couple of statements up here at the top. The important one I want to mention here is all records are updated overnight. So the portal does not track in real time, it just gets nightly updates. So don't don't log into the portal multiple times a day trying to see if something has changed or to, if the status has somehow uh, been updated because it won't. It's only going to update once per night. Um, the, the other thing to mention about that is if you receive an email from CDRH with an official, uh, official recommendation, say, you know, we have sent you an SE on your 510K, that is not going to be reflected on the portal until the following day. So if you get the SE letter today and you go into the portal, it will not show the SA decision, but if you check the portal tomorrow, it will show the SE decision. Uh, then below that, we have milestones here. So this just gives you a sense of what has occurred with a submission from when we receive it to future predicted dates. So, you know, the substantive interaction is you know, in the future, we are predicting when that should occur. And the final decision, again, estimated this is a Medufa date in the future. Um, so we give some predictive dates in the future as well. Now we have service time here. This is generally the time that has uh, passed for the submission. In this case, it's pretty straightforward since it hasn't been on hold. It's been under review for 28 days and it has 62 days left to meet the 90 day Medufa commitment. And then the last section is just the official correspondence contact info. Now back to the home page of the portal. This next section is for the uploads or the sent submissions. And in this case, you see it says you haven't sent anything yet. So this particular user has not uploaded anything to CDRA. If something had been uploaded, you would see it listed on screen similar to this. So under the Your Sent Submissions, it's going to list the file name that was uploaded. It's going to list the format type, so whether it's an eCopy or eStar. And then it's going to list the date and time that it was sent to the FDA. So how do you send something using the portal? Well, you can either click on Send a Submission 
those words there. Or after you send something, that wording will disappear and you'll need to use the plus sign over here on the left hand side. Now clicking on either of those is going to open a new tab in the portal and that will be the upload workflow. So here we have our send a submission tab. And first you'll note that over on the right is an info panel. And this information panel gives you some extra information that might be relevant to your first time sending submission. So if you're not familiar with eStar, we have a link to the eStar homepage. And then the instructions I mentioned previously about sending an eStar and another file, say a statistical CDISC package, third party memo, some DICOM images, something like that. If you click on view more, that would give you the instructions on how to go about that. Those same instructions are also in the portal help articles as well. For eCopy, we have a link to the eCopy guidance in case you're not familiar with how to format something in the eCopy format. We have some additional resources such as FDA de device advice and some contact email addresses. So for general questions, you'd want to contact DICE. For submission specific questions, you'd contact OPEC submission support. And for anything related to the portal itself, ccp at fda.hhs.gov. Now, if you don't need this information panel, you can just click on the arrows up in the right hand corner and it will happily go away. Now, of course, if you want that information panel to come back because you need an email address or something, you can just click on the eye up there in the corner and the information panel will slide back out. So let's go ahead and talk about actually sending the submission. So first you're going to decide what format you're going to use, and that's going to be either an eStar or an eCopy. We're going to select eCopy today. So you can see here it says send your eCopy, so it knows that we're sending an eCopy. And I'll note, as mentioned earlier, this has the send a submission before 1600 ET. It has the cutoff message, so you'll see this on most of the screens just to remind you what that cutoff time is. Now. For the file selection, obviously, you have to upload your file. So you can drag and drop it directly here in this box, or you can browse for it. Clicking Browse will open the typical Windows Explorer window and then allow you to select some zip file. Now, it's not going to allow you to select other file types because, of course, this is an eCopy. It only allows zip files. Uh, once you select that, it's going to switch and start uploading. So here you can see we're on the upload process and it shows the progress as the upload continues. And the only option you have while you're uploading is to stop the upload. So say you realize, oh wait, you know, this is a compendium of all my pet cuttlefish photos, not my 510K, I should stop this upload. You have a way to stop the upload and then you can select a different file if you need to. Once the upload is complete, you'll see this confirmation screen and it shows you the file name that was uploaded and now you have a couple of different options here you can cancel the submission so if that you realize wait this is uh we need to change something in our 510k i don't want to upload at all right now canceling the submission allows you to close that tab you're done with uploading at that moment uh again if you realize wait i just uploaded my cuttlefish pictures uh i need to select the actual 510k you can select a different file but if everything looks good then you just click on send and that takes you to the sent to fda confirmation screen now you'll notice again as I mentioned it says sent to FDA not received by FDA and it gives you the date and timestamp and the file name that you uploaded it also gives you some general expectations of what should come next so as the uploader you'll get an email that notes the same information file name date and time of upload and then the official correspondent which may or may not be the same as the uploader will get another email from the document control center when this submission is processed uh, this is what the email looks like that the uploader would get again containing the file name and the date and time of the upload all right it's time for our first knowledge check so which of the following below submissions cannot be uploaded through the CDRH portal? Again, that's cannot be.
The answer is number three, small business certification requests. So uh, that is not a pre-market submission type that goes to the document control center, so it should not be sent through the portal. 510Ks, PMAs, and master file, files are all pre-market submissions and can all go to the DCC, so they can all go through the CDRH portal. Knowledge check number two, which of the following submission types can be tracked in the CDRH portal? In this case, it is pre-submissions. Uh, PMAs and IDEs cannot yet be tracked in the portal, although in the future they will be. Currently, it is 510Ks, uh, specifically specials, traditionals, and abbreviated, and pre-subs, meeting requests, and written feedback requests, which are the only two types of pre-subs. So in summary, the CDRH portal can be used to track the progress of 510Ks and pre-submissions, and any submission that is generally mailed to the CDRH Document Control Center can also be uploaded to them directly through the CDRH portal. Thank you. And now we have time for some questions. Thank you, Nels. Thank you for introducing us to this concept. This is great stuff. And certainly for our audience, as you become introduced to this um, you know, to um, topic, um, it may take time to get familiar and become equipped with learning how to navigate the C2H portal. So with that, let's get started with our questions. And we've gotten quite a few for you, Nels. Um, there was one sort of thing that was in a number of questions, so I, I would like to start with that one. And that is kind of very broadly, what can be uploaded through the C2H portal? Thanks, Elias. Um, so uh, again, the, we try not to list specific things, and I saw people are asking about, you know, PMA reports, annual reports, very specific things. The question to ask yourself is, do you normally send this to the Document Control Center, CDRH, that mailing address is listed all over the place in guidance documents? If if that is where you have normally been sending these submissions, the portal goes the exact same place. It is a much faster, much cheaper way to get your submission to the CDRH Document Control Center. But whether you send it through the portal or you send it by mail, it's all going the exact same place. Um, so again, you just ask that yourself the question, do I normally mail this or have I in the past mailed this to the CDRH Document Control Center? Most of our submission types, the guidance document tells you where you should be sending it. If that physical address is the CDRH Document Control Center, that can go through the portal. Thanks. Thank you, Nels. Um, so we have a question that says, um, so as you explained, 510Ks can be uploaded through the CDRH portal. The question here, and perhaps it's hinting ahead to our next track, um, what if the 510K is intended to be submitted to CBER, the Center for Biologics? Um, can that be submitted to the CDRH portal? Or instead, for CBER, should it be uploaded through the electronic submission gateway? Uh, so as, as the name of the portal suggests, being the CDRH portal, uh, you can only send things through the portal that are for CDRH. Um, if you send something, a CBER-related submission to us, you'll probably just get an email back that says we we don't do this. Um, so no, if it's not a CDRH submission, you should not send it through the portal because it's not going to get where it needs to go. Um, so again, it's just CDRH uh, submissions. Uh, I am not an expert in how CBER gets their submissions, uh, whether they use the um, ESG or something else or don't accept them. Uh, I am not sure, but uh, sending CBER documents to CDRH will not be a good solution for you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a few questions that inv clearly there's some individuals who've actually interacted already with the portal itself. So for this next question, it is it asks, can we change the password for our CDRH portal without having to wait for the password expiration prompt. Uh, this person goes on to say, I wasn't able to find that option anywhere. I believe you can change the password by at any point just by using the forgot password 
uh, mechanism. So on the initial sign-in page to the portal, underneath the user login and user password spaces, there's a little link that says need help. And if you click on need help, it expands to a couple of different options. One of those options is forgot password. Uh, even if you know your password, you can use the forgot password prompt uh, to elicit um, changing, you know, the process of changing that, uh, that, that works through Okta. Okta is the sign in mechanism we're using. Um, and I mentioned that because the emails, uh, around that come from no reply at Okta.com. So if you see an email from no reply, Okta.com, um, you know, it, it is likely if you're doing business with the portal at that time, it is, it is a portal email. So, you know, just because it doesn't say FDA on it immediately when you see it, don't be concerned. Anything that has to do with login um, comes from that, that no reply Okta, but that should be a way for you to, uh, uh, to change your password. Thank you, Nels. Um, so for our next question, is there a way to manually update the user information for the CCP? Uh, can the username or email be updated without the loss of tracking the submission to date? Not at this time. And the reason for that is um, the user account in the portal is the email address. So there is not a um, digital entity that is that account other than the email address. It is that email address. So if you change the email address, that is a different account to now. Um, so you, right now we can't do that. Uh, but you can potentially request if you, if the, the first and last name on it, you know, you get married, you want the last name changed. Um, you know, certainly we can do that, but there's, there's also nothing that prevents you from, you know, basically our suggestion is if you want to use a totally different email address, you can create a new account, a new portal account with that email address. Now, the downside of that is, as was suggested in the question, you lose the ability to track the old items. Every item um, that is tracked in the portal is tied to the official correspondence email address for our own records. You know, so say for 510K, the email address for the official correspondent as identified in that 510K, that is the person who can initially track it. Um, if you log in with another email address that you own, and, you know, initially you won't be able to track that device. Now you can use your other account to share the progress tracking of anything that's supported with yourself if you want to do that. So, um, if you really want to have multiple accounts or multiple emails and log in that way, you could share things with your other accounts to see them. But in general, the answer is no, you can't really update your account um, because it's it's tied to, the emails are tied to the account and it's tied back to our records as far as who is the official correspondent of the submission. Thank you for that response, Nil. All right, so for my next question, I'm going to group about three or four questions that are all asked the same thing. Which of these types of submissions, and I'll air quote that, are permittable to be submitted to, through the portal? So I'm going to read them all off, which, which any of these um, are eligible. Traditional PMAs, modular PMAs, PMA supplements, 30-day notices, unanticipated adverse device reports, UADs master files, compassionate use requests, and compassionate use correspondence, 522 reports. So for any of those things that I listed, um, if you can recall, which are permissible to be submitted to the CDRH portal? <laughs> wow, challenging my memory there. Um, so the, I believe the unanticipated device reports that, um, like adverse event type stuff is a different system. So I'm not sure on that one. Um, there's one other uh, PMAs, annual reports, IDEs, that's all fine. Master files, um, compassionate use requests, that's part of an IDE. So those, those are fine through the portal. Uh, that's, I can't remember everything you listed off. But again, you know, 
when looking at the guidances for these various items, it's going to tell you where to send them because, you know, the portal's new. So if it tells you to send them to the CDRH Document Control Center, send it through the portal. Um, if 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 you have a question after this, uh, again, the in the portal, there's the portal help. You can read that. Uh, and if you still really want to be sure, you can always email us at the CCP email address and we'll take a look at it and answer you. But um, typically, if it goes, again, goes to the DCC, you're fine sending it through the portal. Thank you, Nails. And yes, I threw a lot of topics at you and I think you covered them all. So thank you for that. Um, let's switch gears to a slightly different question. Um, what if I made a mistake and accidentally uploaded the wrong file? Uh, do I then need to send the correct file? Um, how would I alert the portal to ignore the original file that I sent in unintentionally? Um, so there's the the best way to, to do that is to just immediately email us at ccp at fda.hhs.gov and include the file name and timestamp information of what you just uploaded and let us know that you made a, an error and whether you are it just needs to be ignored or whether you are you know submitting a replacement for it. Uh, we don't have a button in the portal that says, oh, wait, I made a mistake. Don't, you know, don't take this because in our experience so far, most people don't immediately notice. A lot of times, you know, it can be a few minutes before people notice. We start processing these immediately. And um, and so a lot of times we, our, our systems have already begun to chew on these things before people even realize, wait, there's a mistake. Um, so the easiest way is just emails, let us know. We, we are, of course, are not dealing with any of these directly. We just communicate that information to the Document Control Center, and they're the ones who are doing all the processing of the, of the um, portal documents, just like they do all the processing of everything comes in through the mail, and they take a look at it, and they can you know, figure out which one, okay, I, we can just ignore this one, um, or we need to use the second version of this one. Uh, but you know, it's it's sort of like the mail. You send it, you don't get to pull it back. So please, you be careful with what you send us, and and please don't send us test submissions. Um, we that is not required, and it is uh, it just fills our DCC's inbox with stuff that they then they have to ignore. Uh, so there's no reason to send us a test submission because it's it doesn't help us at all. Um, and it, it causes problems for a document control center. You can you can go through the upload process if you want to just check it out, but just don't hit the send button. There's that point at which it says send to FDA. Stop at that point and close the tab, and it will have been uploaded to our system, um, but we will wipe it out after a couple of days, and and it won't be a problem. So if, if you really want to feel like you're using it, go to that point, just don't send it to us. Thank you, Nels. Um, we have a few questions, um, uh, more questions on the logistics. So let me try to bundle some of those as well. So here's our next one for you. Uh, I have a PMA submission that exceeds the data limit for the electronic submission portal. Uh, the reason that's stated here is that there are a large number of X-rays, CTs, and MRIs that need to be included in the submission. So this individual is asking, how can they submit such a large submission electronically? Uh, the unfor well, there's there's two answers to that. One is the electronically, as it is, answer is you can't. You have to mail it. Um, if it's over four gigs, it's not going to go through the portal. Uh, the other answer is a lot of the very large submissions that we've had issues with, regardless of whether we're talking you know portal, non-portal, just submissions we get that are multiple gigabytes don't really have to be that large. Uh, a lot of images do not need to be the resolution that they are. Uh, many DICOM images are a resolution that exceeds our computer monitor's ability to display. Uh, we get you know videos that might be in 4K resolution. We don't have 4K displays on our laptops. That's That resolution is lost on us. And it just makes your submission huge. So there's a lot of ways that you can optimize a very large submission so that you're still giving the information that you need to send to the FDA without having it absolutely massive and, and not 
uh, able to send it electronically. Thank you. Um, we're getting through a lot of the questions. Thank you for sending all those in. Let's switch gears back to more questions on the actual account itself. So for this next question, um, our stakeholder is asking, is the tracking my submission portal account created with every 510k submission? That is, is it user specific or application specific? Uh, accounts are specific to the email address. So if, uh, let's say, a new 510k comes in through the mail and it identifies an official correspondent, our system looks at that email address for the official correspondent and checks to see if they are a current portal user. If they are not a current portal user, they get an email that invites them to become a portal user. And it registers their address, uh, their email address and their name in our system and sends them that email from Okta that says, hey, you can complete your registration. Here's a link to do so. It expires in seven days. Um, and that will give that new official correspondent a way to come into the portal and to track that 510k. If you are a pre-existing portal user and the email address in a 510k, however it's received, matches that of a portal user, you being the official correspondent, it's just going to show up in your tracking. So it'll just pop up there because it's checking what is the email address for this 510k. And if it matches a current portal user, it automatically shows up in their tracking table because they are the official correspondent of that. Now, something we see quite frequently is uh, the same person will use different email addresses. So in one 510k, they use one email address. In another 510k, they use another email address, even though it's the same person. And then they can't track both of those submissions under the same profile in the portal because, again, it's tied to that email address. So if knowing this ahead of time, you generally it's to your benefit to use the same email address across all of your submissions um, if you want them trackable in the portal. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, you can have the separate portal accounts and you can share them with yourself. If you really want to, you can also contact uh, either the lead reviewer or OPEC submission support and ask them to update your email address as the official correspondent to you know, the email address you used for most of your 510Ks because you want it to show up there. Uh, so, so that's kind of the way to consolidate uh, what it says, um, you know, what you see into one spot. But again, the account is tied to the email address and the submissions are associated with an email address for the official correspondent by that email address. So it's not, it's not about the submission, it's about the official correspondent for that submission. Thank you, Nels. Um, we'll see if we can get to a few more questions as we wind down and perhaps a follow up to the comments you just made um, for this next question. Um, the person who had the code and access to the customer collaboration portal left the company. So this, in, this new individual is asking, how can I update the contacts and obtain access? Uh, so again, these portal accounts are personal accounts. They're not corporate accounts. Uh, in the, you know, in the terms of service, it talks about keeping your account credentials confidential. Uh, these are not to be shared. Uh, basically, sharing it with other people is against the terms of service. If something bad happens, you know, that's that's on you. Um, so, so these are not to be shared with other people, and they are not transferable. If somebody leaves the company. Uh, you, you are not going to be able to track those 510Ks unless you contact us and say, this person has left the company. We need the, um, the, the official correspondent changed for this 510K. And, and that's a regular thing that happens with 510Ks. The official correspondent changes. Um, we've had that mechanism in place for many, many years. You do it exactly the same way. You, you know, send in, you can send in an amendment that is a, a change of, a, you know, change of contact for a 510K, an active 510K, and we can update the official con, uh, contact for that 510K and then it'll show up in the portal. Now, uh, we don't update uh, closed out 510Ks, so something that's closed, uh, 
it's not you're you're not probably going to get anywhere if you ask us to update an official contact on that just because you want it to show up in the portal. Uh, the portal is for current activity. It's not meant to be a historical repository of everything that's ever happened. Um, so you know if you have a 510k that's six months old and that person left and you want that 510k email address updated so you can see it even though it was closed out with a final decision six months ago um, that's probably not going to happen because we're not we're not going to be updating official correspondence for something that is a final decision all right thank you and i think that is the last question for this session um, thank you for all those great questions nels thanks for all those responses and your presentation on this emerging topic now, let me turn it back to you for your final thoughts and your call to action for our audience today. Thanks again, Elias. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, really the key here is the portal is here for our industry users. Um, it is here to make your experience uh, with getting submissions to us much quicker and much easier. It's simple, it's straightforward. Um, hopefully you saw that through the presentation. You know, we, we don't have lengthy training materials uh, to take you through it. It's thousands of people have gone through it with no issues, just figuring out on the fly. It's, it's quite straightforward. Um, and, and it's really meant there to be an asset and a tool for you to both send us and track things. And again, we, we very much value your feedback and your questions, and especially thoughts about how we can make it better. Um, all of that is appreciated through our email address. And many things like the, uh, the functionality I've mentioned quite a few times, the share with others feature, which allows you know, one user to share the tracking of a submission with other users, in the portal, that is a direct response to our most requested feature from industry. Um, there's, there was a lot of interest in that, and so we created it. Um, so certainly, you know, if you have interest in other features, let us know. Uh, there's no guarantee it will happen or what time it, time frame it will happen in, but we keep track of all of them, and you know, they may be implemented in the future. All righty, Nels, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us for today. Um, this puts a wrap on, on our fifth topic. And as we now move on, we'll hit our sixth and final topic of part one of the device track. Again, this is the journey of getting a product to market. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Jason Brookbank, who will deliver our presentation on the Small Business Determination Program. Jason is the Assistant Division Director in the Division of Financial Management in CDRH's Office of Management. He's been in this role for the past nine years. In his capacity, he manages and oversees CDRH's financial accountability, including the Small Business Termination Program. Jason joined FDA over 16 years ago, first as a consumer safety officer with the then Office of Compliance, uh, and then he helped establish CDRH's emergency preparedness operations and medical countermeasures program. Now, prior to his time at FDA, Jason worked for a, a biomedical test equipment manufacturer and had, and had his own design and consulting company. Jason has a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Engineering from Wright State University and a graduate certificate in Biohazards, Threats Agents, and Emerging Disease from Georgetown University. It's my distinct pleasure to bring you Jason Brookbank on the topic, Reduced Medical Device User Fees, Small Business Determination, or SBD, program. Take it away, Jason. Thank you for the introduction, Elias. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to those of you joining today from around the world. I'm here to share with you about the Small Business Termination Program for the medical device user fees. To start us off today, if you're planning on making a medical device pre-market submission to the FDA, how would you like to save up to 75% on all of your submissions and possibly save over $400,000 on your first submission? Showing you here today are the Fiscal year 2023 Medufa fees. Note the standard fees and the small business fees for the different types of submissions are shown here in order of the fee. Also notice that most of the submissions have a 75% reduction for small businesses 
and wow, if your gross sales and receipts of your businesses and affiliates combined are less than $30 million, your first pre-market approval, product development protocol, pre-market report, or biological license application could have the entire fee waived. These are the first two lines highlighted in blue. Now that I have your attention, let's review the learning objectives for this session. Today, I'm going to describe the qualification requirements for being eligible for a small business termination, define critical concepts, I'm going to walk you through the submission process, I'm going to provide you with tips for avoiding common mistakes, and review common challenges with filing submissions and how to overcome them. SPD qualification requirements. First, gross receipts. Note this includes all of your affiliates. You have to have less than or equal to $100 million. That'll get you up to the 75% discount on all those fees as I showed you in the table. If you have less than or equal to $30 million and no prior pre-market approval, biological license approval, PDP and PMR, the fee is waived for your first submission. That's PMAs, modular PMAs, and those other document types received by the FDA from your business or any of your affiliates. So this condition applies to your primary company and your affiliates. I'll discuss, clarify what an affiliate is later in the presentation, so stay tuned. Note there are many limitations regarding this program. First off, there's no discount or waiver for registration fees. There are no refunds. So you must obtain your SPD before paying for submission. You're going to see a question on that later. Not transferable. So it's only the firm that submits it that receives the SPD. So the user fee system org ID number is used for the small business determination request and the subsequent pre-market submission. These both must be identical. Note, if your firm is changing their legal name, this is not considered a transfer. If you have a name change, please contact the reviewer who worked with you and they'll walk you through the process to get the name updated in the system. So timeline. First note, in this presentation, all days in our process here are referencing calendar days. So our timeline. Please submit at least 60 calendar days prior to your planned pre-market submission. It takes a little bit of time to work through all these. We get rather large volumes at times, so please be patient with us. Note, the SPD is good for the indicated fiscal year only. So for example, fiscal year 24, which is coming up, that window is from October 1st, 2023 through September 30th, 2024. Now we begin receiving submissions for these about two months earlier. So the doors are gonna open on August 1st, 2023 for the FY 24 submissions. We start pre-working on these. So you're not losing out on time. You only have to wait for the fiscal year to begin, then have 60 days. We start our work 60 days before the fiscal year begins. Take advantage of that. No nope, SPD determinations for FY24 won't issue till at least October 1st. So if you get in to us on that August 1st date, we can't send you your approval until October 1st. But we can resolve all any deficiencies you might have had prior to that time. So earlier you submit, the earlier we can get it done for you. So some critical concepts here I need you to understand. One requirement, this is the US government, so all of our documentation must be in English. You can have the submissions in the local language, but you will require an independently certified English translation. So what that means is you need someone from outside your own company certifying the integrity of that translation. Affiliate, please pay attention here. Affiliate is defined in section 737, part 12 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. An affiliate means a business entity that has a relationship with a second business entity, whether directly or indirectly. What does it mean? One business entity controls or has the power to control the other business entity, or a third party controls or has power to control both of the business entities. Essentially, if you can tell another company 
what to do or they're a subsidiary of you, those are examples of affiliates. You do need to declare all those on your submissions. Proof of income. So what do we use as our proof of income? What documents have, do you have to provide? So if you're a firm located in the United States, you need to provide your US tax return. If you're a foreign entity, you'll need to provide the National Taxing Authority seal on the 3602A forms. Please note that if you have affiliates, the same rule applies to your affiliates as well. This needs to be provided for your firm and each of your affiliates, as I mentioned. U.S. firms need to report their domestic and foreign affiliates. You can claim these affiliates through their U.S. tax returns via Schedule 851 for domestic affiliates, Form 5471 for foreign affiliates, or Form 8858 for disregard entities. And you will need to complete a page two of the 36OT to a form for each other foreign affiliate. Note you must include the gross receipts or sales of all of your affiliates as well as your own company when you prepare your form 3602 or 3602A. Gross receipts. This is the business's total sales from all sources without considering costs and expenses. So this is not gross profit. This is total sales. You don't deduct expenses. It doesn't consider intercompany transfers, refunds, or net income. This is just total sales. National tax authorities. So what's a national tax authority? The U.S. International Revenue Service is the national taxing authority for the United States. Other countries have a similar counterpart. When you submit your 3602As to your national tax authority, you need to make sure that they officially seal it by that NTA to confirm your values and provide that exchange rate to the U.S. dollars as of the date that fiscal year ended. As with any government process, we strongly recommend that you read the guidance and make use of our available training materials. These materials provide current instructions and information on how and where to submit and the current forms to use. So please take advantage of them as they will help you avoid deficiencies in your submissions. Always access and download the current forms from the FDA forms page. We do provide a link for that at the end of the resources section, at the end of this presentation. Do not use the first link you find when using search engines. Sometimes it can link to old or stale versions of the form. So always go to the FDA forms page. Once you have the forms, the next step you need to do is to either create an account in the user fee system, if your firm does not already have one, or verify the information in your account is correct. This is of critical importance as noting your organizational ID number from the user fee system is required and serves as the same unique identifier you'll need to include in your small business determination request and will be used for your subsequent pre-market submissions. Forms. You're gonna to need to use the proper form 3602 or 3602A. This depends on where you're, the firm requesting ownership of the SPD is located. If your firm is a US-based firm, so you submit your taxes to the IRS, you'll use Form 3602. If you are a foreign firm from outside the US, use Form 3602A. Note, if you are a foreign firm, but you submit a US tax return, you still use the Form 3602A, but you can omit, omit the NTA certification on page two because you're submitting your US tax return. At that point, once you have the proper forms, you need to complete the forms. So first off, make sure your contact information is accurate. This is important because due to security purposes, we will only interact with the individual named on the SPD submission. Additional individuals listed on the cover sheet that you provide to us, we can also speak with. Those included by 
the original submitter and additional follow-up communications, we'll be able to speak with those individuals. Anyone else calls us from your firm, we'll simply say we can't confirm that there is an SPD submission and you need to talk with the contact in your firm that is managing the user fee system account. We treat these as corporate confidential information, so our ability to disclose stuff to others is tightly restricted and we control that. We do have some great CDRH Learn modules out there. Links are provided here and in the references at the end. Give them a try. They walk you through step by step and provide nuanced details on each of the fields in the forms. It's a great tool. Highly recommend giving it a try. So one forms, you'll receive an acknowledgement letter. This is sent by email, so check your spam and junk filters. You'll receive this nominally within 10 business days. The reason it takes this a little bit is physical mail coming in to the FDA, goes through screening processes, it's processed before our team can even get to it, so there's a little bit of delay there. If you haven't received it within 10 business days, please reach out to us to confirm. Um, note, even though it takes us a couple days to get to it, the acknowledgement layer will still identify the date the application arrived at the FDA. So that's when we start our 60-day review target clock. So even though it took you a little bit to get it, it's still counting on our clock. So you're not losing place or time in our processing. Next form of communication you'll get from us is related to deficiencies. So at that point, you'll need to respond to any deficiencies. Deficiencies are sent via email from the SPD reviewer. They're going to identify the required updates you'll need to make. They'll identify any additional requested documentation. And note, most deficiencies are resolvable in less than 30 days. These range from typos to missing blanks and simple things that can be resolved very quickly. The letter will also identify how you're to respond. Many of our interactions are now completely electronic, though you may still be required to physically mail some of the items to us. If everything goes well, you'll end up receiving your final determination. This decision layer, once again, is sent via email from the SPD reviewer. Check your spam filters. It has instructions and next steps. So at that point, once it's logged in, you can go ahead and pay your medical device user fee using your SPD approval number. Then you can submit your pre-market medical device package with the cover sheet to FDA for review. So next, avoiding common mistakes. We're all human, things happen. So I'm gonna start off again. Review that guidance. It provides information instructions on how to develop and submit the SPD certification requests. Some, some common errors, using the wrong version of the form and wrong mailing address. So on the forms, remember to go to FDA forms website for the current version and don't automatically send to the same address you used last year. We may have changed it. This will change likely again in the future, so keep an eye out for it. We do communicate address changes up in the guidance. Another detail here, use the Adobe PDF reader. The SPD forms are fillable PDF form templates. You're gonna to need to download this file and save it to your computer on the desktop or elsewhere. And make sure you open edit in the standalone Adobe PDF reader. Do not open and edit in your web browser. The browsers and plugins currently do not reliably support editing of PDF forms at this time. So once again, please download and use the free Adobe Acrobat Reader. So missing incorrect information. It sounds simple, but this is actually a common deficiency. You have people forgetting to sign their tax returns, similar issues here. So fill in all those blanks. Common omissions. Missing the fiscal year you're submitting for for the wrong fiscal year. Missing or incorrect org ID. Double check that number and sequence, make sure it's correct. Missing the country, not listing all the affiliates and not summing all the gross receipts on line 17 in the 3602 or line seven in the 3602A form. Accurate and consistent information. Some blanks in the forms must be identical. So you have to use the same name for for your firm in all places as appropriate. And the final signature 
must be that of the individual named in line four of the forms. Occasionally we'll have one name listed there and someone else is saying it needs to be the same person listed. National Taxing Authority Certification, Form 36028. This must be completed by the NTA or their legally delegated representative. There are a few countries out there where they have empowered regional corporations to serve on behalf or as a proxy for tax collection purposes. They are able to complete this form for you. It's not just any accountant service. Accountants can't certify this. It has to be the NTA themselves or their legally delegated representative. Common challenges. So this is one, unfortunately, we run into on occasion. Your business has recently incorporated. Right now, as current policy stands, all businesses must file a tax return. If you haven't filed taxes with the IRS or your National Taxing Authority, the business will not qualify as a small business. We don't have that proof of gross receipts that's required by the law at this time. You may qualify after filing your annual tax return. So we can't help you yet, but as soon as that gets filed, we can help you. Note, some firms elect to make an early annual tax return for, say, a fiscal period of less than 365 days for their first fiscal year. We require that tax return in order to process an SPD. If you haven't filed yet, we need to wait until you have filed with us. I filed with the IRS. Another thing that does happen on occasion, the National Tax Authority refuses to complete the 3602A form. We got you covered though. If you, the NTA refuses, there's a little uh, extra paperwork required here. Your business must provide all of the following. A sworn affidavit and statement, translated in English and notarized, that tests that someone from the firm directly interacted with the National Taxing Authority. We need an explanation as to why Section 3 of the form, uh, 3602A, was not certified. Confirmation of signature of the person who dealt or interacted with the NTA representative, and a copy of the tax return documentation submitted to the NTA. Remember, all that information must be provided or translated into English. Some NTAs will not fill out the U.S. forms. Uh, it's a common policy. Governments won't fill out other governments' forms. We got a way around that. But those NTAs may provide alternate documentation that meets the needs. Email, letter, or something else confirming gross receipts. Essentially, they're providing information on their own documentation. You can send us as well as your most recent tax term. And now that you have all that, it's time for the pop quiz. So our first dollars check. In how many days does the FDA try to review an SBD application? A, 30 days. B, 60 days. C, 90 days. D, one year. You said 60 days, that is correct. We do our best to review these within 60 days. Next question. What is the maximum gross receipt threshold for approval as a medical device small business? A, 1 million. B, 30 million. C, 50 million. D, 100 million. The answer is D, 100 million. But if you happen to say B, 30 million, that is one of our thresholds, and that's where you can potentially qualify for the free first mission. But for all the discounts, if you have less than $100 million in gross receipts between you and your affiliates, you can qualify there. Next question. What is the first thing to do before filling out a request for small business determination? A, read the current SBD guidance. B. Pay for my pre-market submission cover sheet. Correct answer is A. Read the current SPD guidance. We have a wealth of information out there. Always please start with that guidance because that will be our current advice and directions for you. Next question. You must pay for your Medufa user fee, then get your SPD re rebate. A. True. 
be false? This answer is false. Remember, get your SBD number first before you pay for that cover sheet. If you pay for it before you get your SBD number, there are no refunds. So once again, get your small business determination first, then submit. Okay. Final knowledge check for you. There are SBD reduced fees for registration listing. A, true, B, false, C, it depends. The correct answer here is B, false. There are currently no reduced fees or fee waivers for registration listing fees. Next three slides, we provide for your convenience these quick references and additional resources. So here we have our user fee saying notification. That's refreshed every year, so check on the current one. It's gonna tell you what the different fees are. Note, we don't have to wait for that notification to go out before you can submit, so we look forward to seeing your 24 submissions in August, or if you're planning on submitting for 23, our doors are open, ready for business. Uh, we have sections MD37, part 12, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, that provides all the key definitions you're seeing here today. Uh, the link to our forms page for FDA forms. Always go there, regardless of the form you're looking for, including the SPDs, that's where the current forms will be. We have links here to those two awesome CDRH Learn modules. So please go out, give them a try, and they'll give you a great walkthrough on how to complete those forms. Finally, we have some device advice out on the website and additional medical device guidance for qualification certification materials out there. So in summary, I've described the qualification requirements. I've defined all the critical concepts for you, walked you through the submission process so you're familiar with it, provide you some tips for avoiding common mistakes, and reviewed a number of the common challenges and how to overcome them. Do want to thank you all for joining me for this presentation. Now let's take some of your questions. All righty, thank you, Jason. Thank you for your presentation. And let's roll with our questions on this really exciting topic. Um, we definitely got a lot of questions about the small business termination program and process. So let's start with our first one here for you, Jason. How can I get confirmation that FDA received my small business certification request? It's a great question commonly asked. So the best way is check your email. It does take a few days between when the package that you've submitted to FDA physically arrives, goes through our scanning and processing, and during our heavy surge seasons, we might be slightly behind in sending those acknowledgement letters. So give us a few days, and those acknowledgement letters are sent via email to the correspondent identified in the application. If you haven't heard from us in about 10 business days, please give us a call. But in the meantime, check your spam folders, check your junk mail folders, and worst case, give us a call after about two weeks if you haven't heard from us. It's usually there and in processing. Note our busy season tends to be from September through January, so we'll be running a lot longer on that 60 days of our review target time. But we'll get that to you. And as I mentioned in the presentation, don't worry about the actual day it arrived. We protect that date. Even if it takes us two weeks to get that acknowledgement layer to you, we're still respecting that original date it arrived. All right, Jason, thank you. All right, um, we definitely got a lot of questions about logistics and timing. So here's another one that's specific to um, our topic here. Uh, does a business need to be registered and have their devices listed? Um, prior to obtaining a Medufa small business certification? That's a great question. And the answer there is not all. The small business determination program is frequently the first time a firm will ever interact with CDRH. So you're not required to be registered and listed. You're not required to have a product on the market. 
reach out to us when you're thinking about bringing a product to market. That's the time to request your small business determination. That's before you submit for those cover sheets. That's before you submit your packages through the electronic gateway and other mechanisms for the pre-market review. Reach out to us early in your process when you're being to think about submitting during a fiscal year. Get your small business to it, submission to us. We'll get that process so you can qualify for those fee waivers. Thank you, Jason. Um, our next question, kind of related to what you just said. Um, so there is a, uh, currently there is uh, no small business reduced fee for the establishment registration program. Um, this person does not plan to submit a marketing application, and I'm going to qualify that um, during this current fiscal year. So the question is, is there an advantage to submitting a small business certification request in that scenario? That's a good one, Elias. And if you're not planning on submitting a pre-market submission during currently FY23, and there is no uh, reduced fees for registration, uh, save yourself some time and effort. And there's no nest, there's no need to submit now. But if you know you're going to be submitting for pre-market application in FY24, we look forward to seeing your application as early as August 1st coming up. And to provide that clarification, currently there are no fee waivers for registration listing fees. All right, Jason, thank you. Now, in the spirit of ready being a trifecta tr track with, um, you know, representation from CDR8, CBER, and CEDAR, uh, we've got our next question. Uh, I'm a company with multiple products that are reviewed by these three different centers. Um, can I get a small business designation and CDRH and then obtain a small business designation at CEDAR and at CBER? That's a great one. Regrettably, we don't have a single submission that lets you qualify for multiple user fee discounts. So if you're a company that's fortunate enough to be submitting devices, biologics, and drug applications, I encourage you to submit to the CDRH's SPD program and to CEDAR's small business termination program, both. They have slightly different criteria and different packages, but submitting to those different programs will qualify you for as many discounts as possible. Next one there, Elias. All right, Jason, thank you. So for our next question, um, if I obtain a small business de designation for a 513G, am I able to apply the discount to another filing such as a 510K or a de novo? That's a great one. The only thing that is the first time free is for that pre-market application. That's for the firms that have never submitted those and have less than $30 million in gross receipts. Those percent discounts, those apply for any and all submissions you make in that year. So <clears throat> single SPD determination is good for one 510K. It's good for 10 510Ks. You receive the discount rate on all of your submissions done in that year. And that's on the fiscal year, remember, not the calendar year. But yeah, once you qualify for the discount, it applies to all remaining submissions you're doing for the rest of that fiscal year. Thank you, Jason. And speaking of that, um, if I'm someone who obtained uh, the small business determination status for a prior fiscal year, um, do you have a process where I can update my, my prior application or do I need to submit a new application for this next fiscal year? Currently, you do need to resubmit for each fiscal year you wish, you wish to qualify for. So if you've submitted in FY22 and you're planning on making submissions in FY23 here, you would need to resubmit for FY23. If you've submitted in FY23, you want an FY24 discount as well, you'll need to resubmit for FY24. You could reuse a lot of what you've already typed into the forms, but we'll need the current tax returns to support the evidence of gross receipts for that fiscal year of consideration. 
And that's the bit largest part that needs updating each year. All right, thank you. Um, here's a question that's sort of related to the last topic that Nels delivered for us. Do we have to physically mail the Madufa small business request documents to you? The current procedures and rules do require physical artifacts being mailed to us. We can handle some interactions via email once we've received the initial submission, but for any sort of final documents, we will need those to be physically sent. We are working on moving towards electronic submission. Hopefully I'll have updates for you at the next ready conference. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. And I love that you're planning ahead. Awesome. Um, we have a couple of questions here I'll hit. Um, they were kind of related to um, the entities and affiliates that are part of what gets counted. Um, let's start with this simpler question here. Um, do investors or companies providing grants count as affiliates? To that one, I'm going to have to say it depends. So it depends on the terms and conditions of the cash and investments. If it's standard investments like shareholders and such, typically not. If it's grants that are just in the form of cash being invested for capital operations and research, typically not. But if it's a firm that retains or is engaged in financial control, so like a parent-child subsidiary or wholly owned subsidiaries, then those would fall in the definition of affiliates for us. So what I'd encourage you to do is if you have one of those situations, reach out to us and give us a call. We'll gladly work through it with you to help you figure out how those get characterized. All righty, thank you. And you actually uh, are segueing into our next question that's sort of related. What if you are a subsidiary of a larger organization and it looks here in this question, the subsidiary is intending to be the one to submit the small business request. Um, does the parent company's sales impact the eligibility of that subsidiary um, for the small business certification? That's a great one. And in that case, it does. So if it's a subsidiary or wholly owned subsidiary of a parent company, it's part in, of that entire corporate web and chain and shares that gross receipts. So we've had situations before where we've had a entity that's a small business, then proceeds to get acquired by a larger company. The dollars that used for the gross receipts after that acquisition is both that original small firm and the entire network of that parent entity that has just absorbed them. So recommendation is, Qualify for your small business discount before being acquired because that might trigger gross receipt changes. All right, thank you for that advice. Um, we have time for just a few more questions. Let's see how many more we can get to. So here's our next one for you. Um, this individual previously submitted a 510K and used the SBD reduced fee. So kudos to you, you went through the process. Um, this question now continues. Um, unfortunately, the 510K was not accepted. So now the stakeholder is asking, can I still use the SPD review, uh, reduced fee for my second filing or subsequent filing of the 510K? I need to know a little more details on that one, such as if it was refused to accept, but if we're talking they paid the normal reduced 75% discount rate they qualify for that 75% discount rate for all future submissions. If it was something that was refused to accept and it's essentially was refunded back, we refused to accept the submission, we refused to accept the payment for the submission, um, talk with the user fee help desk and or OPEC about having those resources either refunded or moved towards that next submission. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we'll try to wrap up with a couple of final questions for you. Um, let's go to this next one. Um, so I'm an international company. Uh, my national taxing authority won't provide the certification on section three of form FDA 3602A. So they're asking, what should I do? 
in that case, if your national taxing authority is refusing to certify, we have an affidavit process. So this is where you're going to need to run through some extra steps here and we can provide the full details offline on that one. But in short, document who you spoke with the at the National Taxing Authority, when, what did they state regarding that? If they can email you back saying, we refuse to fill out forms for the US government. Okay, remember our main thing here is to confirm the gross receipts values that were submitted to the National Taxing Authority. So sometimes the NTA will say, we can't fill out your forms, but we can confirm that the gross receipts submitted was X. That will be part of that package you'll submit to us kind of as that variance of the process. Um, that's it in a very quick nutshell. If you have that situation emerge, reach out to us. We'll help you guide you through that process. It's not too painful, but it is a bit more legwork to do. Thank you, Jason. And with that, that is the last question for your session and the last question for part one. Um, so Jason, let me turn it back to you for your final thoughts and words of wisdom for our audience on the Small Business Termination Program. Thank you, Elias. So my best advice to all of you out there who are listening, take advantage of this program. It's awesome. Start by reading the current guidance. That does get updated. It's necessary. That current guidance is your gateway to all this. Take advantage of the training materials. We have some great materials there in the references. Click on them, follow the links. Some of those that were published online walk you step through step on how to fill out those forms. Remember, fill out all the required information. Plan for up to 60 day review time. So get your patches into us as early as you can. And remember, Obtain your small business determination before paying for a cover sheet for a pre-market submission. Once you pay for that cover sheet, there are no refunds. So we need to get your small business determination in there and logged in the user fee system before you pay in order to qualify for that discount. But Matt, we look forward to talking with you. And if you have questions, our doors are open. Please reach out. And thank you all for attending. Back to you, Elias. <laughs> All right, Jason, thank you so much. What great information. Um, and thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, this will now conclude part one of the device track. Um, we are going to take a 20 minute break and um, it'll be my pleasure to hand the reins over to our team to continue with part two. So uh, we will resume at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, enjoy the break and we'll see you in a few. Thank you.
All right, everyone, welcome back. It's my pleasure now to turn the, the program over to the trusted, gifted hands of my dear colleague, Joseph Tartle. Joe's the deputy director of our division of industry and consumer education. And among his many important roles, Joe leads our daily operations and answering questions from you by phone and email. You could say that Joe is the chief operating officer of our division. Joe partners with Tanya Wilbon, who you'll hear from later today, to lead the medical device post-market education strategy. Joe has been with FDA since 2006 and has spent his entire career right here with us at DICE. But prior to his FDA career, Joe worked for small device manufacturers in preparing pre-market submissions and implementing quality systems. So Joe has practiced what he preaches and teaches. Joe has a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Slippery Rock University, and a fun trivia fact that I always love to share. He is the only member of CDRH to have attended in all 12 years of our Ready Annual Conference. So with that, please have a wonderful session, everyone. Enjoy part two of the device track, and let's welcome Joe. Joe, take it away. Thank you, Elias. And welcome everyone to part two of the medical devices track for Ready. Earlier today, we talked about bringing medical devices to the market, and now we'll talk about those devices that are on the market. For the rest of today, we will hear presentations and discuss activities that relate to quality systems and quality. And who doesn't like quality systems? Everyone loves them. However, before we can get to that, we need to talk about a few learning objectives. I do have a few housekeeping items to mention. Then we'll look at our agenda for this afternoon and meet our speakers. And last, note the call to action. So housekeeping, please complete your evaluations for both the speakers and final evaluations as these are important activities as they help us to learn more about your expectations and needs. We also use this information to approve the program and to plan for next year's program. So please complete this information. Continuing education. Again, for those seeking to earn continuing education credits, quick reminder, the full five-day conference offers a total of 32.25 continuing education or CE credits. CEs are available for attendees who registered for the conference and self-identified themselves as healthcare professionals, such as physicians, nurses, and pharmacists during registration. You need to attend through the Adobe Connect platform. You earn your CEs for each day that you attend. Unfortunately, CEs are not provided if you're watching on the YouTube link or if you view the program after the conference ends. The planning committee, speakers, and CE consultation and accreditation team have nothing to disclose for today's program participants. And I know there's a lot of information as it relates to the CEs. To simplify things, claim codes and survey links will be emailed at the end of each day to everyone who has officially registered and attended through Adobe Connect on that particular day. So if you attend each day, you'll receive an email on each evening from Monday through Friday. And then next, recordings. Recordings will be posted to CEDAR SBIA within five to seven business days. I did notice this morning that day one and day two program recordings are already available on YouTube. Feel free to share any of these recordings with your colleagues who could not attend this important conference. So the agenda for today. We have two presentations for this afternoon relating to quality systems and quality. Please be aware we will only discuss these items as they relate to the current quality system regulation 21 CFR Code of Federal Regulation 820 and the ISO QMS standard ISO 1345 2016 as a voluntary consensus standard. We will not discuss or answer questions on the proposed QMSR rule. So first up with regards to our presentations, managing medical device non-conforming product with quality. Our first presentation from Ruth Bidiaco will be on managing medical device non-conforming product with quality. 
Manufacturers are required to establish and maintain procedures to control product that does not conform to specified requirements. But what do you do when you have non-conformances? Do you continue to market non-conforming products? Rework non-conforming products before marketing? Or do you dispose of the non-conforming products? This presentation will answer these questions and compare the requirements of the Quality System Regulation 21 CFR 820.90 and ISO 1345-2016. And then to close out today, we will hear a presentation on handling medical device complaint files with quality by Tanya Wilbon. Manufacturers required to maintain complaint files and procedures for handling medical device complaints. These procedures can vary a great deal depending on factors including risk, the size of the company, and the complexity of the device. This presentation will provide the regulatory requirements for medical device complaint files. It will also provide key components of complaint files, common pitfalls and challenges associated with managing complaint files, and review strategies for addressing all of them. Both of these will be great topics to wrap out to today, as well as start off the post-market track, um, the part two track of the medical device portion of Ready. And I will be your moderator. And I did wanna send out a quick thank you to Tanya Wilbon, who has performed triple duty for this program as your part two track director, as a presenter herself, and as an online moderator who will be helping to facilitate your live questions. Before we get started, quick reminder with regards to FDA organizational acronyms. As was noted earlier, FDA has many organizational acronyms, and it can sometimes be hard to keep track of who is who when listening to presentations. You have heard or will get to hear from all the offices on this slide. As you strive for a cross-functional approach to bringing and keeping your device on the market, we at, at FDA also strive in using a cross-functional approach in the education that we provide you. Staying informed, we make that education as accessible as possible. During the breaks, you may have noticed these great resources being promoted. Please, please use them. CDRH Learn is a multimedia industry education resource with over 250 modules in different formats available to you that cover a wide variety of regulatory topics. Device Advice is a text-based educational resource that walks you through the device total product life cycle and has over 300 pages of comprehensive regulatory information. Both of these can be accessed 24 hours a day seven days a week online from your laptop, from your tablet, or even your smartphone. Again, please use these very valuable educational resources. And last, your call to action. As earlier, enjoy the program. Please interact and learn. As Elias noted, I also am in the same place where I've learned stuff today I didn't know previously, and I'm sure I will continue to learn throughout this afternoon and tomorrow. Also, ask us your questions. This is your program. We want to hear from you and help understand what it is that you need, as well as answer those questions that you need to answer. Take advantage of the FDA resources being provided. And then at the end, give us your feedback on what you need. Okay? We want to hear from you. So with that, our first presentation on the Second track of medical devices is on me managing medical device non-conforming product and quality. And this will be done by Ruth Bidiaco. Ruth is a consumer safety officer in the post-market and consumer branch, the Division of Industry and Consumer Education at DICE. Ruth has been with FDA since 2015. Before joining DICE in 2019, she was an export certificate reviewer for medical devices. And prior to that, she was a regulatory health project manager in FDA's Center for Tobacco Products. Ruth has a bachelor's of science degree from Pennsylvania State University. Please give Ruth a warm welcome.
Thank you, Joe. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. You may be wondering, why is there a plush toy in the medical device presentation? I will tell you what this toy has in common with a non-conforming product. I purchased this toy for my niece, and when I took it out of the box, I heard the sound of something small fall back into the box. The toy has lavender seeds in it to help keep its shape when sitting up. So I examined the toy and found a small tear on the left leg where the seeds were coming out of. My first thought was, how did this get packaged and shipped out without anyone in the company noticing that it was defective? If it were given to a child unnoticed, the seeds would come out and the child would probably eat the seeds since that is what children do. Now, let's imagine this toy to be a medical device. What would happen if a customer purchased a device and received a defective product and the product caused an adverse event? How do you make sure your medical devices conform to the specification and regulatory requirements? How do you go about managing non-conformances? Hopefully, by the end of this presentation, you have a good understanding of how to manage non-conforming products with quality. During this presentation, I will provide a short background on non-conforming products. I will review some key definitions and identify requirements for non-conforming products within the quality system regulation and compare it to the ISO 13485-2016 standard. I will end by discussing some strategies for managing or controlling non-conforming products. I will begin by reviewing some background information on non-conforming products. A non-conforming product is any medical device that does not meet the quality, safety, and effectiveness requirements of the regulation. Non-conforming product was cited 104 times on Form FDA 483, which is the list of inspectional observations in fiscal year 2022. It can occur at any stage of the production process, from design to delivery, and can pose significant risks to users and result in issues such as product recalls or customer complaints. Non-conforming products are due to many causes and may result from design flaws, manufacturing defects, or labeling errors. Your procedures for handling non-conforming products may be reviewed during FDA's inspections and as well as MDSAP audits. Let's go over some key definitions. 21 CFR 820.3Q defines non-conformity as the non-fulfillment of a specified requirement. Non-conformity is a crucial concept that must be addressed when manufacturing medical devices. ISO 9015 Clause 3.6.9 also defines non-conformity as the non-fulfillment of a requirement. You should, you should remember that non-conformity can occur at any stage of the production process, from design to delivery, and can result in issues such as product recalls or customer complaints if not handled appropriately. To ensure compliance with the regulation, organizations must have a robust system in place to detect, document, and address non-conformities. There is a slight difference in FDA's definition of product from that of ISO 13485-2016. Per 21 CFR 820.3R, a product is a component, manufacturing material, in-process device, finished device, and return device. ISO 13485-2016 Clause 3.15 defines product as a result of a process which includes service, software, hardware, 
and processed materials. As you can see, the definition contained in the quality system regulation does not include service. Some examples of non-conforming products include components or materials that fail receiving acceptance activities or incoming inspection, products stored at the warehouse that have been exposed to heat, moisture, or other environmental factors that can affect their performance, and products that fail in process acceptance activities, such as these medical gloves that did not pass leak test. Let's move on to discuss what the requirements are for non-conforming products. The requirements for controlling non-conforming products in the quality system regulation are codified in 21 CFR 820.90 A and B. There are similar requirements in the ISO 13485 2016 standard in clause 8.3.1, 8.3.2, and 8.3.4. Currently, to market products in the U.S., you have to comply with the regulatory requirements for controlling non-conforming products in 21 CFR 820.90. The regulation in 21 CFR 820.90A requires manufacturers of medical devices to establish and maintain procedures to identify and control non-conforming products. It also requires that you document procedures for the identification, documentation, evaluation, segregation, and disposition of non-conforming products. This helps to ensure non-conforming product is not distributed or used. The regulation requires that the manufacturer evaluate and determine the need for an investigation when there is non-conformance. Meaning, if you notice that there is a non-conformance, you are required to evaluate it and decide whether an investigation is necessary. The regulation also requires you to notify persons or organizations responsible for the non-conformance and to document the evaluation and any investigation performed or the justification for not conducting an investigation. The requirements in ISO 13485-2016 Clause 8.3.1 are similar to the requirements in 21 CFR 820.90A. In Clause 8.3.1, the standard requires the organization to ensure non-conforming product is identified and controlled. It also requires to have a procedure in place for the identification, documentation, segregation, evaluation and disposition of non-conforming products and persons responsible for each step. The standard also requires you to determine if an investigation is needed and to notify external parties responsible for the non-conformance. This is slightly different from the requirements of the regulation. The regulation requires you to notify the person or organization responsible for the non-conformance. An example would be in a case where you may have received components from a supplier or a contract manufacturer and the components do not pass receiving income and inspection. Here, the organization would notify the supplier or contract manufacturer. The standard also requires that you record and maintain the nature of the non-conformity and any action taken including the evaluation and any investigation, and to document the rationale for the decisions made. Let's do a quick knowledge check. Which of the following is a non-conforming product? One, product that does not meet applicable quality requirements. Two, received components that does not conform to the order submitted. Three, labeling 
without required warning on natural rubber medical gloves. And four, all of the above. I hope you all selected four, all of the above, because all these do not meet specification and as a result, they are all non-conforming products. Let's continue and review the rest of the regulation and standard. 21 CFR 820.90 B1 states that manufacturers are responsible for establishing and maintaining procedures that define who is responsible for reviewing non-conforming products and who has the authority for the disposition of it. These procedures should clearly, should clearly set out the review and disposition process so that those involved understand what must be done. Manufacturers should also document the review and disposition of non-conforming products, including the justification for its use and signatures of the individual authorizing the use. In ISO 13485-2016 Clause 8.3.2, it requires organizations to have a plan in place for dealing with non-conforming products and provide three ways of doing so. By taking action to eliminate the detected non-conformity, by taking action to preclude its original intended use or application, and by authorizing its use, release or acceptance under concession. The regulation does not specify such details. If non-conforming product is accepted under concession, a justification should be provided, approval should be obtained, and applicable regulatory requirements should be met. The standard also requires that the identity and signature of the person authorizing the concession be recorded and maintained. This requirement is similar to the regulation. 21 CFR 820.90 B2 requires manufacturers to establish and maintain procedures for rework to include retesting and re-evaluation of non-conforming products to ensure that the product meets current approved specifications. Rework and re-evaluation activities, including any determination of adverse effects on the product, must be documented in the device history record, or DHR. The FDA's response to comment 157 of the preamble further clarifies that Due to the potential harmful effects rework could have on the product, a determination of any adverse effect of the rework upon the product is required, even if it is repeated rework or not. The standard in ISO 13485-2016 Clause 8.3.4 requires organizations to establish and maintain procedures for rework that consider potential adverse effects. These procedures must undergo the same review and approval process as the original procedure to ensure consistency and effectiveness. These specific requirements are not included in the quality system regulation. After rework, the product must be verified to ensure that it meets the applicable acceptance criteria and regulatory requirements. It also requires records of rework to be maintained. It's important to manage non-conforming products to ensure that product is not used or distributed, and there are several strategies to do so. You can identify non-conforming products electronically, such as with the use of a barcode system, or manually such as with the use of color-coded tags, such as the orange tag depicted in this picture. Make sure to notify responsible parties of the non-conformance. Based on your procedure, evaluate to determine if an investigation is needed. In this picture, there are multiple non-conforming medical gloves that did not pass the leak test during in-process acceptance activities. An evaluation determined that 
This was the second batch of gloves that did not pass the leak test, and an, an investigation was already in progress. Since an investigation was already being conducted for the same or similar non-conformance, an investigation for this non-conforming product was not required. Not every non-conforming product needs an investigation. Make sure you document justification for not conducting an investigation and notify the responsible parties. This is clarified by FDA's response to comment number 155 of the preamble. You can segregate or separate the non-conforming product to ensure it is not inadvertently used. Since you identified it by tagging, you can further separate by placing in a designated bin as depicted in this picture or as specified in your procedure. Remember to monitor the amount segregated to ensure you continuously control all non-conforming products while conducting your investigation when required. Make sure you document all the results and outcome of the investigation. Documentation of results should be according to your procedures. Make sure you decide on the disposition of the non-conforming product. Examples of disposition of non-conforming product includes use as is, accept with rework, reject or scrap, or return to supplier. If you decide to rework, be sure to determine any adverse effects from the rework and document all activities and outcome. This will require retesting and re-evaluating the product as specified in your procedure. Make sure you have qualified persons reviewing and authorizing the disposition of the non-conforming product. Let's take another moment to check our knowledge on what we have reviewed. True or false? Non-conforming product should always be investigated. I am sure everyone selected false. Remember, after evaluating the non-conforming products, you may already have a pending investigation for the same non-conformance and would not need a new investigation. So you investigate when necessary or if required. Here are some resources for additional information on non-conforming products. In summary, non-conforming products can occur at any stage of the production process, from design to delivery, and can result in issues such as products recalls or customer complaints. Manufacturers should manage non-conforming products as required by the quality system regulation and have a robust system in place to detect, evaluate, and document to ensure non-conforming product is not used or distributed. Thank you for joining this presentation. I will now answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Ruth. We'll now go to the question and answer portion for this presentation. And we already have some questions in, so we'll get started with the first one here. Um, as we know, many parts of a quality system work in conjunction with one another. And this first question asks, how do you determine when to open a CAPA for a non-conforming product? Thank you, Joe, thank, and thank you for the question. Determining when to open a corrective and preventive action, or CAPA, depends on several factors and may vary depending on your organization and your quality system. One guideline to consider would be the severity of the non-conformance and it, if it will impact the safety of the device. If the non-conformance can pose a significant risk, I will suggest opening a CAPA. Another guideline to consider will be the frequency or reoccurrence of the non-conformance. 
If you determine that similar lung conformances have been observed previously, you may also want to open a CAPA to address the root cause and prevent future occurrences. Remember that your procedures will dictate when to open a CAPA, and it's important to refer to your organization's quality system and any specific procedures or requirements that you have in place. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that answer. Our next question, if we identify one or two devices that is non-conforming, do we still have to investigate them? Thank you for that also. The regulation requires that you have procedures in place to evaluate the non-conformance and determine if an investigation is needed. If you determine that an investigation is not needed, you may justify why you're not investigating and document that. So to answer that question, if you identify one or two non-conformances, you should first evaluate it to determine if there's a need to investigate. The key word here is you investigate as needed. And I believe um, that, was, that came across in the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next question up is, if the medical product is software as a medical device, how do you handle non-compliant software? Thank you for that. Um, so a soft, it, it will be the same. Software as medical devices will, have, will also implement the same um, requirements as a regular medical device. Um, they, they will have to evaluate and then investigate if it's needed. Um, if the investigation can help ensure that they can correct the non-conformance and ensure that it does not reoccur, it will, it, will, it will be the same as any other medical device. Um, and if um, it's, it keeps reoccurring, maybe they will need to open the CAPA to get to the root cause. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we'll move on to our next question. Is there any guidelines defined for the supplier responsibilities and actions required in a case of a non-conformance? There, thank you, thank you for the question. There is no guideline for suppliers. Um, however, you do want to make sure that your suppliers do follow some kind of procedures that you have set in place for them. And um, if there are non-conformances coming in from the supplier, you need to review the procedures with them to make sure they are going by what the procedures are, is, requir is requiring them to follow. Um, Joe, do you want to add to that? anything to that? Sure. Um, you could also add in what purchasing control agreements you've put in place. As you mentioned in the first um, question, you know, these systems work together with one another and the non-conforming system is one that works with other systems. So if you have a supplier that's providing you non-conforming product, you're going to look back at your purchasing controls and then as part of your pur purchase controls, look at those supplier agreements that you have in place with them. And that will help at least direct you as to, you know, who's responsible for what and where. At the end of the day, as the medical device manufacturer, you're responsible for everything. But I think that, yes, you know, what you said earlier is you, you got to deal with these non-conformities one way or the other through acceptance activities coming in or through the back end of whatever your purchasing control agreements that are in place, but you got to do something about it. So thank you, Ruth. And our next question, are electronic signatures acceptable for using non-conforming product or does it have to be a written signature? You, you can, you, thank you for the question. You can use electronic signatures um, for very, um, accepting non-conforming non products. Um, part 11 allows electronic signatures um, as long as you have that signature on file. Um, whoever's accepting um, and you validate the signatures, you should be able to use your electronic signatures. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. So our next question, 
does disposition of the non-conforming product also include getting rid of the product, like disposing it, scrapping it? Thank you. Disposition includes your final decision of the use of the product. This can include using the product as is or reworking the product, or in other cases, returning the product to the supplier if this was a product you received from a supplier or a contract manufacturer and scrapping or destroying the product. All these include um, are different practices for disposition. If getting rid of the product is your, is your disposition process because, because maybe your product cannot be reworked or used as is, and it was not provided by a supplier for you to return them back to, as in return back to supplier or contract manufacturer, then you must document, review, and approve the disposition method or process. Remember that your procedure should define who in the organization is responsible for the review and authorization of the, disp of the disposition process used for the non-conforming product. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And our next question up is, if we have a system control to block the issuance of non-conforming product, basically some sort of system that blocks it from going out, do we still need to have physical segregation? Thanks for that. Yes, yes, you do need to have, um, you do need to physically segregate the non-conforming product. Um, the regulation requires manufacturers to have procedures in place for controlling non-conforming products, and segregation is one of the ways of controlling non-conforming products to make sure that it is not inadvertently used or distributed. So yes, you do, you still need to physically segregate the non-conforming product. Next question. Okay. Thank you. Um, does investigate, so you answered earlier that a non-conforming product could end up in the CAPA system. This question is kind of asking it a little bit differently. Does investigation have to be recorded using a CAPA? Thank, thank you for that. Um, I, I, can I, I will need to re review the, I don't think it, I don't think it does. I don't think it has to be recorded in the CAPA. Jojo, I would defer this to Joe sure, to answer. Sure, um, to, to add in, you're right. It doesn't have to be, so not all non-conformances are gonna end up in your CAPA system. Some may be fixed with a simple correction. So it really depends as you answered earlier is, is this something that's high enough of a risk that it trips into your Kappa, your corrective action system? Or is it something that you're seeing a high enough frequency of that you need to go into corrective action? So it really depends on what that nonconformity is. If it's something that's simple and can be corrected through your nonconforming um, system, it ends there. But if it's something that is high enough or frequent enough, then maybe it needs to be put through as a corrective action. So, yep, you're you're correct that um, not every non-conformance goes into your CAPA system. Thank you. Next question. Yep, our next question up is, how does FDA know if you do not comply with non-conforming product requirements? <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so in the beginning of my presentation, I mentioned that non-conforming products was cited multiple times, over a hundred times on the list of investigational observations or from FDA 483s. Um, so how does FDA know if you're not complying with the requirements? Well, during FDA's in inspections of your establishment, the investigator will review your procedures, and look for non-conforming products to make sure you have adequate procedures in place for identifying and controlling non-conforming products. If they do observe any non-conforming products, you should be able to pro provide documentation for the activities completed and the outcome. One other way that FDA may also become um, aware of is from whistleblowers and FDA will come out to inspect your establishment. Thank you. 
Thanks, Ruth. Moving on to our next question. Can my contract manufacturer be responsible for addressing non-conforming product? Yes. Yes, um, you, you want to, you want to make sure you have reviewed and approved the procedures for them to perform those activities and you are monitoring them to make sure they are consistently doing so. You also want to make sure you have access to all that information, all the information they have on um, those procedures or those activities and document all those activities as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is, do we need a procedure for addressing non-conforming product, even if we never have had any non-conforming product? Before you answer, I find that, that a little bit hard to believe, but say that you do, you have a company, they've never had any non-conforming product, not receiving, not in process, not final, ever. Do they still need to have a procedure for addressing non-conforming product? Yes, and yes, like you said, it's highly impossible. Um, yes, you should have procedures in place to address non-conformances, even you have, if, even if you have been in business for, let's say, ten years, twenty years, thirty years, and have never had any non-conformances, which really is unlikely. Um, remember that the regulation requires that manufacturers of medical devices establish and maintain procedures to control or for the control of non-conforming products. So even if you've been in business forever and you've never had any issues, um, you should still be, be prepared to handle non-conforming products when it does occur. We, we also discussed that when your establishment gets inspected by FDA, the investigator will review your procedures to make sure that you can adequately handle and control non-conformances. So, um, when they do happen. So yes, you do, you still want to have procedures in place for addressing non-conforming products. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And yep, that's what the regulation says. You have to establish those, which is you have to define and document those, even if there's nothing that you have to do. Um, our next question is, do we have to inform our suppliers about every case of non-conforming product when it is their fault? I would say yes. Um, these are suppliers that are performing an activity for you, providing you with a product. Um, so you definitely want to notify them. Um, they may have information that can assist you if your process requires you to perform an investigation. Um, and also, you also you you want to let them know so that they do not continue supplying you with non-conforming products and um, the only way that you can put an end to it or if you need to get rid of that supplier is to let them know that there's a fault with the products they're providing for you. Next question. Okay, thank you. In case of not using cap your CAPA system, is it possible to monitor for minor, minor problems using a deviation method or is that not applicable for medical devices? Can I get the question again? Sure. And I think what they're getting at is in the case, so you're not using your Kappa system, but mm -hmm. there is a minor problem, a minor deviation. Can you use some sort of deviation method um, to handle that nonconformance? And I think you've answered this earlier that yes, not everything needs to go into Kappa. Therefore, there are ways to handle deviations depending on that. So Correct. And you... Yes. Thanks, Joe. And also the procedures you have in place. If you have a if there is a um a better method for you to use, then you must well just do that. But um you don't need to always open a Kappa for um any non or non conformances. Okay, thank you. And our next question is, um, is a root cause analysis or root cause determination required for non-conforming products? So this speaks to that investigation piece. Thanks. 
a root cause determination is not always required and may not always even be possible. Um, there may be too many causes, too, too many root causes for you to be able to even identify which specific one. But for going back to the topic of non-conforming products, um, since there may be multiple causes for it, it's not, and it's not just, it may not just be one cause, it's not always um, a requirement. It, root cause determination is not always required. Next question. Thank you. And actually, this will be our last question, and then we'll wrap it up with your final thoughts. So if an electronic system in the warehouse can prevent the allocation of products that are shipped in quarantine but not released yet pending sterilization, and they can be considered non-conforming product before re release, requiring segregation, or can it be controlled electronically to prevent release until final release is obtained? So this question is a little bit tricky little because bit. It, pending sterilization, it's not final for release. It's more work in process versus what we're talking about as non-conforming. So yes, so I would say you should segregate the product if you separate from the ones that are deemed to be conforming. You should be able to um, control it as long as you segregate them from um, the ones that are conforming products. Correct. I think what, because I think what you're getting at here is, are we talking about work in process product versus non-conforming product? So, I mean, if everything is right, except that it has not gone through the sterilization process, it's still work in process. So. I, I would agree agree with you there. With that, let's turn it over for your final thoughts. Thank you, Joe, and thank you all for attending this presentation and conference. Um, what I want you to take away from this presentation is first, be sure to have procedures in place for identifying and controlling non-conforming products. Second, make sure to familiarize yourself with the requirements. And finally, when a non-conformance occurs, evaluate it to get to the causes of why it happened so that you can correct the issue and that's not really occur. Thank you again and see you next year. Thank you, Ruth, and thank you for that great presentation on non-conforming product and its impact with regards to quality in your quality system. And with that, we're going to move on to our second talk relating to quality systems, and that is on handling medical device complaint files with quality. And doing this talk is Tanya Wilbon. Tanya is the branch chief for the post market and consumer branch in the Division of Industry and Consumer Education, DICE. Tanya has been with FDA for over 23 years with more than 10 years of clinical laboratory experience prior to coming to FDA. She initially began in FDA as part of the microbiological scientific review group in the CDRH's Office of In Vitro Diagnostics. Um, at one time it was called OIVD, then became OIVDR, which was OIR, and now it's known as the Office of Health Technology 7 or OHT7 in the Office of Product Evaluation and Quality. Um, Tanya has also served as a quality systems specialist in both the in vitro diagnostics offices as well as what used to be the Office of Compliance quite a few years ago. Um, Tanya currently serves as an FDA instructor for the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, or AMI, AAMI, and also serves on FDA's content advisory group as an instructor for the FDA investigators and staff as it relates to quality and quality systems. Uh, Tanya received her Bachelor's of Science degree in Microbiology from Howard University and is a certified microbiologist with the American Society of Clinical Pathology. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tanya to give us a presentation about handling medical device complaint files with quality.
Hello everyone. Thank you for joining this presentation and thank you Joe for that kind introduction. FDA is authorized to inspect medical device manufacturers against the Quality System Regulation or QS Regulation codified under Title 21 Code of Federal Regulations Part 820 or 21 CFR 820. This QS regulation establishes basic requirements applicable to manufacturers of finished medical devices who wish to market in the United States or the U.S. The regulation includes requirements for establishing and maintaining complaint files. Depicted here is a pie chart diagram displaying the top 10 most frequently cited inspectional observations during FDA inspections in fiscal year 2022. As pointed out by the yellow arrow on the slide, the second most frequently cited observations during FDA inspections was for the lack of adequately implementing requirements for maintaining complaint files. The lack of maintaining complaint files was cited 120 times on the form FDA 483, Inspectional Observations, which is commonly referred to as the FDA 483 or simply 483. 21 CFR 820.198 of the Quality System Regulation requires manufacturers to establish and maintain complaint files. Many medical device manufacturers often face challenges with efficiently handling device complaints as evidenced by the vast number of times it is cited as a deficiency during FDA device inspections. When supported with evidence, observations cited that indicate one or more major deficiencies for not complying with the requirements of the QS regulation will result in the inspection being classified as an official action indicated or OAI. This will result in enforcement actions being considered, such as the issuance of a warning letter, seizure of devices, injunction of a firm, assessment of civil money penalties, or even prosecution of individuals. I am sure none of you want to be subjected to these types of enforcement actions or want your companies to be subjected to them. Hopefully, this presentation will be helpful in describing the importance of complaint files and providing you with strategies for addressing any challenges encountered, as well as strategies for implementing requirements for maintaining complaint files to ensure you are handling complaints uniformly. First, let's review the learning objectives. The learning objectives for this presentation are to discuss the importance of medical device complaint files, review a key definition for clarity, identify the requirements briefly of the quality system regulation and compare them to the requirements of the ISO 13485-2016 standard titled Medical Devices Quality Management Systems Requirements for Regulatory Purposes, hereafter referred to as ISO 13485 or ISO standard. Identify challenges associated with handling medical device complaint files. And finally, discuss strategies for addressing those challenges and thus handling medical device complaint files with quality. So one would ask, why do we need to maintain complaint files and document all of that information? Well, complaint files are important because they provide valuable information for the manufacturer to improve the quality of the medical device. They serve as a critical source of information for regulatory authorities during inspections and audit. They also ensure patient safety. Complaints maintain detailed records of adverse events related to a medical device. By maintaining these detailed records, manufacturers can identify potential safety issues and take appropriate corrections and corrective action. 
Complaint files are important because they also ensure compliance with U.S. regulatory requirements. These files contain information about the device, the complaint, the investigation, and any corrections and corrective actions taken as a result of the complaint. Before continuing though, I would like to review a key definition in this presentation. That key definition, of course, is complaint. Complaint is defined in the quality system regulation under 21 CFR 820.3b as any written electronic or oral communication that alleges deficiencies related to the identity, quality, durability, reliability, safety, effectiveness, or performance of a device after it is released for distribution. Similarly, ISO 1345 Clause 3.4 defines a complaint as written, electronic, or oral communication that alleges deficiencies also related to the identity, quality, durability, reliability, and here usability, safety, or performance of a medical device that has been released from the organization's control or deficiencies related to a service that affects the performance of such medical device. This is similar to FDA's definition, but slightly differs because the standard specifically calls out deficiencies related to a service that affects the performance of such medical devices and the QS regulation does not. Here are two examples of a complaint. In the top example, the patient reports to the medical device manufacturer that the insulin pump is not delivering the correct amount of insulin as prescribed and as programmed. This example meets the definition of a complaint since the patient who received the medical device alleges that the device is not delivering the amount of insulin as the device was intended to deliver, which is a performance deficiency. In the bottom example, the consumer reported to the manufacturer that their blood glucose test kit did not include the test strips that are needed to complete the testing. The test kit box and inside label both indicate that test strips are included. The consumer alleges a deficiency due to the device not containing all of the components of the kit, which is a deficiency regarding the device identity. As a reminder, complaints can also originate from a variety of sources, including company sales representatives or service technicians. Now, let's identify briefly the U.S. regulatory requirements for complaint files and compare them to the requirements of the ISO 1345-2016 standard. Here is a table listing the requirements of the U.S. regulation 21 CFR 820 and the requirements of the ISO 1345-2016 standard for complaint files. The U.S. regulation requirements are codified under 21 CFR 820.198 A through G, and the requirements of the ISO standard are listed under clauses 8.2.2, 8.2.3, and with a reference to clause 4.2.5. Let's take a closer look at these requirements. This slide summarizes the requirements for complaint files under 21 CFR 820.198A. It includes the requirements to have a formally designated unit for handling complaints. These complaints must be processed in a uniform and timely manner and evaluated to determine whether they require reporting to the FDA under 21 CFR 803 for medical device reporting or MDR. Keep in mind, oral complaints must be documented upon receipt. Now this slide summarizes the requirements for reviewing and evaluating complaints under 21 CFR 820.198 B and C. It includes requirements to maintain records when no investigation is made 
including documenting the reason for not investigating and documenting the individual making the decision not to investigate. It also includes the requirements to investigate those complaints involving the possible failure of the device, labeling, or packaging unless such an investigation has already been completed. FDA's response to comment number 190 in the preamble to the quality system regulation further clarifies that if the evaluation decision was not to investigate in cases where an investigation would be duplicative, a reference to the original investigation is an acceptable justification for not conducting a second investigation. Remember, the individual making the decision must be qualified to do so. And finally, this slide summarizes the QS regulation requirements for complaint handling under 21 CFR 820.198 D through G. It includes requirements for evaluating complaints to determine if there are requirements for reporting adverse events to the FDA under 21 CFR 803. If required to be reported, these records must be kept in a separate complaint file or clearly designated. The regulation also includes requirements for specific information that is listed in D and E of this part that must be completed in the complaint files. These records must be reasonably accessible in the U.S. regardless of the location of the complaint handling unit. Now, let's look at the requirements of ISO 13485 2016 standard as summarized on this slide. The standard requires the organization to document procedures for timely complaint handling. It also includes the requirements to include specific information in the procedures for the requirements and responsibilities for complaint handling as listed on this slide. Now this slide summarizes additional requirements of the standard in Clause 8.2.2 .2 as well, including the requirement to document the justification of any complaint not investigated and any correction and corrective action. It also requires relevant information to be exchanged between the organization and external party involved if the investigation determines that activities outside the organization contributed to the complaint. The ISO 13485 standard also requires that complaint handling records be maintained according to Clause 4.2.5 for requiring records to be readily identifiable and retrievable. And finally, Clause 8.2.3 of the ISO standard requires the organization to document procedures for providing notification to the appropriate regulatory authority if applicable regulatory requirements require notification of complaints that meet specified adverse event reporting requirements or issuance of advisory notices. The organization must maintain records of the reporting according to the requirements of Clause 4.2.5 of the ISO standard. Now, let's look at a few similarities and differences between the regulation and the standard. The QS regulation and the ISO standard have several similar requirements for complaint files. Both the regulation and the standard require procedures to be documented. They require complaints to be handled in a timely manner and procedures for notifying regulatory authorities to be documented. They also both require records to be maintained and a documented justification when no investigation is made. Now, let's look at a few differences. Although the QS regulation and ISO standard have several similar requirements, they do also have a few differences. For example, the ISO standard does not describe specific types of complaints to be investigated. The QS regulation includes specific record keeping requirements for the complaint investigation, such as the requirement to include the name of the device, the date of the complaint was received, and any reply to the complainant. 
The ISO standard does not include such specifics. The ISO standard requires notification of issuance of advisory notices to be reported to regulatory authorities, and the QS regulation does not include such a requirement. Let's pause for a quick knowledge check. What is the importance of complaint files? Is it number one, to provide valuable information to improve the medical device? Is it number two, to ensure patient safety? Is it number three, to maintain detailed records of complaints or adverse events related to a medical device? Or is it number four, all of the above? Hopefully, everyone selected number four, all of the above. All of these describe the importance of complaint files. Implementing effective complaint handling requirements is crucial for any organization. However, as previously indicated, many medical device manufacturers often face challenges with efficiently handling device complaints. Let's continue with identifying a few challenges handling complaint files. One challenge with handling complaint files is ensuring compliance with regulatory requirements. The quality system regulation requires medical device manufacturers to establish and maintain complaint files, which must include information on the device, the complaint, the investigation, and any corrections and corrective actions taken. This information itself may sometimes be hard to obtain. Another challenge is managing a high volume of complaints. If a device has a widespread issue, the manufacturer may receive a large volume of complaints, which can be difficult to manage and respond to in a timely manner due to numerous reasons, including resources and being difficult to prioritize. Conducting thorough investigations has also been seen as a challenge in handling complaint files. This is sometimes due to the lack of good, thorough record keeping, appropriate root cause analyses, language barriers, and obtaining complete and useful complaint information. Yet other challenges with handling complaint files include managing communication with stakeholders. If the manufacturer operates in multiple countries, they may receive complaints in different languages, which can be challenging to understand and respond to appropriately. And then there is the challenge of ensuring consistency with determining priority of complaints, classifying and closing complaints, as well as ensuring timely and appropriate corrective actions can also be challenging. Well, we saw a few examples of some of the challenges with handling complaint files. Now let's look at some strategies for addressing these challenges and thus maintain complaint files with quality. To overcome some of the challenges we just discussed and other possible challenges, it is essential to have robust complaint handling procedures in place with clear roles and responsibilities. These procedures should outline how to receive and document complaints, investigate them thoroughly, determine the causes or root causes, and implement appropriate corrections and corrective actions. Additionally, medical device manufacturers should have a team dedicated to complaint handling and be regularly trained on complaint handling procedures. Other strategies for handling complaint files with quality include maintaining open communication with stakeholders. Manufacturers must establish open channels of communication with stakeholders, including customers, employees, and external parties. Regularly engage with customers to gather feedback, address concerns, and keep them informed about the progress of their complaints. Providing training and resources for complaint handling to ensure consistency in maintaining complaint files. You can develop comprehensive training programs to educate employees on complaint handling procedures, 
effective communication techniques, and problem-solving skills, as well as provide resources such as guidelines, templates, and reference materials to assist employees in handling complaints efficiently and consistently. Another strategy is to establish clear and specific timeframes for investigation and escalation procedures for complex cases as well, as ensure timely and effective communication with regulatory agencies and customers. Effectively handling challenges with complaint files requires a proactive and multifaceted approach to ensure complaints are handled uniformly with quality. Let's do one more knowledge check. What is one strategy for handling complaint files with quality? Is it number one, managing a high volume of complaints? Is it number two, implement a robust complaint handling procedure? Or is it number three, none of the above? I hope everyone answered number two, implement a robust complaint handling procedure. Number one, managing a high volume of complaints is actually a challenge with handling complaint files. Please note, there are many resources available to assist with handling complaint files with quality. Well, here's a list of some of those resources used throughout this presentation and that are helpful with handling complaint files with quality. So in summary, both the Quality System Regulation and ISO 1345 2016 standard have similar requirements for handling medical device complaint files. Although handling medical device complaint files with quality can be quite complex and present many challenges, there are several strategies that are quite useful in alleviating most, if not all, of those challenges and ensure complaint files are established and maintained with quality. Thank you for joining me for this presentation. I will now take some of your questions. Thank you, Tanya, for that comprehensive um, presentation. We're going to get started with some of our live questions. So the first question that's already in is, how long are we, how long are we required to maintain complaint files? Thank you, Joe, for that question. Um, great question. And of course, I hate to start off with the very first question answering utilizing our standard FDA response. It depends, but it actually does depend. However, the um, regulation, the quality system regulation does indicate and require that records required as part of um, the quality system regulation under 820 are required to be maintained a minimum of two years or um, two years from the date that the, the device was actually released for distribution. So the minimum requirement is two years, but it really depends upon your device, um, how long you would have to maintain those records. So you, you, you want to maintain those records for the life of the device. And then that um, life of the device is um, based on what the manufacturer set, but you at minimum only have to keep those records um, for two years. Thank you for that question, though. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that response. And our next question is, can we use the same complaint handling system that we use to meet the requirements for the ISO 1345 standard? Another great question. And I'm actually glad that someone did ask this question because, yes, you can use the same complaint handling system and procedures. You know, you do not have to have two different complaint handling um, uh, procedures if you're marketing in the US and if you're marketing in the rest of the world. The one thing you that it is important, you want to make sure you 
perform or conduct a gap analysis to ensure that that complaint handling system, your procedures do reflect and include all of the regulatory requirements for FDA that are required by FDA in 21 CFR 820.198. So you wanna make sure that if you are utilizing the same system, make sure that system includes all of those um, requirements. So I would you know, initially start off by, by conducting a, a um, gap analysis to make sure that it includes all of those requirements in um, 21 CFR 820.198. But yes, you can use them for both. Okay. Thank you, Tanya. And our next question is, do complaints have to be stored in a validated QMS quality management system? And I'm not sure if they're referring to a software system or not. Or can these res records exist as tickets in a software used for customer write-ins? So a couple parts of this. Okay, thank you. Very interesting question. And I hope I am interpreting it correctly. And if not, please feel free to um, submit that question to dice at fda.hhs.gov and we can um, go back and forth to obtain clarity. But if I think your question is, can you do, utilize an electronic system versus a manual system? The answer to that is yes. The regulation does not tell you what type of system you can have in place. You just have to make sure, number one, that the system um, implements all of the regulatory requirements of 820.198 for maintaining your complaint files. And if you choose to use an electronic system, you have to make sure that that electronic system is validated to perform as intended and make sure that you have controls in place to maintain the validation of that software system. But um, the regulation does not preclude you from utilizing a manual system as long as you track and maintain all the documentation that um, supports um, the information and the activities you have done in um, maintaining your complaint files, in conducting your evaluations, in performing um, your investigations and identifying and implementing any corrections or corrective actions. So you can utilize an electronic system or a manual system, just have to make sure that it's being implemented and it addresses all of the regulatory requirements. And if um, electronic system is used, make sure it's validated and that that software will perform as intended. Okay. And if that, Thank again, you, if that wasn't your question, then please feel free to um, email us at dice at fda.hhs.gov and we can obtain additional clarity. Okay, perfect. Our next question actually is a very hot topic these days with regards to what's going on with real world evidence. Can you speak to any best methods for handling complaints that we may learn about during post-market observational registries? So this is speaking to, to where complaints may be coming from. So we know that there are now these medical device registries and how that might be engaged with complaints. Thank you, Joe. Another great question. Um, here, here again, the regulation does not indicate what where you receive complaints from. It does recognize that you will receive complaints from a variety of sources. You may receive complaints from questionnaires that you submit to your customers. You may receive um, complaint information from servicing reports. Um, that's part of um, 820.200, where it indicates that if you, you know, receive information that uh, it's contained in a service report and it is to be reported as an adverse event, it is automatically considered a complaint. So we recognize that you may obtain complaints from a variety of sources. We do not preclude that. However, the regulation requires you to address and, and handle and maintain um, those complaints in a similar fashion based on risk, you know, and based on the nature of that complaint. They require you to specifically handle those in a timely manner, okay? And, and timely is not specified to a number or days or hours or anything, but it is 
um, timely enough to ensure you're meeting the other parts of the regulatory requirement, which is if that complaint has been evaluated and is determined that it must be reported under 21 CFR 803 for adverse event reporting. There are specific time frames with regards to meeting those. So you want to make sure that your uh, complaint handling procedures and you are um, receiving those complaints in a timely enough manner that you will also meet the reporting requirements for a reporting of adverse event if that is the case. So bottom line, yes, you can receive them from post-market information. We just want to make sure that you are, are, are uh, evaluating them uniformly and that you are addressing and handling them in a timely manner. Thank you. Thank you. And this actually ties into another question we received. So to clarify, the person is asking, what is a timely manner? How many hours or days? And if I understood what I just heard, there's no definition of complaints of timely manner, but under 803, which links into complaint handling for adverse event reporting, you have those five day and 30 day clocks. So anything additional do you want to add to to that question on what is timely manner and how many hours is are we talking hours or days question mark yes thank you joe for reiterating that um exactly as i um, touched upon a little bit earlier uh, with regards to timely manner, the regulation under 820.198 for maintaining complaint files does not specify days, hours, or weeks or when you have to um, uh, uh, address and evaluate and begin investigation of those complaints, but it does say in a timely manner. And by timely, it does uh, refer to as soon as possible. There is a comment, a response to um, a comment in the preamble to the quality system regulation that FDA provided to um, that question. And it does um, clarify that the timely is re referenced to immediate. They want you to begin to document that complaint as soon as you become aware so that you can meet those other reporting requirements of um, Part 803 for reporting of adverse event if the need arise. And as Joe mentioned, there are some five-day reporting requirements um, under 21 CFR 803, especially if it relates to a death. So if you're Complaint handling procedures says, you know, as long as you document and evaluate the complaint within 10 days, then you may miss the regulatory requirement for uh, reporting it under 803 if it requires you to report that within five days. So timely manner means as soon as possible, um, but the, F the regulation does not specify that. Now, your procedures must specify that and describe what is considered timely and ensuring that you can also meet um, the regulatory requirements for 21 CFR Part 803. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Tanya, for that clarification. Our next question gets into investigation. And this is the question. What makes someone qualified to make a decision not to investigate a complaint? Is this just training to internal complaint procedures? Wow, another great question. Um, one I had not thought of, but really it, it boils down to what are their qualifications for the position that they are in. Um, of course, here again, the regulation allows the manufacturer that 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 flexibility to determine who is um, qualified to make that decision. It may be a decision about an implantable, you know, so of course you want someone with expertise regarding that particular device. Um, you, you need someone to understand um, some statistics about the frequency of, of, of um, adverse events occurring or, or non-conformances occurring with certain types of devices. So you may need a statistician or someone with some statistical background or at least have your procedures written that you invoke their expertise. But here again, it um, it really is up to the manufacturer as what that expertise would entail. I would definitely say someone that has the 
the expertise pertaining to the, that particular device, someone that has the expertise about the requirements for um, quality system regulation, including more than just maintaining and handling um, complaint files. You want to make sure that they understand requirements for implementing corrective and preventive actions. You want to make sure that they understand provisions regarding um, addressing non-conforming product. So someone with a variety of expertise. But here again, you get to dictate that. And you can have um, different individuals making those decisions for different product types. You don't have, you, you should not um, have, you know, different individuals for the same type of, uh, of uh, device. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Tanya. And our next question up, can we have more than one complaint handling unit? Oh, wow. So the, they must have known that someone was asking the previous question about uh, who was authorized. So I, I sort of began to touch upon that you can have more than one complaint handling unit, if you will, but the regulation is is clear and, and also FDA's response to comments in the preamble does address that as well. You can have um, a complaint handling unit for a different type of device, but there still should only be one overarching formally designated complaint handling unit that is to ensure that all the other complaint, you know, handling mini units, if you will, are making these risk-based decisions consistently and that they are evaluating and that they are receiving and investigating these complaints um, uniformly. So the regulation speaks to the uniformity and the timeliness and the consistency of handling these complaints, but it does give you that leverage. For example, if you are a large corporation, right, you're manufacturing multiple types of devices, anywhere from, I would say, tongue depressors to, to uh, uh, implantables, right? And so you, there may be a need to have multiple complaint handling units because you may be experiencing complaints at the same time. However, you want to make sure that there's one overarching formally designated complaint handling unit that is to ensure that these many, if you will, complaint handling units are handling the complaints uniformly, making risk-based decisions, making sure that they are receiving and documenting these complaints within a timely manner so that they can meet other uh, regulatory requirements. So bottom line, yes, you can have more than one, but there more than one mini uh, complaint handling unit per device type now, per device type. It can't be multiple complaint handling units and you all are handling uh, complaints about blood glucose test strips. So it should be one device type, but then there must be one overarching formally designated complaint handling unit. And they're making sure that these many uh, complaint handling units or systems are operating uniformly, especially as it comes to making these risk-based decisions. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Tanya. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you for your final thoughts. Oh, okay. Thank you, Joe. So remember, all complaint files must be maintained with quality because, you know, really that information that is contained in those complaint files are, are critical to resolving device malfunction or device failure issues and, and other um, medical device uh, quality issues as well. So what I would say to you is that your call to action is to, from this day forward, is to take action today to enhance the quality of your complaint files. You know, review your procedures, ensure that they comply with the FDA regulatory requirements. And if not, then identify those areas for improvement and, and make those improvements. Revise your procedures, you know, accordingly. And then finally, ensure that your complaint files are documented comprehensively. I can't tell you how often we see, you know, through ERR reports that, you know, I'm reviewing or seeing and looking at, you know, historically, where 
um, basically, if they had more information in their complaint files, they would have done a better job of identifying the corrections and the corrective action to ensure that that complaint doesn't ha does not um, reoccur. So make sure that you document your complaint files comprehensively. Thank you all. Um, have a great rest of your evening. Okay. Thank you, Tanya, for that great presentation and question and answer session. So this is the end of the day. Thank you again for joining us today on day one of the medical device track for Ready. Please complete all the evaluations. That valuable information is used by us in many different ways. And I'll talk a little bit about it in my intro tomorrow morning. And please join us again tomorrow as we present moral medical devices and then transition in the afternoon to the biologics track for CBER to carry on to the end of the conference. I promise tomorrow will be as engaging, as enjoyable as today was. We have a lot more great topics to get to with regards to medical devices, some very hot topics, just like the ones today. So with that, um, please have a great evening and see you all tomorrow. Thank you.